Welcome to Life Perceives. Whether you are with us here in the Edinburgh Center or you're watching from home on the stream, we are very excited that you're here with us today. My name is Mikkel. I'm one of the augurs of Life Perceives, and I'm also a doctoral researcher here at University of Sussex. We've got a really big day for us in front of us today. We've been waiting anxiously, and I cannot wait to share it with all of you. Now, before we begin, let me tell you, this past week has been an emotional roller coaster. In the past 24 hours alone, we've had four contributors canceling due to illness, missed flights, and broken cars. But we kept our calm. Well, we didn't really, but um, we've managed to rescue the day, and some of them will still be showing up. Um, we routed some flights, and everything turned out great. It will be a great day. More about that later. Life's perceives all started with a simple question. What, is, what does it mean to be a living being? What is it like to be a living being? And can we even imagine what it is like to be a radically different being? But simple questions such as these rarely have simple answers. And these particular answers differ vastly depending on who you ask. Figuring out who to ask to invite was not an easy task, but a, a rather liberal consumption of alcohol helped us think a little bit out of the box. Ideas were thrown around, names were suggested, and we wanted uh, scientists from vastly different fields, artists from different fields, and before we knew it, we were inviting an exciting mix of scientists and artists. Today, you will hear about how the world is perceived from the perspective of animals, plants, fungi, and cells. Hopefully, you'll be challenged on your beliefs about the inner workings, the inner lives, of everything living, on what it means to be alive in the broadest possible sense. The format for the talks today is quite simple. They will usually be 15, 20 minutes long, and we'll have time to take one to two questions after each talk, um, with a few exceptions. In addition to everything that you experience in here in the auditorium, we've got um, an exhibition uh, in the Jane Attenborough studio, which is the Sentinel Self, an immersive exhibition by Cecil Marie Eton, where there's also a video interview between Cecil and the writer and curator Philippe Ramos about the making of the installation. We were also supposed to have a microphotography exhibition here on site, but due to a car breakdown, that exhibition never made it. Nonetheless, we're hanging out QR codes uh, outside, so in the breaks you can see a virtual version of this installation where you can actually walk around in a room and actually experience the pieces. So we're happy that worked out in the end as well. A few practical things. We have a short 10-15 um, minute break, both during the morning and the afternoon session, and we have a longer lunch break in the middle. Here's the disclaimer. Hands down, we've never arranged anything uh, like this before, and we were quite content with our 40 sign-ups last week. Um, this number tripled in this past week, <laughs> which caught us a little bit by surprise. Uh, but, and I know what you're thinking, don't despair. We found a solution, and there will be sandwiches for everyone in the end. <laughs> <laughs> there is also going to be tea and coffee available here in the morning and during the long lunch break, but uh, not during the short breaks, so do fuel up when you have the chance. Um, toilets are located in the foyer on either side of the Sentinel Self down in the Jane Attenborough room. And... Lastly, if you have any questions during the day, then you feel free to ask uh, any of us or our wonderful volunteers who will be stationed in different places. Um, hopefully you can spot them, otherwise you can find me. I'll be roaming around with the camera. Lastly, this event is part of our PhD program, which is funded by the Leverschum Foundation. So I'd like to present one of the directors of our doctoral program, Jamie Ward, to give you a brief introduction of who we are and how the funding behind this program was made possible. Thank you very much. 
Thanks, Mikhail, and welcome, everyone. So I'm Jamie Ward, one of the directors of the, the Leave Hume Doctoral Programme, alongside Anil Seth, who you'll meet this afternoon. So in 2018, we were very fortunate to get a, uh, a Leverhulme um, doctoral grant, which has funded including uh, a Sussex contribution, 21 PhD students. The students have really worked together well over three cohorts, and they come from very uh, diverse backgrounds. So it covers, for example, arts, looking at digital new immersive sensory experiences through to life sciences, some of the work that's showcased today, uh, psychology, um, uh, medical school, uh, and so on. So the, the theme is from sensation and perception and awareness. Uh, and again, the students have done a great job in putting together their own research during difficult times with coronavirus, and I very much look forward to the event today. Thank you. That's not on. <laughs> oh, it is on. <laughs> so, hi everyone. Um, thanks to Mikhail and to Jamie for the warm welcome. I'm Will Roseby. I'm a doctoral researcher here at Sussex and one of the organizers of this symposium. It's great to see so many people including some close friends and colleagues, turn up for this event in person, which I hope sets a trend for the rest of 2023. When we were first sitting down to brainstorm ideas for this event, my fellow organizers and I were quickly overwhelmed by the immense diversity of thought and around the topic of perception. However, we saw amongst this confusion an opportunity to explore this concept from various angles, taking into consideration perspectives from across the sciences and arts. We hope we wouldn't only talk about perceptions, but maybe change them as well. In our morning session today, we hope to do just that. From the perceptive behaviors of more familiar animals, such as birds and fish, to the uncanny ways in which fiction and artificial intelligence can be channels for a more intuitive understanding of non-human species. Our speakers today convey the fundamental inseparability between perceptions, bodies, and environments. We also hope that this session will highlight the inherent synergies between science and art that are often forgotten in our modern, highly specialized societies. For just as scientific discoveries often inspire artistic work and even define new artistic mediums, art has the power to convey scientific knowledge in profound ways and to reach the deep realms of our imaginations that science cannot. So without further ado, I want to introduce our first contributor to the stage. I regret to announce that our scheduled contributor, Nikki Clayton, could not make it here today. However, in her absence, Nikki has provided us with a video showcasing some of her research into the perceptive abilities of jays, as elucidated by their unique responses to magic effects. Furthermore, we're also very fortunate to host her collaborator and close friend, Mark Baldwin, OBE. Mark has a long-running association with the distinguished dance company, Rambe, both as a dancer and as artistic director, and received his OBE in 2016 for his contributions to dance. In addition to regular dancing sessions together, Mark also collaborates with Nikki as academic visitor at her Comparative Cognition Lab in Cambridge. I invite now Mark to touch on Nikki's work and their work together before we showcase the video contribution. Hi, my name is Mark. <laughs> uh, I usually give talks like this with uh, my scientist friend, Nikki Clayton, and next to me, she's really tiny. Uh, we were in um, Washington, D.C. to open the first conference on dance in the brain, uh, which was amazing. And uh, I didn't know I was going until a couple of weeks before Nikki rang me up. So we must do, do this uh, lecture demonstration. 
and uh, we try and keep our stuff low tech, uh, and we've been doing this since uh, uh, 2009, uh, when as artistic director of Rombert, um, I, uh, I was beginning to commission work, and I wanted to commission some science stuff, and, um, and I was looking around for a scientist. I knew Darwin's great-grandson, uh, here dropping names, uh, Stephen Keynes, and he introduced me to several scientists, and one of them said, I think this is a ridiculous idea that you should make a dance about evolution. And just as he said that, I thought, oh, actually, it's a really good idea to me. And, um, and he told me all these wonderful stories about a dancing fly, that the fly uh, wraps a, a present up for its partner, and he gives it to his lady friend, and while he's doing it, she's unwrapping it and uh, she gets to eat the prize. And then some of the flies just had the web without a present inside. So he was calling that evolution. And uh, there was another one with a fish, um, and the fish had a spot on its side. Um, and suddenly all the spots disappeared. But if you take that fish and put it into another stream, the spot comes back. So I was learning about evolution in all kinds of different ways. And uh, Nikki arrived with her uh, bird stories, and the first thing she did uh, in an interview with The Guardian, because um, actually uh, these are collaborations that don't just happen with a scientist and a choreographer or an artist. So we had Judith McCrell, who's a friend of Nikki and I, who was the dance critic for The Guardian. We had Cardia Ratia, a really famous French Algerian artist who's just brilliant. Um, and we had a taxidermist, Georg Meyerweil. And he said, you know, you unwrap everything. Then you make up new stuffing and stick it back in and put the skin back on. And that sounded wonderful to me. So Kadir got him to make these pods that look like maggot pods, which the dancers came out of. And Nikki came up with the idea that um, it would be just three things, reveal, conceal. So they were black at the back and white at the front. So you could see them quite clearly dancing Everything stolen, of course, from nature, because she showed us all these wonderful videos of uh, birds of paradise in New Guinea with their with their big um, top knots. <laughs> and, and actually, what happens is they fluff their feathers up, and it just looks like a tutu. And they do all these elaborate footwork. It's quite brilliant. And so instead of choreographing that, I just nicked the whole lot. Hey, dancers, learn this. And some of them were brilliant at it, you know, and of course they were in the piece. Um, and that sounds terribly cruel, but that's what we did. And Nikki helped me. And of course the female bird sits up in the branches, and so she needs a particular view. Um, and so all these things came into consideration, but Conceal Reveal was absolutely amazing, because when they turned up stage, because they were black at the back, they kind of disappeared. But I have worked with uh, um, scientists before. Sorry, I'm pacing. And uh, the first piece I did uh, was with the Institute of Physics. Brownian motion, the photoelectric effect, and E equals MC squared. It was like, but I'm a dancer. Uh, but actually, uh, I had my own scientist for three months. And he would come and have afternoon tea with me. And then one day, he said, I've got the Brownian motion thing. He brought up one of his dog's toys. And it was like a ball. You wind it up. Oh, no, it's got a battery. You press go on the battery. And then it bounces around all over the place. And he said, that was a perfect example of Brownian motion because it's like a particle. There's no up. There's no sideways. There's no top, bottom. And, um, and so I show, again, I showed that to the dancers. So it's actually having experts explain to the dancers some of this stuff. It was a little bit more difficult with E equals MC squared, but we managed it. Um, and I used uh, an amazing uh, feature film art director. And so, the, you know, the stage was full of colour, you know, because uh, blue is the one with some energy and red looks lovely on stage. So we, we, we came up with all these amazing things. We went to the Hedron Collider because uh, Ariane Koak, who used to run the artist interaction, uh, asked me, and I took uh, a, a, a composer, Cheryl Francis Hode, with me. I can see a composer. And, um, and also a, a brilliant artist called Katie Patterson. If you haven't seen her work, look out for it. She uses science to make stuff. And, uh, but uh, how it actually happened with Nikki 
is I used to know someone who ran the proms called Sir John Drummond. And he sadly passed away, but he left me some money in his will. So I was able to afford to have Julian Anderson write the music. So uh, if you're interested in working in the arts, it's about bringing people together. So think of your most favorite team in the world, the most seriously good composer, the genius artist who's taking over the MoMA, you know, and uh, the most amazing scientist you can think of. And it's actually working together, working how you can work together. I think it's very unusual for Nikki and I to work together for so long because, um, you know, usually they, they would come to Rombert, because I ran it for 16 years, a lot of projects, as I said, uh, 60, uh, and then they never kind of work together again. So actually, uh, that word collaboration is quite powerful when it comes to uh, bringing people together, and we seem to have lasted all this time. I'm not quite sure why. I think it's because I don't drink and she does. Um, and so... <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, the things that she can explain, I can't explain, and, uh, and vice versa. I mean, she says that without me, she wouldn't have come up with the phrase avian tango. Um, and I think, I think we could show it now, actually. Magic tricks are a fascinating window on our minds. Indeed. Do I have anything behind my ear? I doubt it. Anything in my hand? Of course not. Which means that this should be physically impossible. They highlight gaps in our perception and attention, which magicians exploit to disguise what's in front of our eyes. I suppose the coin would be just there. Thank you very much. But what about other animals? Do they fall for the same tricks we do? Could their susceptibility to magic tricks highlight flaws in their perception? Or could an ability to be misled actually reveal kinds of intelligence we didn't know they had? How did you become interested in doing magic tricks for animals? Well, I've always wanted to be a bird. I've always wanted to fly and move around three-dimensionally and think like a bird. So that's how I got into science. But also, through my passion for dance, I met Professor Clive Wilkins, who's artist in residence in the Department of Psychology, and he's a professional magician. And we both shared a great interest in memory and mental time travel through different perspectives, art and science. I visited Cambridge University's Comparative Cognition Lab to see how the group are examining the mental abilities of jays using magic tricks. Jays are extremely intelligent. We call them the feathered apes because they're on a cognitive par with the chimpanzees. And they're also very attentive. They really watch what you're doing. And so they became the perfect subjects. Elias Garcia Pellegrin spent months working with the birds in order to prepare for the experiments. So one of the things that Eli was able to do was to train them to peck a thumb to ask them which hand they thought concealed the object he'd hidden. This trick is known as a French drop. Good job, baby. The Jays don't fall for it, but perhaps that's not surprising. When humans watch the trick, we assume that the left hand is grasping the worm. Your brain uses shortcuts when you perceive these movements. It just goes, well, what's the most likely thing to happen? Well, the most likely thing to happen is that when this hand grabs an object, the most likely thing is for a completed transfer to occur. And that's where magicians are very good, because they are very good at seeing um, how to make a movement which is deceptive so unlike a real movement that the brain does not notice it. Even though there are particular kinematics that would tell you that this movement is fake, right? Like the tension. But you don't see that, because you're just using the shortcuts in perception. However, birds don't need these expectations to survive, because they do not have hands. But the birds do fall for some other tricks. 
Have a look. Where is it? Here. You're wrong. It's not. On my visit, it wasn't just the birds being treated to a show. Sam, do you remember the uh, £10 note we talked about? Could I borrow it now? Yes, I can let you tell. Excellent. Thank you very much. Watch carefully. When I watch this trick, I'm pleasantly surprised by the increase in my fortunes. But a similar trick was used to make the Jays think their favourite snack had been replaced with a different one. Another £20 note. Basically what we did is that we show Stuka the waxworm in this case, we pretended to deposit it inside the cup, and then we turned the cups around. Then Stuka went in and chose to retrieve the cup where she saw we put the waxworm in. But in doing so, she found that magically the waxworm had transformed into a mealworm. And then we measured how long it took Stuka here, or any of the birds that we tested, to actually ingest, to eat the worm, okay? And we found that when we did this case, a devalue condition, so their first preferred item magically transformed into their less preferred item, they took way longer that when we did an up value condition, so their less preferred item in this case, transformed into their most preferred item. Think uh, about the magic effect that Clive did for you, okay? You were happy because a 10 pound note became a 20 pound note, that's great, right? But what if Clive takes your 10 pound note and transforms it into five pound note? Ah, it's not that happy anymore, right? You're not that willing to take that five pound note anymore. You want to give it back. You want Clive to transform it into a 10 pound note again, don't you? That's what happened here. Are you doing any magic experiments with any other animals besides scorpions? We're hoping to do some magic effects with primates. And we're also excited about exploring some of these ideas with cephalopods, cuttlefish, octopus, squid. You do get attached to these animals, especially when you spend a long time working with them. You notice their different personalities. Gone are the days of like scientists with white lab coats, not having any feelings for their subjects. We've learned too much about what's going on in their minds to just treat them as just banal subjects. Because these are not banal subjects. These, these animals can think, they can feel, they understand the past, the present and the future. And I, I don't see any point for me not to treat them as such, if, if this makes sense. Yeah, uh, amazing. Uh, the thing about hanging out with Nikki is that she can always find scientists, science and everything. And as we toured Comedy of Change, which was the piece about evolution, in the cities we went to, her and I, or sometimes just her or sometimes just me, gave talks about the work and about evolution. Um, and uh, we had always asked the local scientist um, to come and talk. So we had the evolution of sex. Um, and just at that moment, a, public, uh, a Catholic school arrived with all these little children and I went over and said uh, to the woman who's looking after them, oh, all the talks about sex today, is that okay? She said, we're a Catholic school, but it's fine. Um, and, uh, and then we had uh, the marine biologist who, when he heard it was Nikki Clayton, he said, oh, animal behavior what you need is marine biology and sort of went on like that as we toured the country which was a lot of fun i wonder if we could show one of my films at the moment and this was a, after a visit to the hedron collider um actually you could show a little bit of this one here nikki came up with a timeline that uh, started with primordial soup and ended with um a mobile phone and uh yeah, can you play some of the music? It's Haydn's a creation.
Um, and of course, it's great for dancers to be able to talk to Nikki uh, about evolution, you know, about below and above, about red light and blue light, about fungi, algae, but most, of, uh, especially, of course, birds. But I just want to show you uh, one last clip before I finish. Uh, that was uh, in South Africa. I went to work with Lady Smith back Mombazo. Um, it's a Zulu group. And uh, this was one of the dancers in Rombert, Dane Hurst. And um, actually, uh, it's, it's mental time travel, this one, which is one of Nikki's most favorite things. And mine now, too. <laughs> Nikki loved this because that's Umbalelo Nabene um, and Dane Hurst who dance in Rombe. Uh, and the tall guy is was well, a principal from the Royal, Royal Ballet. But she was, uh, you know, really enthralled because they hadn't heard that music. Uh, since they were children, so there was a mental time travel thing going on. Um, and actually, if you're a choreographer like me, you're using mental time travel all the time, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and then projecting into the future how I, I could use that experience. The, the tough thing about presenting stuff that has science in it is explaining it to an audience. Uh, you know, and uh, of course an audience has come to see some dance. Uh, sometimes they don't want to think about things like that. But actually it's lovely to leave an audience with something to think about. The gorgeousness, the beauty, the physicality, the incredible music, and then a little, little something to think about. So I'm, I just want to play this as the last thing, and it's a scientist explaining dance. Uh, this is from the Hedron Collider. He's a cosmologist stationed there. Um, and uh, yeah, there he is. That's it. That's, yeah, that's it. Can you play that one, please? Neutrons and protons are made up of these things called quarks. A proton is a particular configuration of three quarks, and a neutron is another one. Quarks do different things depending on how they're paired up with each other. So uh, by themselves, they just sort of whiz around. When they meet other quarks, uh, they start to sort of do a dance, if you like. They orbit each other in a particular way. And the cool thing about quarks is that they respond to the strongest force there exists in, in nature, the strong nuclear force. And what they do is they keep sort of firing these other particles called gluons in between them. They exchange gluons with each other and, and it's a very, very energetic exchange process. And, and they just become really, really tightly bound together. As quarks exist in protons and neutrons, they're just sort of whizzing around in this configuration where there's three of them in a stable configuration bound together by glue. Physics itself is a very complicated and, and you know, hard to put into words subject because it's primarily expressed through mathematics. But the oddest thing about nature, at least at the level of fundamental physics, is the more we try to understand it, the deeper and deeper we get, the more and more beautiful it starts to look to us. You know, nature really likes simplicity. There's some people think that ultimately nature is fundamentally described by tiny vibrating strings and that all the different particles are different notes in the string. The, the deeper and deeper we get, the more and more aesthetically pleasing it becomes in some sense after the fact that, I mean, it's very messy when we're trying to figure it out and we get it wrong all the time. But once you understand what it actually happens, you find that it's, there's something very beautiful about it. The, the sort of journey of discovery in physics has been also a journey of finding you know, the deeper, more, if you like, elegant truths of the universe. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for a really personal and a thoughtful talk. 
Um, our next speaker, Alex Jordan, joins us from the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior in Germany. Alex's research, which often takes place out in the field, explores environmental factors that shape the evolution and maintenance of animal social behavior, particularly that seen in cichlid fish and social spiders. The title of his presentation today is Liminal Limnology, Exploring the Space Between Air and Water, AI and Ethology, Art and Science. Hello everyone. Um, I'll let this play actually. Uh, it's not the first slide, but let's ignore the technical difficulties um, that we're having. Um, I've had an absolutely nightmare run to get here. I arrived about 15 minutes ago, um, having missed my flight uh, <laughs> last night. Um, so this morning I woke up in, um, in uh, I don't know, where was I? In Zurich, uh, and now I'm here. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure, so uh, I'm really enjoying um, already the presentations we've, we've, we've seen and, uh, and, and the opportunity to talk to you about this interface, um, and in particular, um, this idea of what animals uh, perceive about the world and their interactions. I, I, I call the, the title uh, today um, that I submitted, but unfortunately didn't update, um, Liminal Limnology, because I study lakes. I'm a marine biologist. Uh, Mia um, culpa, but uh, I, I also explore this interface between the ways we we explore and understand, in particular, animal behaviour, but also the methods we use and the approaches we take to do that. Uh, I'm very interested in challenging um, the sort of, as we heard in the video, the the the, the white lab coat kind of approach uh, to science um, and to the sort of um, disengagement with our study organisms. I'm very interested in getting uh, under their skin. So to give you a little scientific background um, about what I'm interested in. No? Fine. Um, it's a very simple question, um, a beguilingly simple question, which is, which is how does behavior evolve? And you may be familiar with this, uh, this sketch that Darwin did in the margins of, of one of his notebooks um, about how he thought um, things changed over time. This is just sort of the... the uh, initial image of, of, of a phylogeny, let's, let's say. Um, and for many traits and many of the things we study, color, size, ornaments, these kind of things, it makes a lot of sense to think about um, progression along an evolutionary trajectory, that things change gradually and branch out like this. But behavior is something very different to that. Behavior is, is responsive, it's continually updating, it's, it's flexible, it's plastic, it's individually variable. Um, and so it's not clear what we would even put on any of these branches if we were thinking about behavior. Um, and so this is the, the goal of, of my research program. As you may be able to tell also from my accent, I am not uh, a native of Germany. It's just that that's where the money is right now in science, so that's where I live. Um, I'm initially from the, the global south. And so it's, it's, it's this kind of question that, that really drives me. Um, but to answer this kind of question, you need a lot of approaches um, and, and your research can take you in a lot of different directions. Um, and so just to give you a little um, introduction into some of the, the, the systems that we use and the approaches. So I'm very interested in um, social spiders, as has been mentioned. Um, I find these occupy this beautiful space, both in our imagination, uh, somewhere between fascination and fear, um, but also this interaction between the physical structures they produce in behaving and then how those physical structures modify and mediate their behaviors. They produce something in the world, and then that thing that they've produced controls how they interact with the world. I think that's a fascinating um, thing to think about and something um, that I'm continually interested in exploring. As you're also gonna be seeing, I use a lot of tracking approaches, a lot of fancy visualizations, and that's entirely just to impress you. It's got no scientific, no, that's not true. It has some scientific value as well, um, but I'm, I'm very interested in videos and, and using um, artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches to expand our ability to understand what these animals are doing. 
I'm interested in the ideas of ornamentation and courtship. So this is some work we do on guppies, looking at how the males perform this courtship dance um, in, with respect to the ornaments that they bear, how they change the shape of their body, how they display themselves to the female audience um, in order to best showcase their attributes. And so this is looking at, 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 again, this idea of social behavior, but also behavior with respect to the physical self, not the um, perhaps environmental or structural uh, world that you're interacting with. I don't just study animals either, I'm also interested in plant behavior. Um, and that might sound a strange thing to, to hear, plant behavior, but of course plants do behave. They just do it on a time scale that perhaps is slower than we're used to observing. And so here we're very interested in this social interaction of sunflowers, how sunflowers shade one another and avoid one another, how the social dimension uh, of interaction affects growth. Um, and here, of course, you're seeing behavior sped up, but this is, of course, fundamentally no different to behavior in any other system. And finally, um, before I get into to this, today's topic, um, this, uh, this is a new system in, in, in my lab, a fantastic postdoc, Daniela, who will soon be super famous. Uh, so remember the name. She had a paper just uh, recently looking at REM sleep in spiders and the, the, the potential for jumping spiders to dream. And so currently in my lab, we have a lot of work um, going on showing spiders a lot of visual uh, imagery during the day and seeing how they react to that physically and whether they recall any of those uh, movements in their dream states. Uh, ascertaining what even is a dream is, is complicated, um, and, and ascertaining whether non-human species are dreaming is, is even further complicated, uh, but this is some work we have in that direction. But today I want to focus um, primarily on aquatic systems because that is the primary system we work with in the lab, asking questions about when, when these animals, when these, these fish are interacting with one another and with the world, what are they perceiving about the world? What do they know about the world? What do they feel? What's important to them? Do they have preferences? Do they have desires? Do they have friendships? Um, do they have aesthetic values they're trying to, um, to, to either conform to or, or be attracted to? Um, and, and again, here showing you some, some of these fancy visualizations. Um, and as, as we heard in the introduction, um, we, we aim to do all of this work out in the field, underwater in places like Corsica, Lake Tanganyika in Africa is a big um, study site for us, um, Zanzibar, Jamaica, some quite nice uh, postcard places to, to go, to be honest. And in those places, some of them are beautiful, some of them are less beautiful, like here we have, this is the bottom of Lake Tanganyika in Africa, um, a bit of a muddy, grim kind of scene, but we try to, uh, get a broad picture of, of the interactions of every single individual in a social group to try and uh, disentangle um, some of these aspects of, of how they perceive the world um, and how they interact with it, how they interface with the world. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is, is this angle of sociality and how important this is for all animals um, and, and even plants for that matter. Um, and some of the work we've done to look into what is important um, in this interaction and, and, and is there any kind of advanced sociality in any of these species that we see. And so here's some work um, with a, a, a type of cichlid fish. A cichlid fish is, is one of the most speciose groups of, of fish. Um, fish uh, are 50% of all vertebrates uh, are fish and, and cichlids are among the most speciose. Um, it's, it's a similar number of cichlids in the world as there are mammals, and probably you've never even heard of a cichlid. And that's okay, that's okay, you're about to. Um, and so these cichlids, in the lab at least, um, but also in, in, in the wild, live in these social groups where there are dominant uh, and subordinate individuals, or so we label them. Um, the dominant individuals are aggressive, full of testosterone, colorful, they court, they chase, they're territorial, and the subordinate individuals are well, we might call them meek. Uh, they're, they're drably colored, um, they, they are not very aggressive. And the question we have here is, 
if we wanted to influence this group, if we wanted to change the behavior of this group, and we wanted to seed information, either with a dominant individual or a subordinate individual, who would be best at actually controlling um, what this group does or influencing what this group does? And the answer is somewhat counterintuitive, perhaps, because even though the dominant males in this case are the ones that are best connected in their social networks and, and exert the most overt influence in their groups. If we want the group to learn a task, and here we teach them to differentiate some reward structures, it's actually these subordinate individuals that are the best um, at, at um, influencing what the group does, and that's to do with the ways they interact. Dominance in the way we use the term in animal groups has so much to do with aggression, but within these groups, that's perhaps not how they perceive one another. They don't perceive the, the aggressive individual as being the most important or influential um, or, or the most reliable source of information. With these approaches, we also um, look at the same things out in the wild. And in the wild, of course, you have a lot more going on, a lot more interactions, a lot more uh, species that you're dealing with, but you've also got the environment itself that you have to deal with. And so in our work, we, we endeavor to incorporate some, of the, some understanding of the environmental interactions that might mediate these behaviors um, and, and can demonstrate, for instance, that you might come to some conclusions in the absence of, of that kind of incorporation of information that are completely erroneous when you actually layer in these environmental um, uh, attributes. And so here, just a little example, we can see that if we, if we have these colored tracks here, um, that represent the way these fish move through space, we can see that at some point the, the group splits up. And we might think that that's some social element occurring, it just so happens that there was a big bloody rock in the way, so they had to, to move around it. And this kind of uh, thing might sound a bit trivial, but it's, it's actually very complicated and, 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 and important when you're trying to understand the way animals perceive the world uh, to incorporate that world into that kind of analysis to ask whether there's uh, anything else going on. The next thing we're interested in is, is what I've called aesthetic preferences. Do animals care about beauty? Do they have a sense of beauty? Do they have a, a sense of things that they prefer or not? Do they care about the shape of the world? Certainly they seem to care about the colors and, and, and the ornamentation on one another, but do they care about the world itself? And so here we work again underwater sometimes working with these, these bower building cichlids that create these beautiful structures and care very much how that structure looks if you perturb it. Um, but also with some of these uh, shell dwelling cichlids that live in these fossilized shells um, in, the, in the bottom of the lake. And we've found that we can scan these shells and then recreate them with 3D printing and start to manipulate elements of how these shells look and the shape of these shells. Um, finding that they have these, these little cute little fish that we work with have very strong preferences for what these shells look like. These are not just unthinking animals that dive into the nearest uh, dark cave. They have very strong opinions, as it were, on how the world should be and how they choose to interact with different uh, aspects of that world. That, in fact, has led us um, directly into some really fantastic collaborations with, with many artists. Um, and so on the spider side, I work with a good friend of mine, Tomas Saraceno, who builds these architectural level uh, sculptures based on spider webs. This is work with a, a Danish uh, art collective called Superflex. Um, and, and with them, we've been exploring this idea of interspecies architecture and co-design. Um, and so here we have these uh, structures uh, that are human designed um, based on simple architectural principles um, that we, we think the fish in the ocean might like. What we then do is place these, uh, these, these sculptures into the ocean and we examine, using exactly the same techniques as I've showed you, how the fish use these structures, where they, they choose to be in these spaces, how those spaces interact with their social structure and their social behavior. Um, and, and in this case, even where they're choosing to lay their eggs. These are some damselfish in, in Corsica um, being surrounded, as you see, by barracuda, which are very interested in, in this uh, spawning uh, aggregation. And so then we analyze 
how the, the animals have used these structures. And we use evolutionary algorithms, which is a fancy way of just saying we use a sort of statistical uh, moving forward through space to change the structures to be more like what the fish like, more like what the fish want. Then we take these structures back out of the ocean um, and we give them to humans and we ask now humans, how do you now like this structure that's been produced, co-produced by a fish? Um, how can you use this structure? Um, one of the uh, early versions of that is something you just saw at the introduction, which is uh, we built a, a very simple, this is the earliest version of this structure, which has since been updated to be much more uh, preferable for the fish, and we put this in the Coachella Valley um, in, in the middle of the desert and asked how humans um, prefer uh, to, to interact with this structure. Now, actually, as I was watching uh, Mark's presentation, one of the major challenges we have here is that humans, when they just walk around such a structure, they walk around just the base of it. They don't have the three-dimensional access um, to this structure that the fish have, so they're using it in a fundamentally different way. Um, and I've been uh, speaking with uh, a childhood friend of mine who's, who's now a physical uh, theatre director, whether we can break that third dimension and, and see if we can get maybe some acrobats or, or some other uh, form of physical performers to interact more like a fish would with this structure um, that's been designed uh, by the fish. But now I want to come to this, uh, this idea of, of not just in terms of sociality and not just in terms of aesthetic preferences, um, but in terms of awareness. What, what does an animal know about the world? And in fact, what does an animal know about itself? And so this is some work uh, that I've done with this very charismatic and beautiful fish, um, the, the blue streak cleaner ass, which is here, um, asking whether these fish know that they exist whether these fish can recognize themselves in a mirror and whether they can understand that the mirror is a representation of self rather than a representation of another individual, for instance, through a window. And you may have heard of this uh, mirror test. It's, uh, it's pretty um, well known in the... In the, in the, in the in the trade, let's say. Um, and it was developed in the, in the 70s by Gordon Gallup to examine both the onset of, of human um, self-awareness and self-consciousness, but also then applied to chimpanzees. Um, and the idea of the test is that you place a mark somewhere on the body of the subject that cannot be seen except with the aid of the mirror. And it's relatively simple and, and, and elegant, and hence that's, I think, uh, why it's had such, such impact. Um, and if the, if the subject looks in the mirror and sees this mark and touches itself to interact with or attempt to remove the mark, rather than touch the mirror, then it's clear that the animal or the subject, well, humans or animals, uh, recognizes that the reflection is a representation of self. And the idea early on was that that was then indicative of self-consciousness. The animal was aware that it existed and this was a representation of itself. Now, over time, different animals have been subjected to the test. Many, 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 many animals fail. Um, but, but some, over time, have been shown to pass. And as we go down the passage of time, you might notice that the suitability of the test starts to decrease because what the test requires is that you have some kind of uh, appendage that can move to a place in your body that humans would be able to interpret as self-directed behavior, as a behavior that's uh, intended to, to remove this mark. Um, so elephants, of course, are, are good. They have a big, long trunk. That's, that's pretty easy for us uh, humans to interpret. Uh, magpies as well, they have a beak. But what if we got onto something like a fish? How would a fish, which doesn't have limbs that could, could uh, be used for such a thing, um, even begin to approach this test? And is this test then a fair metric of self-awareness and self-consciousness if, if we're trying to place creation, uh, creation in the evolutionary sense rather than, well, to each their own, um, uh, on some kind of scale, which is very much a tendency that we have uh, as humans. It, 
is it a fair uh, test? And in fact, um, we tried this, this mirror test with cichlids, these, this group of fish, and none of them passed. None of them attempted to remove the mark. But that's a bit of a vexing finding because you're not sure if they didn't attempt to remove the mark because they failed, they didn't understand, or they just don't care. They don't have an aesthetic preference which drives them to try to remove some um, discoloration or, or, or discoloration is not even the right word, a different colour on, on their bodies. Um, and when I was uh, living and working in Japan with my collaborators there, we began to think, well, which species would be good? Which species does care about um, marks on the body? And so we came to this, this fish that I mentioned, the cleaner wrasse, and, and the, the clue is in the, in the name, really, right? It, it cares about cleaning. It, it cares about uh, cleanliness. It removes these uh, ectoparasites from the skin of client fish. And so it's got both the sensory ecology, but also probably the cognitive machinery to detect discolorations and, and want, be motivated to remove them. So we decided to pass uh, this, this little fellow through the test. And the test has three prephases that have to occur before you supply the mark to the animal. Um, the first phase, which is common in almost every species, is aggression to the mirror. And if you haven't looked on uh, YouTube um, for these videos of mirrors in the jungles, if strangely that's, that's somehow not been on your playlist, I recommend you put it on there now, uh, because it's quite, uh, quite enjoyable to see all of the various uh, forest animals uh, try to murder this, this reflection. And most animals never get past this phase. And so you can have birds that continually attack car mirrors. Uh, if you're from, from my uh, end of the world, you'll have uh, parrots that destroy the mirrors. Um, but most animals never get past this phase. If they do, they enter this, this second phase of contingency testing, mirror testing behaviors. They start to do things towards their reflection that they would never otherwise do. For humans, it can be making silly faces. Mm, um, also for, for primates, you get some kind of difference in facial expression. But this is also a very complex part if we're thinking about more distant animals to humans. What is unusual for a fish? How do you interpret what a spider is doing that's outside of its normal range of behaviors? So this is a very interesting element of the test. In fact, it's the one I'm most interested in. Um, but but uh, at any rate, this is the second phase of the test. And in phase three, animals will use the mirror as a tool. So they'll start to explore their bodies in exactly the same way we would use a mirror in a changing room. Um, they understand that this thing now allows me visual access to other parts of my body. I'm not going to go too um, deep into stats or, or figures, but this is... Um, a representation of the aggression shown towards the mirror. We have two panels here. The top panel is showing uh, the reactions towards a mirror, and the bottom panel is showing reactions towards a conspecific, which is a member of the same species, across a clear glass divide. And so this is an important control because all the behaviors, uh, if they were identical in these two conditions, that would suggest they're treating the mirror not as self, but just as another individual behind some barrier. And so we get this very con uh, consistent with, with uh, other species. Uh, initially, almost 100% of the time, they're showing aggression towards the mirror. They are trying to kill this other fish um, across the divide. But then by day seven, it drops to zero. In the conspecific case, it's, it's low to begin with and remains low throughout. Then, uh, concurrent with the drop in aggression, we start to get an increase in these contingency testing behaviors, these idiosyncratic strange behaviors. And I'm going to come back to what a strange behavior in a fish might actually be. But you get none of that in the conspecific. This is not an error. There are just no cases of that in, in, the, in the social um, context. <clears throat> and then phase three, um, this... Uh, exploration of reflection. Now, one of the things about fish is that they do not have what we call directed gaze. They don't have a foveated, well, 
Okay. Some of these fish don't have a foveated uh, region uh, of the retina. You can't tell what they're looking at. And so to be uh, conservative in your interpretation, all we can say is that they are in positions that would allow them to see their reflection if that's what they were looking at, if that's what they were paying attention to. But we cannot determine if they're actually looking at the mirror. Nevertheless, it's, it's not such an important point, except to show that it's consistent with phase three in the mirror condition. And in a conspecific condition, they are always interested in looking at a social partner, um, whether that's for aggressive reasons or, or, or social affiliative reasons. Okay, so this top panel tells us that these fish pass through the first three phases of the test as behaviorally laid out. So now we can do the actual test, which is to provide them with a, a, a mark. But before that, let's look um, at some of these behaviors. And then I want you now to think about what would a fish do that would convince you it's performing self-directed behavior? Keep that in your mind. How would a fish do the equivalent of this? What are its options? So let's look first um, at, please. Yes. So this is aggression towards the mirror, the open mouth um, attack um, by this individual. Um, you can see this is before I started my own lab and I have, <clears throat> I have a different aesthetic preference to this lab. This is a, not a tank I would ever allow um, to be on video. Anyway, um, but here we have some unusual behavior. And what you might notice here is this fish is approaching the mirror and swimming upside down. Um, if anyone's had a goldfish as a child, when it's swimming upside down, it's not a good sign. Um, and so uh, here we have quite a clear diversion from, um, from uh, normal behavior. And here is our self-directed behavior. So the fish will go to the mirror, look at its reflection, go down to the substrate where the mark is, and scratch that part of the body against the substrate and then look back um, at the mirror. And so it's in fact that sequence of behaviors uh, that we're interested in. This looking at the mirror down to the substrate and then back um, as evidence of this self-directed behavior. In this case, we had three of our four throat marked uh, fish pass this test. In subsequent studies, we've had nine of 12, and most recently, we've had 16 of 18. Um, this is the highest pass rate for any species in the mirror test, even higher than 14 month old humans. But not adult humans, sadly. Okay, to finish up, I wanna talk about behavioral language, because this, I think, is a really important aspect um, when we're trying to understand uh, behaviors of non-human animals, for example, these idiosyncratic strange behaviors, how do we interpret those things? Um, and, and really that's something we're doing through AI because behavior, as I said, is not a, a, not a, a, a chunkable thing. You can't take out pieces of an animal's repertoire and say, this is X and this is Y, at least not easily, at least not reliably. Certainly not in my field and certainly not with some of my closest collaborators and friends, we absolutely do not agree on what we're observing. And this is a problem. And so here we use some of these technologies that are emerging to break down behavior into its constituent parts in a continuum, but the important part is those labels come last. So whether you want to call things in big groups or small groups or, or have no labels or have different labels really doesn't matter because it comes secondarily. Um, and so you can, you can use these approaches that have been developed in, in less interesting species like fruit flies. Um, and we try to employ these both in the lab, as you can see here, but also in the wild. So here's uh, Lake Tanganyika, where we can examine the posture and movement over time of these animals in a continuum um, and ask what are they doing. We can then track these things and represent them in any kind of quantitative space and don't worry about that too much except to say it's a continuous space that we can explore and represent either in descriptive terms, or we can even recreate it. And so uh, finally, I just wanna leave you with our, our most recent um, work, which is 
where we have generated these avatars, these fish avatars, um, that are populated with the behaviors of real fish that we can then represent in different sequences, durations, contexts, and play them back to real fish, which we're now doing underwater in Lake Tanganyika and also in the ocean, and have a real fish interacting with an avatar that's performing a certain behavior. So if we think this behavior is courtship, or we think this behavior is aggression, or we think it's social affiliation, we can play that behavior back to the real fish and look at what the real fish does, look at how it interprets the behavior. So then we really have this, this, this babble fish, which is a real fish telling us as scientists whether we are right or wrong about our intuition and our interpretation of animal behavior. And this is uh, the basis of an art installation that will be in Basel um, in August um, and then also part of uh, many future works, um, both uh, in this virtual one but also in this uh, interspecies architecture co-creation, um, which has really brought forward um, a lot of our scientific um, work and, and inspiration. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to talk about these and many other ideas over the course of the day. So thank you to you. And, and more importantly than you, I'm sorry, uh, all the local uh, collaborators and the team in the field who make all of this possible. Thanks again. We have time maybe just for one question from the audience. <clears throat> I can see hands, but I can yeah, thank you choose. You then in the middle. <laughs> you. Maybe at the back there, I saw a hand go up. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks very much for this wonderful talk in, in, in both content and, and visuals. Um, it's not my area. Um, I'm actually a Drosophila geneticist. Oh dear. <laughs> one of those less interesting species. I'll remember that. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, the Tanganyika Lake and, and cichlids appear to be, according to what I remember, a hot spot for evolutionary biologists in terms of speciation and so on. So, uh, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about the difficulty of mapping behavior on a kind of phylogenetic tree. So I wonder now that you seem to have made extraordinary progress with many different systems and so on, could you tell us any revelations about the evolution of behavior based on, on, your, on your work? I can, provided this doesn't, I don't get quoted for this because this is my current feeling um, but it requires population. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm wearing two hats here. If you want me to answer this in the, in the pure scientific realm, we are working on um, behavioral ancestral state reconstruction. So we are trying to have uh, stable behavioral labels at the end of these uh, tree tips and then trace back the ancestral state of these behaviors and the evolutionary trajectory of behavioral diversification. Okay, that's a scientific answer. But my feeling is that evolution does not create specialized machines for certain tasks. So we are looking, as, as you can probably tell, at 56 species, thereabouts, um, and trying to get behavioral repertoires for all of them because they live very differently. Some are very social, live in large social groups, interact with many individuals each day, have differentiated relationships. Some live entirely solitary lives, and we can watch them. Uh, I don't do it anymore, but you know, pe people in the lab watch these things for months, underwater, watching these fish for months, and they do nothing. It must be a very challenging uh, task. Um, and yet, if we take these species that do nothing all day, and we can never observe a natural, uh, rich repertoire of behavior, and we put them in a context that might elicit that, they, they can do it. So it looks like evolution is producing uh, 
generalized behavioral machines that can be expressed very differently and plastically according to context. And that's, of course, entirely consistent with what we understand of the development of the brain um, and the way that, that input-output works. And so that's the thing that I, you can't quote me on just yet, but I imagine in two, three years, um, we will have enough of a data set to state that there is not strong behavioral evolution even in a system that is famed for its massive diversification in every other uh, trait. That was a bit sciencey, sorry, but yeah. Great, thanks. Pleasure. So thanks again to Alex for that uh, really uh, diverse and insightful presentation. I'm um, going to move on to our next contributor now, uh, Lucia Pietroisti. Um, Lucia is a curator working internationally at the intersection of art, ecology, and system science, often bringing together interdisciplinary perspectives to challenge anthropocentric worldviews. Lucia's many accomplishments include founding the General Ecology Project at Serpentine Galleries in London, and since 2018, curating interdisciplinary festival the shape of a circle in the mind of a fish, together with Felipe Ramos. Her presentation today is titled Senses of Purpose. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to read off this, so let me just find a completely safe place to put it. Um, so, whoopsie daisy, no, that doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to do this. Aha! All right, so I also, uh, as I'm sure you can tell already, uh, I also just arrived about 15 minutes ago, and uh, can you hear me fine if I'm this far from the mic? Is that okay? Yeah, good. I also arrived about 15 minutes ago. I apologize to Mark for missing the first presentation. Instead of waking up in Zurich, though, I woke up in Hackney with a really moody six-year-old that wouldn't let me leave. So, <laughs> so um, we'll wake up. I will wake up with you right now. Um, so uh, my name is Lucia, I work on a, uh, as a curator, um, and I'm going to share with you a few ideas and positions that I find helpful when I try to navigate the task of working across art and more than human paradigms towards an environmentally balanced and environmentally just planet. But also, and this is because we all need to know that what we're doing has a purpose of some sort, to try and work out what this amorphous field of culture, be it art, creativity, poetry, but also divinity, myth, and so many others, have to contribute to this whole question of working towards a sense of purpose that has to do with uh, reaching or striving towards an environmentally just and balanced planet. So um, I suppose that's because there are some sort of fundamental principles that drives my own sense of purpose, which does have to do with environmental justice and environmental balance as inextricably linked to one another. Um, I will skip through a little bit of this, but given the fact that to so much of today's infrastructure and dispositions of space, be they finance, climate, uh, or infrastructure, are indeed built on imp empire's infrastructure, uh, that these dispositions still determine power dynamics that we uh, hold between humans, but also between uh, certain humans and environmental landscapes. So that lives, when we talk about the planet, we're really talking about lives, livelihoods and landscapes all at the same time. And it is a kind of intuition, not only of myself, but of so many uh, thinkers and artists and uh, uh, practitioners from many disciplines, it is a kind of intuition that, um, that there is something that these more than human ways of thinking, the thing that I think brings us into this room, have to contribute toward these questions of simultaneous planetary balance and justice. And that is to say that when anthropocentrism is sort of defined within the kind of, uh, I suppose, Western definition of the Anthropos during the Enlightenment, primarily during the Enlightenment, although that's uh, sort of uh, uh, too quick a shortcut, uh, uh, that when it was defined, it never actually meant all humans in the first place. It was the normative establishment about which humans experience, which human experience does indeed matter 
when everything else became an externality. So I didn't train as a curator. I actually uh, studied English and French literature, and then I ended up finding myself working in something called public programs in museum institutions, which is to say it's kind of an outcrop of education department, but it's basically anything that really happens in time. So film programs, music programs, conferences, lectures, events, talks, and so on. And that kind of means that I've always found myself sort of enmeshed in a kind of interdisciplinary mess, which worked very well for me because I have a tendency to become curious about lots and lots of things. And perhaps, I, you know, in what I um, sort of grab in width and breadth of, of curiosity and experience, I lack in depth. But <laughs> I'll let you decide that later. Um, so... In uh, his essay, uh, The Great Derangement, uh, the author Amitav Ghosh, and novelist Amitav Ghosh, describes the contemporary crisis of the imagination as the greatest obstacle to facing contemporary environmental breakdown. Ghosh speaks of discontinuities as a habit of mind. Quote, to break problems into smaller and smaller puzzles until a solution presents itself. This is a way of thinking that deliberately excludes things and forces, quote, externalities that lie beyond the horizon of the matter at hand. It is a perspective that renders the interconnectedness of Gaia unthinkable. It is a fairly commonplace statement to make that the ongoing environmental breakdown that befalls the planet today is infinitely complex, unequally distributed, and occurring at scales that are challenging to grasp for a single human mind. More challenging still, perhaps, or maybe I should say brain, for a single human brain, more challenging still, perhaps, may be the notion that specializations, those smaller and smaller puzzles that Gauche refers to, may be in any position to make a U-turn and embark on a new holistic journey, one that would resolutely connect them back together, one that might give an apprehension or an intuition of the whole. This tends to be the realm of the spiritual and of the dreamlike, and I have to say that I'm being contradicted by the very presence of such scientists as indeed Alex, who you've just listened to, heard, because I think it's a very, uh, very, very precious, but also very, very uh, tiny corner of the scientific world that actually does see those, uh, the interconnectedness of the whole and finds within that kind of event horizon their own sense of purpose. But let's say in general, do we sometimes mourn the distance between the smaller and smaller puzzle and the whole? In the deep emotional field of hope or of hopelessness, of anger or of bitterness or of fear with which we encounter climate breakdown, I believe hides the sense of something missing, a gap between situated experience and the weave of everything. And the stakes, of course, as I said, are higher than just an emotion because lives, livelihoods and landscapes are being imperiled and destroyed today with political will appearing stagnant at best and cynical at worst towards any kind of meaning, meaningful transition. But specializations are powerful forces. They shape brains as much as they fill the times of our working lives. By virtue of necessity, a specialization requires the refinement of a particular code, a language, a shorthand, a community of practice, a shared paradigm of understanding. And they also require forms of Selection, as the object of study comes further and further into view and into sharper focus, the rest dissolves into the blurry background. Signal and noise are established firmly, and every field of specialization makes signal and noise out of different objects. Now, over the past years, but most sharply in the past months, I have come to be convinced that this work of connection, a kind of weaving practice, a sort of cross-disciplinary translation that we may, in fact, be doing right this moment, and of sort of development of tools for mutual understanding, may be so fundamental in relation to climate breakdown and environmental and planetary complexity so as to point towards a new field of practice in and of itself. Uh, I had a recent experience of this, actually, at a roundtable between climate litigators and climate scientists, uh, that pr uh, the, those climate scientists that provide uh, legal practitioners with the data that they need to support arguments in court. And a really incredibly astute question from a member of the audience said, uh, asked something about burden of proof in law as opposed to science. And it, 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 when you look at it in, sort of she in numbers, in, in sheer numbers, if you are uh, trying to win a court case, 
All you need to prove is that something is more likely than unlikely to be the case. That is a burden of proof of about 51%. Whereas I'm told reliably by scientists that you need to have a margin of error that is far smaller than 49% in order to be able to make, uh, to sort of publish uh, a result. That necessarily means that when you're trying to make those two systems fit together, you've got one system that works on the 51% mark and one system that needs the, I'm gonna say 95% mark, although I'm happy to be corrected, um, that try and sort of speak to each other. And that itself is a big difficulty. And it came out at this round table that I participated in very, very clearly. Now, in response to this, and in part owing to this distinctive lack of specialization, pathological la lack of specialization on my part, my instinct has always been to try and listen out for points of resonance between these languages and these codes. Places from which, at a distant distance, different fields of study or practice appear to be reaching towards one another. A kind of yearning that never quite reaches the other side or does so only rarely. And there is a particular joy, a kind of jolt of pleasure, enjoyment in these moments when things that are so far away appear to move towards and sometimes even touch each other. It feels like a circuit that was always broken finally becomes connected. Or another way of putting it, it feels like zooming out and realizing that larger weave that connects everything and that in fact always did. It is an experience that is a little bit sublime, a sense of finding sense, of making sense of the here and now. And it is indicative, in fact, it is meaningful that we get a similar feeling on occasion when we encounter experiences of the poetic, the artistic, and the divine. So very quickly, I will um, uh, sort of try to feel through some learnings from my own practice as an art curator that point to why it is this uh, sort of serendipity that these feelings can be encountered through the poetic, the creative, and the divine. Now, the first thing is a kind of uh, guide for me, always, and has always been, which is this passage from an architect, uh, Keller Easterling's book, Medium Design, in which she writes, where nothing is new and nothing is right, there are no dramatic manifestos, but maybe there is a chance to rehearse a habit of mind that has been eclipsed. You are already able to detect as if with half-closed eyes, and that's the important part, a world at a different focal length. Rather than only declarations, right answers, objects, and determinations, you can detect and manipulate the medium or matrix in which they are suspended and in which they change over time. And it is that um, specific thing that interests me in my own uh, sort of research practice, is that medium or matrix and how that comes into view when you start to look at things as if with half-closed eyes. As, that is to say, uh, trying to encounter the objects of study with a certain degree, allowance for a certain degree of approximation, blurriness, sort of slippage, and so on. Poetic license, if you like. It was in kind of that spirit that I uh, developed this project um, that was mentioned, uh, General Ecology, which is a kind of infrastructural project, really, at the Serpentine Gallery. The Serpentine is a contemporary art museum. Um, and it, uh, it has a sort of stated sense of purpose of displaying the best contemporary art of the moment that is most relevant to the time. And what, in 2018, on the back of, in fact, having a baby, I decided to write a project for the Serpentine that would try and sort of situate its own sense of purpose to be pointing further towards environmental justice and environmental balance. And the reason why the General Ecology Project, which then took place in the form of all kinds of kind of behind the scenes infrastructural things and also programs and projects, of which I'll tell you one, the reason why that <coughs> project even came uh, to me is connected to my child, not in the sense of like, you know, what world are we leaving for the next generation and so on, because of course we know that we're not at the f front line of climate breakdown, so that question is not actually as immediately urgent as it is in other places in the world. But it was because for me, who tends to overthink experiences that should really be quite simple, having a baby taught me something about relating to a more than human being. That is to say, you don't need language to communicate or to have an attachment or a sense of care and responsibility. And because of the fact that you have that love guaranteed for a period of time that lasts beyond the length of your own life, 
It therefore means that it is possible for the mind to exist beyond its own existence, beyond its own life, which means that the step, and for me it's like the step from you know, existing in one life and then just nudging that just a few decades further ahead in time, the step between that kind of leap of mind or that poetic leap and indeed thinking through deep time is actually just a tiniest little bit further a step. So it wasn't that, that, that difficult a leap to make. So that was my kind of collapse into or tumble into uh, the ecological field. It was through a very more than human ex experience in perhaps one of the most human <laughs> of, of events. Now, one thing that concerns me a lot, uh, a lot lately, and this is uh, inspired by a friend and philosopher, Federico Campagna, is what worlds do we imply? What metaphysics, what principles about the kind of laws that govern this world do we imply when we create a piece of knowledge, when we create a piece of poetry, when we create anything at all? A piece of architecture, for example. What do we think about spirits? when we build a house with a certain kind of door. I'm almost, I'm sort of badly quoting Federico in this, but... And what, one of the things that my colleague Filipe Ramos and I uh, have been trying to do through a project called um, The Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish has been to ask exactly that question and to slightly shift that with the aid of as many disciplines as we could possibly gather and convene in the same space. Now, The Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish is a, re a research project and a festival series and then be uh, is also going to become a publication which um, was inspired, I mean, its name was inspired by the incredible uh, circles in the sand that pufferfish uh, make. Um, now, if you ask, if you listen to David Attenborough in The Blue Planet, you will find that those incredibly elaborate, ornate pieces of art, really, that the fish makes at the bottom of the sea, the male pufferfish make at the bottom of the sea, are um, aesthetic displays for the purposes of mating. But what interested us uh, uh, also, irrespective of sort of the why of this incredible construction, was also the how and the what. Meaning, and this is not, doesn't come from a behavioral ecologist or a biologist's point of view, it just comes from, an, uh, sort of <laughs> from working in the arts and seeing something that looks very much like an artwork, is we notice, we perceive, we recognize, and we appreciate that circle. I wish I had an image for you, actually, but that circle from the top down as a whole, as a consistent, as a circle in fact, as a kind of mandala-like complex series of um, uh, sort of sand dunes and so on as a circle. But when you look at the pufferfish making this shape, the pufferfish is really small from a scalar perspective. So what you're seeing is this. Well, more like this. The kind of swimming around and shuffling sand around in a way that is really sort of from down there, kind of from inside of the circle. And so, I started to wonder, um, Filippa and I started to wonder together, what, how does this circle manifest in the fish's, let's say, mind before it becomes a circle or as the circle is being, is being produced? Could it be that something that we perceive as a circle and therefore through the medium of, let's say, geometry and eyes could be perceived or created as, a, in fact, a dance or a piece of choreography or a set of movement coordinates? Again, possibly an incredibly not rigorous scientific question, but again, just think breadth rather than depth. Um, and out of that, what we tried to do is create the series that really asked questions around what we sort of nicknamed stuff in an interspecies context, as in can we try and shift away from an anthropocentric viewpoint and look at things like intelligence, language, cognition, memory, uh, humor, love, uh, chanting, transformation, mourning, grief, and so forth through a de-anthropocentric perspective. How would, uh, how, would, how would we do that and who would we convene to be able to start to ask those questions? And the idea was really not to sort of head-on attack anthropocentrism. We, wouldn't, we sort of are not in the business of attacking in the first place, but really to offer a kind of, um, I suppose, feminist-inspired delicate unpicking of some of the things that are implied when we live within an anthropocentric metaf metaphysics or an anthropocentric worldview. Things like we need language to communicate, which I've already spoken about and which was the first festival's kind of subject. The second one had to do with we, you know, an, an, uh, kind of a, an assumption that we might call we really know what we mean when we say I or we. And it really had to do with interior multitude, the swarming of bacteria that is actually our 
constitutive of our sense of self, and uh, the corollary of that, which might be a sort of planetary organism question or Gaia theory. By the third, we were thinking about plant behavior, plant consciousness, uh, plant intelligence, and communications with and through the vegetal world. And yes, some practices around plant medicines were also important in our research in that. Uh, in that. The fourth one brought some issues uh, around climate justice and land rights into uh, the, the picture a little bit more in sharp focus in that what we decided to look at was uh, soil. In fact, Andrew Hadamatsky was participated in that, and Daisy Lafarge. <laughs> uh, if I'm forgetting anyone, that there's like an overlap between the, the fish. Uh, it's so joyful to meet you all here, so I apologize if I'm forgetting anyone. Obviously, Alex at the last one, but I'm getting there. Um, so uh, what we decided is to take a piece of soil, and by thinking, okay, what do we call this? So we call it earth, soil, land, dirt, ground, dust. I think that's it. And if we invite practitioners from different disciplines to respond to those words, then what emerges if we take this piece of soil seriously, as uh, the anthropologist Anna Tsing and the artist Elaine Gan say, what, what happens if you take it seriously and you really ask of it all possible questions that could be asked? It's microbiology, the more than human residents that inhabit within, the possibilities that those lend, to, lend themselves to computing research all the way through to the, the toxic distribution of dust and pollution uh, along racial lines in Johannesburg. So we had that breadth to be able to really think through a sort of material-led or a sort of more than human actually led um, kind of uh, birthing point to try and really bring together some of those ideas around social, environmental justice, and planetary balance and more than human paradigms. There are some books, oh, I forgot the fifth, you see the fifth fish is so recent because we only did it a month and a half ago that I for, forget to talk about it. The fifth one really had to do with dreams, dreams and imagination across species and that was when Alex uh, also spoke about uh, dreams and dreams and a sense of and uh, fish's self-perceptions and, and spiders and so on. So great pleasure to hear, uh, to hear you again. That uh, emerged in, uh, out of the General Ecology Project emerged some books that really try and ask that question. More Than Human is a reader that brings together uh, uh, writing uh, from all disciplines that relate to this, trying to seed this paradigm from an early text by, uh, uh, by the philosopher Edouard Glissant from the 90s, all the way through to a very recent text by Philippe Ramos that responded to the COVID pandemic in 2020. Microhabitable is an earlier book that we uh, worked on together with the artist Fernando Garcedori that really tries to ask the question, could microbiology and micropolitics, by the very virtue of having a kind of focus on the micro, have any skills and learnings to be able to share with one another? And so that's kind of the mashup that we did. And I, I dare say that some really interesting things came up. So to pretty much conclude, in trying to establish a distinction between the globe, a subject of history, and the planet, a subject of deep time, Dipesh Chakrabarti suggests that unlike the globe, which is a concept that is quintessentially, quintess, <laughs> quintessentially inextricable, I'm really making it easy for myself, quintessentially inextricable from human existence, the planet, with its slow creaking and devastating fits, does not return the gaze. And I cannot help but feel that working at this juncture point between the smaller and smaller puzzles that Amitav Ghosh talked about, feeling around for the weave of everything, connecting most intimately with what is largest and most inconceivable, is a way of asking ourselves this question. If the planet does not return the gaze, how do we feel loved, knowing that, yes, we are loved? So I wonder whether culture, myth making, art, narrative storytelling, um, singing, um, all kinds of ritual practices and so on, work a little bit like this. Weaving things together, weaving worlds, ecological social justice initiatives, weaving disciplines together, worlding, implying possible different ways of making sense of this planet and our role and responsibilities within it and in relation to our more than human companions. A kind of a glue or an olive oil to lubricate the kinds of interactions between those languages and those untranslatabilities, be they between disciplinary boundaries or between species boundaries. 
and a kind of water for the fish, this medium or matrix within which we are suspended and in which we change over time. I wonder whether culture, myth-making, ritual, singing, poetry, dance, also exist in the space in between things themselves. And so I added amniotic fluid because I spoke about my baby. And to really finish, this time for real, here's Ursula Le Guin. Prior to the preeminence of sticks, swords, and the hero's killing tools, our ancestors' greatest invention was the container, the basket of wild oats, the medicine bundle, the net made of your own hair, the home, the shrine, the place that contains whatever is sacred, the recipient, the holder, the story, the bag of stars. And this is our, I suppose, sense of purpose and life's business. Thank you. Do you want to do questions? I, um, we're out of time for questions. Come and talk to me. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Lucia, for such a, um, insightful perspectives and important perspectives I feel we should all try and reflect more on. <clears throat> um, we're going to take a break now, a uh, short break, just uh, 10 minutes, please. So that means back here um, at 11.41.
<clears throat> Hi, everyone. We're going to start in a, just a couple minutes, so if you can uh, begin to take your seats, that'd be great. Uh, thanks for joining us again after the break. Um, we return now for our first panel discussion of the day, which is on the topic of interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, postdisciplinarity. Moderated by Joe Walton, who's a research fellow in arts, climate, and technology at the Sussex Humanities Lab. So this has been so cool and interesting, and some of the people responsible for it being so cool and interesting are up here, which is fantastic. We do have a topic for today, which is interdisciplinarity, postdisciplinarity. pretty much any prefix you want to put at the front of disciplinarity we'll be talking about. But I also think we can be kind of flexible here. So about halfway through, I'm going to open it up to questions. And do feel free to talk about our topic, but also feel free to ask questions about the, the presentations we've, we've seen today um, so that you can have a little bit more time to do that. So the first thing I would like everybody to do is, in some cases, reintroduce or introduce themselves. Briefly, give a little bit of context of your work in terms of how it sits amongst, across, between different disciplines. Um, and I will go first. Uh, I'm Joe Walton. I work at the Sussex Humanities Lab as a researcher. And my background is in kind of arts and writing. But recently, an interest in climate has got me hanging out with various sorts of scientists. And one of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in is how, I guess, um, we might explore an entanglement of two entanglements. On, on the one hand, the entanglement of different types of human specialism, different types of um, human cognitive endeavor, whether they're formal disciplines or they are um, in, embodied local traditional knowledges. So, so that entanglement on the one hand. And then on the other hand, something that we've touched on quite a lot already today, which is uh, interspecies cognition, interspecies knowing. Um, the ways that we might kind of communicate, transfer cognition, um, transfer ways of being across very, very differently um, embodied biologies and, and very differently embodied cognitive systems. Um, so that's me, and I would... Why don't we just go down, down the line, starting with you, Lucia? Sure. I mean, I, I'm going to try and not repeat myself. Uh, there might be some newcomers, so you can repeat a little bit. <laughs> For the three people that just arrived. <laughs> so I'm uh, Lucia, I'm a curator. I work across uh, art and the environment, but because of just, um, for maybe good potentially pathological reasons, I tend to sort of have an interest in kind of everything. And so I make it my business to uh, relate to that question of art, uh, the environment, planetary uh, balance and justice. Uh, through it with with a kind of uh, methodology that um, places itself right in those kinds of uncomfortable translation gaps and uncomfortable systems sort of difference gaps between disciplines uh, between species between kind of uh, worldviews and in part one of the th reasons why I do that is because a lot of the times when we look at art and culture from the outside we think that its role in relation to the environmental catastrophe is to kind of graphic design it <laughs> like um, oh we need artists because we need something to put on the cover of the IPCC report because we need someone to make this incredibly complex 
set of data and results and, like reach people and hit people in the gut with the, you know we're really good at doing that sort of making f things that are sort of mind based making them like fleshy and embodied and and um, somehow like uh, but what but what's the follow up from that really so what i'm interested in is actually like how we can think both philosophically but also very practically about the role that the arts and cultures can play in that in in that kind of place of translation Hi, <clears throat> my name is Cecil Marie Tang. I'm an artist um, based in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I feel uh, right at home in this panel. Um, my work, uh, well, the, the core question of my work, I guess, is always um, where do we perceive our bodies to end and the environment around us to begin? Uh, which is also a kind of core idea in um, in ecology. Um, I think Gregory Bateson uh, said it at some point. Uh, but for me, it's just endlessly curious, uh, especially because I'm very interested in the kind of material entanglements between our sort of techno exuberant world and all its um, material runoff and our bodies. Uh, most recently, I've been sort of working with this term from um, environmental science uh, of the sentinel species, uh, which is a kind of uh, yeah, indicator species, uh, the kind of species that uh, scientists look at to see how are they perhaps dealing with or succumbing to pollution. And I thought that this term kind of um, pointed in many ways to what you were talking about in your um, talk about this idea of the body burden never being uh, equal, um, the, the 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 pollution and and this these unfortunate effects of our um, dependency on plastics, for instance, is is never equal. There's always some bodies that are more affected than others, whether it's within the human species or um, between species. So so I was kind of I've been curious about this. Um, the, the, the sensory aspects of this switch, when you find out that your body is porous, that it's interpermeable with the surrounding environments. Um, I think I will, I will talk a bit more about the installation that I also have, uh, that's part of um, Life Perceives, um, that is called the Sentinel Self. So it's bringing in sort of like this idea of selfhood, how can we, in a way, take on this responsibility of becoming a sentinel species rather than delegating it to the fish or to uh, the bees. And, and how will that maybe change our perception of selfhood, which was also born out of a very interdisciplinary work uh, relationship. Yeah. Um, my name is Alex Jordan. Um, <clears throat> I would describe myself as a reluctant scientist. Um, I lead a research group um, at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior. Um, and I study the animals that I do through a fascination and a love for um, uncovering and revealing um, attributes of their existence um, that I find fascinating and I think that, that we as humans find fascinating and that's not always the sort of headline stuff. It's not always that they recognize themselves in a mirror or um, that they can solve uh, some task, but, but really um, challenging this idea of, um, of the value of, of subjective experience. I'm very enamored by this uh, idea of, of uh, Umwelt, this German loan word, um, that describes the perceived sensory environment of an animal. Um, and I very much uh, struggle uh, against uh, this idea of a scala nature on which humans are at the top and, and, and then things are sorted below them. Um, I find that to be a symptom of human arrogance and, and, and egotistical uh, um, tendencies. Uh, and so I, I chafe against uh, that and, and I try to champion um, the understanding and, and, and appreciation of, of all kinds of existences. Um, and I describe myself as a reluctant scientist because in, in the sciences uh, I am not universally loved. <laughs> because uh, I find that many of the ways we approach things um, intentionally uh, build walls, um, 
we we let our insecurities manifest in in jargon and and superiority in in the way we um, interact and discuss things, um, and and that's why I um, branch out and so so eagerly um, seek collaboration and integration with um, other disciplines with with art architecture. Um, and and I, I echo uh, your point, Lucia, about um, so much of what we would call art science or science art is is just graphic design and and typically crappy graphic design. Um, I I also do graphic design. I showed you nice videos with lines and colors and and this is this is graphic design. It's a way of presenting data in a pal palatable and 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 uh, accessible way. But this is not art. Um, and I uh, have been thrilled over the years that I've been able to to actually move beyond that that requirement uh, of that sort of mercantile exchange, which I absolutely was guilty of uh, early on. I wanted my thing to be well presented to a broader audience and, 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 and really had some failures um, at that intersection of art and science. Um, but now I, I just love working um, with people outside of my discipline um, because of the perspectives and, and the bizarre, crazy conversations that, that often arise, but that so frequently um, lead to a, a different way of looking uh, at a problem that maybe we've been looking at for a long time. So I describe myself as a reluctant scientist um, who is a bit of a, a, an art science fanboy, um, but not if I can avoid it um, in the graphic design uh, realm. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Baldwin. I'm academic visitor at um, at Cambridge, uh, working with Nicola Clayton. Um, because she's not here, she we describe each, uh, each other as movement junkies. So we're completely fascinated by anything that moves. Uh, we are working on a, a big project, um, which is a cultural interaction between humans and birds, with one of the big institutions in London. So you know. Uh, running around trying to get that, you know, how manic that can be. Um, uh, I used to start the audience talks when we were doing the piece about evolution by saying, did you know we share 73% of the same genes as a cabbage? And uh, there was a, a little old lady in the front row one day and she said, oh, and a tulip. So it's, you know, it wasn't as un unknowledgeable to people as I thought. Um, I tend to stumble into projects, uh, but the science one has really stuck. I was born in the Pacific. We all know what's happening there. And, um, and of course, that uh, affects uh, some of how I think. Um, uh, Nikki advises the UN in some way. Um, and so it's always uh, at the tip of, uh, of what we do to think about um, actually, how birds are dealing with all of this, and uh, and her favourite birds are crows, um, and of course they're they're having a terrible time at the moment with people seeing them as pests and want to wipe them out, and uh, and we came up with a big project for Saudi Arabia, which <laughs> we never got there to explain it, but you know, if you don't have rubbish, you don't have crows, you know, we we shouldn't do anything at all, but don't have rubbish. Um, and so there are some simple solutions, uh, and it's really nice to work with uh, Nikki because she's quite sensible, whereas my background is art, so uh, I'm quite bonkers. <laughs> but within that bonkers, um, I always try and land on something that's even more bonkers, but somehow makes sense to other people. Um, and uh, I spent years working with dancers, and the brains fascinates me. Uh, human brain in comparison to other species as well. Nikki's thing, again, because she's not here, um, she's doing cephalopods at the moment as well. And of course, they do all sorts of incredible things. They try and move so slowly that so you don't notice. At the same time, they're changing colors to do with the way the sun's refracting in the, in, in the, in the sea so that you, also you don't notice. And um, there's a facility here on the coast and there's one in France. And also, it's, it's a wonderful image of the fact that your brain's not stuck in one place. It's spread through the body. And as you move, 
the brain's reacting in a, in a completely different way. So it's those kinds of things uh, which absolutely fascinate me, but at the moment I'm tied into this. Uh, I, I regret I made up the idea, the cultural interaction between birds and humans. So we're, I'm fixated, we are fixated on that at, at the moment. Thank you. Um, I wonder if the IPCC could create a cover that was so beautiful or so bonkers that immediately the 10,000-page report would be actioned in a kind of socially just, rapid decarbonisation. Um, yes? Then they need a, to ask a witch, not an artist. Well, Like so a spell, if it was a spell on the cover of the IPCC pad. And I, and I think perhaps we should think about what spells we, we can cast. And definitely I've in, encountered in that initial collaboration between the arts and scientists that perhaps what the scientists are looking for to begin with is, is it a kind of witch? Um, can you communicate, preferably without changing in, in any way, um, the, the normative implications of our research that, that um, needs to speak to the human heart? And um, they may be a little bit disappointed to find that I don't command a, a, an enormous audience of billions that will kind of sway according to my, my every poetic word that I drop. I'm fascinated by my cat, and I'd like to ask you all about my cat. Um, my cat seems to, is a new cat, and seems to, to follow my hands as though they were kind of birds or mice, hunting them down um, to bop her nose against and occasionally maybe give me a little nip. So I guess two kind of questions, really. Um, across all your work, feeling free to go out on a limb, I would love to know how far you have got into the phenomenology of other species. We, we can't know, of course we can't know, but what is it that you kind of suspect that you imagine? What is it like to be a cat? What, it is, what is it like to be a cephalopod? Um, what is it like to be Thomas Nagel? What is it like to be any kind of organism of your choice? And then a kind of um, a, a second question that you can pick up on if you like. Is it possible to involve the more-than-human universe in our research as participants in a participatory way so that they inform our aims and our goals and the conduct of that research and they are no longer the subjects? Perhaps they're still the subjects, but in a more participatory way. So if anyone feel free to, to jump in. Um, Nikki has a cat. <laughs> and uh, I get a daily report on what the cat's been up to. Since she's not here, uh, the cat likes pink. So if there are pink things spread out through the house, the cat collects pink things in its little corner in the kitchen. And um, the cat has stolen her husband's wedding ring and hidden it. So that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think in terms of embodiment, uh, and it's not indoctrination, I hope. I hope I'm genuinely interested. Uh, it's the birds. Uh, and, you know, Dunnocks, for instance, that take Nikki to the pub. Suddenly she's huddled in a corner telling people about false vaginas, which they have. Um, so we, I always thought it was only humans that practiced uh, birth control and uh, something called uh, cloaca pecking. And recently we've been looking at birds with gigantic feet because, you know, they live on the top of lily pads. And so they have these enormous feet, and the way they move it, it is amazing. And there's also another bird called the cock of the rock. Um, and it's bright orange, but when it, uh, when it hides, because bright orange attracts predators and you don't want to be lunch, it blends in with the ultraviolet on the um, forest floor, so, so you can't see it. And it has this incredible dance. And it turns its back to a female bird, it's like, Get over here. <laughs> and, uh, and so those mating rituals, I mentioned before, they, they, the ones on the floor in New Guinea, and it takes them eight years to learn their dance so that the females, because it's female choice in nature, uh, will be interested in them. You know, and it's, it's the plumage, it's the steps, it's the movement, it's the stance, it's the call. So um, I think we had something to learn from them in terms of uh, how our brains cognate and how their brains cognate. Because actually eight years, if you do the Royal Academy of Dancing, it's also eight years. Anyway, 
strange connection, sorry. I love the idea of witches, and you know, I'm into that, I think. I asked Nikki whether she was spiritual, and she said, I learn yoga, so yeah, that's it. Um, the polit political philosopher Michael Marder, who works a lot on plant, plants, um, has a beautiful text about language in a book called The Language of Plants, in which he advocates for the importance of the space, of making space for the untranslatable. So to a certain extent, and that's because you know, if you work in my kinds of fields, it's enough to make some kind of like poetic dream-like statement around something. To a certain extent, I think that it's less the kind of adaptation of a particular umwelt or sense of self to a kind of human intelligible paradigm that we should be striving towards, but more ways of being. We know full well that we can coexist with, co-create with, have care and responsibility towards, have a sense of obligation towards, things, people, beings, more than human beings, human beings, that we don't fully um, <laughs> understand. Um, but I, I think one thing that tickles me about your question is, uh, is what I often do, which is a kind of strong apology for, um, I suppose, like, Poetic, strategic anthropomorphism as opposed to anthropocentrism. So a lot of scientists, probably not you, <laughs> but not Nikki, <laughs> not, I hope, a lot of you, but a lot of scientists will really retract at the notion of making any form of statements that might be perceived to be anthropomorphic about anything, a plant, a fish. What I, however, uh, there's an intuition that comes w uh, that that has something to do with something like this, which is, what if instead of uh, making the mistake of uh, let's say associating a not more than human being with human behavior and therefore making an error in that judgment, what if anthropomorphism could actually be a form of humility? That is to say, a way of acknowledging that what we perceive to be, whatever it is, humor, love, generosity grief, um, we only recognize it when it looks like the one that we experience. But instead, it is possible that all the categories of thought, all the kind of, um, um, how do you say, properties and emergences, that, uh, properties of human experience and of human life are actually emergences from and exist completely enmeshed within a larger love, a larger hu uh, humor, a larger sense, of, which takes its shapes different ways. The easiest way of understanding that is that God is absolutely not an old white man with a beard. The reason why that's one of the images that comes up in the West is because Michelang Michelangelo was an old white man with a beard. And so that's, or may, may not have had a beard, but whatever the point is that we shape the world in the shape in which we believe it to be. And then we experience it as though that were th the truth or the real rather. And to kind of dislodge that, I think, is, is, is a really important thing. There was something really tickling about your, the second part of your question, and now I'm... What was the second part of your question? Pa um, pa participation. So, these... Uh, <laughs> do, the, do, the, do the mealworms understand the magic tricks? Oh, participation. Yeah. Uh, the, so, the, this is... Um, this is uh, uh, like f a note for the future, which is to say, uh, uh, it's another feeling that is uh, more than human beings exist in human design systems, be they the economy, uh, uh, the tra uh, sort of global travel and transport, uh, finance and so on, the, the law. They exist, but they exist in the wrong way. So one of the things that we could do is start to look, rather than try and translate plant, uh, in human terms or, or making it fit human systems is really to live with plant or to live with the behavior of fish or the dreams of spiders and so on and, and actually relook at our human design system and redesign those systems to make better space for... I, I don't know what that means in practice. You need to ask a lawyer. You know, it, it needs everyone. <laughs> I'd like to follow up on this point of more than human existence and, and perhaps the commonalities um, by sharing 
an anecdote, as it were. Um, one of the things we're interested in with some of the, the approaches we take is um, how convincing does, a, a, in our case, a digital model need to be for a fish to accept it as a social partner? What are the attributes of a social partner that, that cue you in and convince you? Um, and what we find is that we can reduce the, the visual realism of these models down to spheres or, 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 um, or um, other, other polygons. But as long as they obey the same behavioral and kinematic rules as a real fish in this case, then they become convincing. Then these fish will, will treat them and interact with them as if they are another fish. And I think that you might be thinking to yourself, ha, silly fish. But if you think about the way we interact with the world, we layer upon this, I think, a lot of processes that we consider to be higher processes by which we're interacting with the world. But in fact, probably the underlying mechanisms are similar in that there's a very reduced um, set of rules and ways that we're interacting with the world um, that, that convince us of our reality. Uh, I'd like to sort of make us think of this idea of the uncanny valley. Um, when you're, if you've ever experienced a, a, a virtual reality kind of uh, environment, um, things can be very convincing and, and you're very comfortable, but if they start to violate any particular um, movement patterns or, or visual um, information, then you start to become very afraid of this thing. Um, these sort of uh, monsters in, in this current um, TV show uh, that's, an, that's an AI robot but it looks very much like a little girl. These kind of things that are close enough but, but not um, perfect are, are terrifying for us. And uh, I think that is actually something that we might want to consider, that when we are talking about the, the subjective experience of a plant or, or uh, a fish or, or a spider, we should be honest with ourselves about how we are also interacting with the world and whether it's at some different plane of uh, interaction and existence or we're actually all vibrating on the same plane and we've just sort of tried to pull our heads above everything else because Michelangelo painted us uh, on the roofs. So. You say that, it's a tiny thing. It, you, as soon as you say the fish can recognize a polygon moving in the same, I, the first thought that comes to mind, another way of looking at it is like, well, metaphor then exists at f in the fish world as well. Uh, I've, um, I also work with uh, someone called Ram Shogul, and uh, he has been developing, he's a fashion photographer, but he's been developing something called post bodying. And actually, it's when we have wrecked everything, the atmosphere, and actually our clothes and our body shape will change. Uh, animals will change, birds will change, because the, we won't be able to breathe the same atmosphere and, uh, and we'll have to wear uh, something to regulate our atmosphere. Um, and it's really interesting uh, and it's super convincing that actually uh, uh, you know, the ways we think now uh, will have to radically change because our environment has shifted, um, you know, uh, you, you, Evolution uh, has taught us that, it, 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 you know, um, when species die out, that's part of evolution. But actually, this post-bodying thing is, uh, is just quite amazing. He's had a huge interest in it from NASA and from people who are projecting uh, things in the future because the issues that are we thinking about now are completely different, uh, you know, and in fact, he's been working with some designers and the and the clothes you have to wear to regulate what you can even eat because you know we won't be able to do it like we are I mean part of what you're wearing grows what you eat and drink and um, and you know big things to regulate the acidity and of course I'm thinking well birds will have to modify themselves couldn't help it must be <laughs> Nikki's influence and in fact their feathers will be another way of filtering the air so uh, they might survive so it's, it's I just wanted to say that <laughs> can I just make a very very quick point on that um, which is that one of the joys I find of my practice as, a, as an underwater biologist is the surrendering 
of my senses and the surrendering of my um, movement and kinematic capacities. It, it's a very humbling experience to put on all of this equipment just to survive and then go down and, and be with the fish and you, you really realize um, our superiority is very context dependent. Actually, that um, reminds me a little bit of why I often love to work with scientists because I'm very, conf uh, I'm very curious about how they use their senses um, in surprising ways that I don't think about. Because sometimes I might have a bit of preconception that they just sit there and stare at numbers or whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so when I when I have these encounters, um, for instance, uh, a recent project of mine is about um, bog bodies. So bodies that have been found in the bog and and um, I was very fascinated um, to speak with a, a Danish archaeologist where she she not only used um, forensic uh, data collection methods but also her own kind of sensory experiences of being in the landscape and and engaging with the bog and sort of imagining what this community thousands of years ago might have gone through in order to sacrifice other humans to the bog what might the bog mean um, and 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 these kind of Questions. I, I think when I know and I find the right collaborator when they share those those stories with me. Um, another uh, collaboration I have is with an immunologist and an ecotoxicologist who have been working together for a few years to see how microplastics might be interacting with our immune cells, and and. In there, I had a uh, in this collaboration, I had a really beautiful experience. Actually, uh, in the beginning of the COVID lockdown, where um, I was allowed to uh, use the lab and grow some of my own immune cells, and it was this very strange. And it might sound a bit self-indulgent, but actually, it became profoundly kind of non-human in a sense because I had to go through this taking blood. I'm very scared of taking blood, so. After a few fainting fits, I got this blood out, and then we 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 went back uh, several weeks in a row to sort of care for these cells. And it's a lot of I realized a lot of sort of like squishing liquids in and out, and has to be in the right temperature and uh, incubating in this like little womb thing. And then finally, uh, my cells were ready, and then I, I got to look at them in the in the in this fantastic microscope. And it was just the strangest sort of out-of-body experience of seeing these little, these little creatures, critters that that went on doing what they sort of have evolved to do over millennia, sort of like completely outside of my body. So I was sort of, and 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 the the experiment was then to put some microplastics in and see what they did. And I was sort of rooting for them a little bit, trying to sort of do something with this plastic, but of course they can't because they don't have the enzymes to deal with the microplastics the same way they have with pathogens. And it really started this interest in, 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 in also metaphors to sort of think about, well, the, there are a lot of metaphors of war around immunology and our, our cells. We see ourselves as these kind of like battalion that are fighting non-self. And, and I learned through these collaborations with the with the immunologists that, that that's actually no longer that that was sort of how immunologists would see the immune system in the 20th century as this kind of battle between our body and the world and I think it's very telling that in the 21st century that that division has had to be reconsidered and and we're our immune systems are dependent on the non-self of, of our, of, of our uh, communal microbes. But I was also thinking somehow that, that I felt like my cells were some sort of like other species in some sense uh, that, that helped me break down a little bit this, this uh, 20th century remains idea I had of, of, of selfhood. So. Um, I'm tempted to ask about our, our cells as, as other species or other entities, um, about Alex's kind of suiting up in the fish battle mech and how that might relate to Cecil's earlier work um, hacking these fantastic steampunk sensory extensions and systematic derangements of the sensory world, the uh, strategic 
poetic anthropomorphism and how that might relate to um, the, the little fishy guys, kitchlids, and their, their meekness or, or, or dominance, um, the embodied cognition of, of, of dance and what it means to be a movement junkie and whether we should take that kind of um, addiction metaphor seriously. I'm not going to. I'm going to ask you to ask some questions. I think we've got probably about 20 minutes. And um, so this is, the, this is the only hand that is visible from where I sit. So definitely you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks very much to everyone for some really fascinating discussions. I think I have a question that's maybe initially for Alex and then possibly the entire panel, but I'm really curious about what you mentioned at the beginning of this panel about how you have this kind of dis interdisciplinary chafing, um, your fascination with Umwelt theory um, and how that might introduce some kind of problematics into contemporary scientific methods. So I'm thinking um, more in the sense of Umwelt theory would open up the capacity for a multitude of senses beyond, beyond the human, you know, um, touch, smell, taste. But a lot of the work you were presenting was, was quite, to me, quite oculocentric. Um, a lot of the, the terms you were using, like representation, beauty, preference, to me, these aren't unsettled concepts. You know, these aesthetic concepts aren't settled, um, and a lot of it was, was based on vision. And I'm just wondering about, you know, this, this idea of chafing, that when you introduce the idea of Umwelt theory, this idea of a kind of multitude or this unfurling of senses that we might not have a capacity to understand, what sort of problematics does that introduce to the conclusions that you know your particular field requires of you to have a an experiment and a conclusion and a clear finding um, do you find that in your being a reluctant scientist you find that the necessity to have these experiments based on vision um, obviously no other senses come into and come into play but do you find that frustrates um, some of the findings or that you wish that there was like a more kind of capacious environment in which to consider these ideas? I do wish that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, as much as I <laughs> laugh about the idea that a scientist spends their time just looking at numbers, um, that is unfortunately the currency in, in which we, we deal. Um, and so the um, the newfound ability to take uh, video data and convert it into numerical metrics that describe behavior, movement, shape, um, has been a revelation because whereas in, in my PhD uh, I was underwater in the middle of this lake in Zambia for four months watching these fish and, and writing down numbers. Um, now we can put a GoPro down and collect those, that same data in 20 minutes. It's, it's quite a, it's a strange feeling to know how obsolete you are. Um, and, and so there's this sort of, this push of course culturally in, in, in the sciences to become more rigorous, to become uh, big data, to become objective. Um, and, and I won't stand here and pretend that I'm not uh, swayed by the sort of economic realisms of, of science. I am a successful scientist because I jumped on that bandwagon, because that bandwagon allowed me to look at 20 individuals interacting all at once um, and, and put that into a framework that is convincing to my colleagues. And that very much canalizes even the way we think about the questions that we're interested in. It means that the, 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 the culture in my lab group um, is about what can we measure that we can represent in some of the sort of graphics that I showed you. And already 
you are getting from what was an incredibly niche field into a very, very niche part of that niche field. Um, and, and if I come out to a conference and I say, well, you know, what I'm really interested in is um, the sort of seismic world of these animals and, and, and I really think that's important. We have no way of um, measuring that but I have a really strong intuition from being down there with them. They would have started laughing already and they would have continued laughing me out the door. Um, whereas I was just in Tanganyika with a, a, a wonderful uh, artist and friend of mine now, Tabita Rezer, and she laid us down on the edge of, of the water and asked us to, to give ourselves over to the, to the full experience of that place. Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm very much a reluctant scientist because in the pure science realm, I'm canalized and, and constrained in even the ways I can think and, and imagine. And on the other side, the imagination is allowed to run free. Um, and, and this is an important concept in, in my life is finding a third space between those two things. I'm not an artist. I, I would never pretend to be, but I am creative. Um, I, I strive to be a creative scientist and I strive to find creativity and, and, and new ideas in a third space that's neither of the two. Um, and my scientific colleagues, at least the ones I like, are very supportive of that. And the other ones are just stupid, so that's fine. I, 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 I want to jump in before uh, anybody else responds to that. I think to try and fit in some more questions, let's experiment. Who, who has potentially a question? Um, yeah, there are a few. So could, could we maybe take, say, two more questions, and then the panel can pick and choose. Um, so there was one over here. Um, I also wonder, is it possible to convey questions from online? Maybe there's somebody in the room that knows how to do that, but yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so just a quick introduction. I've come here today uh, on, you know, on my, with two hats on. One, as in, I'm just interested, and the other one is, for my sins, I am Brighton and Hove City Council's biodiversity officer. Wow, we've got one, just one, <laughs> that's me. So, I'm, you know, all of these things that we're talking about really, I'm really interested in, because I think that's how, as a city, we obviously have a really, really urban ecology, and how do we really appreciate that, and how do we get that message out to the communities? And also, like, you know, language is a major thing, but also art and, and how do we diversify who feeds in and who really appreciates and protects and conserves and, you know, all these new uh, really fancy words coming out of government that we can just restore nature like this and blah, blah, blah by 2030 and all of that. So it's looking at it from different perspectives, which I'm really interested in. Um, I was going to talk to Mark about starlings, but I will talk about that after it's... Uh, uh, so we've got lots of lovely projects going on, and it's just about trying to, like, obviously tap into your knowledge. So it's not really a question, it was just more like a sort of statement. But, um, yeah, just all of the witchcraft and the, I think, monocultured. I really struggle with monoculture and putting things in boxes, and that's what I really feel like we do. <laughs> and as a council, we really do. And, you know, we are the living coast. We're an urban biosphere which we really need to tap into so yeah sorry it was just a more just loving this the the general chat and uh, I want to talk to all of you separately awesome Thanks. thank you I think sometimes um, a comment not a question gets bad rep comments are great uh, short comments always imply questions so feel free to comment as well and there were some people towards the back maybe who who's got a, a there were loads of you just now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, oh, I'm not at the back. I'm at the side. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a bit of a comment, and it might be a question. Um, I was thinking of disciplines which are not sort of uh, like professional disciplines. So thinking of breathing, for example, is a discipline. And I think it was Mark who mentioned something about spiritual, like some 
maybe your colleague saying, I do yoga. But like, for example, yoga is not something that is spiritual in the sort of inverted commas kind of spiritual, but it's about spirit, which is breathing with others. So, you know, even yoga is like taking examples of the movements of animals, like the crow being one of them, and the cat being another one of them. So, you know, maybe I'm thinking of what kind of disciplines are really at a, at a living level, you know, things that can be done every single day. And if, you know, breathing is a kind of discipline, walking, moving is a kind of discipline. And I was just thinking of, for example, in Dune, the Fremen have a particular way of walking, you know. So maybe this is also like transforming these kind of everyday disciplines is also an interdisciplinarity that can be a discipline which is shared with the non-human that also move, that also breathe, but don't go to universities. So that's a comment and question, maybe. Wonderful, thank you. Does anyone on the panel have responses to any of the three utterances that we've had from the audience? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I shouldn't mention Nikki all the time, but I'm going to, because we spend a lot of time talking about memory. Um, and the thing about memory is every time you remember something, you change it. And that's what makes humans creative. Uh, and she knows that the crows use uh, nostalgia and plan for the future because of the experiments. And the reason we started working together is because I'm trying to work out what to do with dancers. Uh, when it comes to the creativity and art section, th this is just me. Um, I love the idea of nothing. And, uh, you know, I know that lying down when you're really worried about something and you know, actually it's during that time when you start to think of things, you know, that could be creative. So I think that the, the, the discipline for me is to every day be creative somehow and to, and to uh, engage with my brain. I mean, Nikki, because she's a neuroscientist, uh, has, has a brain on her uh, phone and she shakes it. And then, you know, when all the bits disappear and come back together, she oh, yeah, well, that's where this happens. And, and it's in the frontal cortex or it's a, in your amygdala. So, um, yeah, it's creativity. I, I think that um, to be creative, you don't have to have an outcome. You know, it's just you know what, what you do. Um, and actually, uh, in the, the subject of nothing is quite difficult. And I know a lot of artists work with nothing, and, and I find it quite difficult. You know, I like a bit of color, and um, I love things in black and white. But in, anyway, I'm saying nothing, and maybe that's art. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, quickly pick up on it. That felt like a question, and I'm really glad that, that you posed it, because I think one of the things that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that that, that mandate to sort of um, spread the message of biodiversity and invite communities into sort of caring about nature and all of that is actually, it's, it's also a really tricky mandate, because you're also trying to tell many, like many communities who have like really, really important and pressing issues in front of them to uh, to sort of, it's sort of it's it's one of those things that feels some that might feel sometimes like a top-down mandate and does so all the more when conservative governments are at play because it's you know it's on paper and we don't you know and it justifies us cutting funding from other forms of social services and that's but I think that's really interesting so to a certain extent what I found really uh, important in the last kind of few months has been to learn from colleagues and peers and collaborators to recognize the historical chafing and tensions between things like ecology, biodiversity, conservation movements, and things like social justice movements. In moments, it, and in, at times, if you look at the recent scandals that uh, happened with the WWF and human rights abuses, at times those things literally come uh, in one another. There's a really interesting story about Chagos and marine protected area that would take 10 minutes to tell. But essentially, the, uh, the, the history of those movements has not only been um, there has been sort of tensions and at times outright contradiction between them. And so it's quite interesting to start to to start from a position of like, well, in what ways could they actually collaborate? And so I worked with a group of students at the RCA. Um, it was architecture students. But we started to think about, um, uh, I suppose, more than human um, comrades and how they could participate in social justice efforts thus and and how those two th and social justice efforts participating in biodiversity efforts 
Um, with regards to the, um, gent uh, I suppose, the, the displacement of people and gentrification and rebuilding of certain parts of around the King's Cross Canal. And one of the things that we found, I mean, the project, we didn't have enough time to develop the project as far as we would have wanted to. But one of the things that we found was we really, what we were looking for was species of rare moss growing in play. We now collaborate because we, the fragmented nature of emancipatory sort of attempts these days is so... You know, meanwhile, so long as you're against abortion, you all vote for like someone who's vastly different in their interests and in their, you know, uh, uh, then, th so it's a kind of, I just feel like the right is winning at gathering people, uh, like w with way greater ease. And I think that it is our, not, you know, we don't all have to subscribe to being in the left, but just if we're caring about like virtues and principles around ethics and love and care and mutual responsibility and all of those things for planet, people or both, then I think we have a responsibility to turn those worlds kind of towards each other with a spirit of, well, how can we then work together? So all of that emerged, so that's why it felt like a question because it sort of emerged from thinking about that kind of mandate in the city. So I'd be really interested in hearing about this. Um, that, that is really, really well articulated. I am a sucker for finishing on time. We have about <laughs> two minutes. Does anybody want to say things of chunks of about 30 seconds? 300 million years ago, we shared a common ancestor <laughs> with birds, which is why we can mimic and they can mimic, you know, whereas a primate can only say mama and cup. I don't know. <laughs> I'm curious, Joe, if I might ask you a question. Can, yes, and then we can run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've just had, had quite some enjoyment uh, working on science fiction projects with scientists, and I know that you're a great lover of science fiction. So do you want to talk about science fiction as a kind of interdisciplinary practice? I can, I can do two quick shout-outs, and one is... Vector magazine from the British Science Fiction Association, which has a uh, wonderful interview with you, um, but is also coming out in April with a special issue that's focused specifically on kind of applied science fiction. Um, and that's something I'm involved with. Something I'm not involved with, but that is also worth shouting out, is the, the Creatures Project, uh, Creative Practices for Transformational Futures, which I think speaks in a lot of interesting ways in terms of developing guidance for assessing um, science fiction, but also other kinds of arts-led creative practice as um, interventions, assessing it in ways that is kind of not reductive, that preserves that exploratory, imaginative, and, oh, we're out of time. Thank you so much, <laughs> my brilliant panel. Well done.
Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. So, uh, welcome back for the afternoon session of our Life Perceives event. Uh, I'm George Cafegis, another doctoral uh, researcher here in Sussex studying sharks and vision and how they see the world. Uh, and the reason, even though I'm one of the co-organizers, you haven't seen me around is because I've been hiding, literally, up in the control room, where with some colleagues, wonderful colleagues of ours, we are ensuring that everything that happens in here is broadcasted out there for people who couldn't be in Brighton. So from hiding place to center stage, uh, stress definitely, it's the first uh, event that I'm chairing, um, and I'm particularly excited about it uh, because of what each and every speaker, contributor, is bringing to the table. So within the next hours, we will have the chance to uh, travel across the life spectrum and encounter different life forms, from uh, cuttlefish and their admirable uh, camouflage to plant neurobiology, uh, fungal brains, and down to cells and how they talk to each other through bioelectricity or molecular signatures and orchestrate their decisions. So our first uh, speaker is uh, Professor Daniel Osorio. Uh, and uh, Daniel's story is a story of color, uh, from studying the signals of different visual environments to how the animals see them, how their vision adapts and evolves over time. And throughout his academic time, he has studied a plethora of organisms, including and probably not limited to uh, butterflies, birds, primates, and cuttlefish, cephalopods. Um, Sussex is very happy to have Daniel here. He has been here since 1992, and he's uh, the director of the EB Department, Evolution, Behavior, and Environment. And today he will be talking about cuttlefish, and he's a true representative of the diversity of research that happens in the life sciences. So without any further ado, Daniel. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. I can't see anything, so I can't look you in the eye. And um, I'd like to thank Lucia very much for her talk this morning. You know, she was unable to show a picture of these wonderful display courts produced by um, Japanese puffer fish. You can eat them afterwards and get a tetrodotoxin hit, but um, they produce these amazing, perfectly circular, um, regular spoked arrays. And if there's any sort of argument that there isn't some sense of aesthetics in um, non-human animals, I think this is a pretty good answer to it. So thank you very much for your, for your talk. And this links a bit to my talk, which is about the connection between perception and action. These are sometimes seen as distinct, particularly in the human literature, but really, especially from the point of view of animal behaviour, this is a false and somewhat mis misleading distinction. So what I'm going to be talking about is, of course, cuttlefish, these uh, cephalopods which live off the end of Brighton Pier and around um, northwest Europe, and the Mediterranean, and you can see on their skin here these multiple dark spots which are called chromatophores, and they have a very complex multi-layered structure of three chromatophores and then other controllable materials beneath them in their, in their skin. And crucially, each of these chromatophores is under direct motor neuronal control, essentially independent motor neuronal control from the, from the brain. So we have, if you like, a highly controllable behaviour that we're going to return to at the end of this talk expressed directly on the skin. And from my point of view as a vision scientist, what appealed to me about these, sorry, about these animals was the fact that they can do so much with this behaviour. This movie doesn't seem to work here, which is slightly annoying. Is there any... Forget about it. Anyway, what you, can see, what you would be, have been able to see here is that the cuttlefish attacks the crab next to it and dramatically changes its appearance very rapidly, as many such movies on, on the web. 
from my point of view, as a vision scientist, it's the versatility of these animals, the ability to change their appearance according to the background upon which they're resting, primarily for camouflage, that give one, one direct access to spatial vision, the way in which they're seeing pattern, they're completely colorblind, so color isn't involved, in order essentially to match the background, and they've evolved this behavior under selection from the vision of fish. They evolved from relatively defended mollusks, such as nautilus and so on. They've given up these defenses in exchange for um, physical defenses in exchange for coloration patterns. Can everybody see the two cuttlefish in the middle of the image there? So let's just take a quick step back. We've um, been hearing bad things about, about numbers and measurement in the early part of the meeting, but I think they're really important for actually taking objective views of stimuli and thinking about what there is out there in the world for the umwelts of other organisms to experience aside from our own human perception. So we have here a problem of how could we define, specify the visual characteristics of these moths, they all come from the same genus, so they're relatively closely related, quite common moths, and they have presumably evolved under natural selection by predators on birds in this, in this case. So they have effectively camouflaged on different types of subsets, substrates, perhaps uh, the tree barks that you can see on, on the left there, in which they rest during the day. And I'm talking about active behavioural responses um, in cuttlefish, but this can also be thought of as a problem in developmental biology because we can imagine that it would at least be beneficial for evolution, for natural selection, to come up with a control system for wing patterns that allowed them to respond efficiently to the range and the nature of variation that we find in, say, the tree barks. And so we can imagine um, that there could be just a few genetic changes to go from a moth called the common Quaker to one called the Hebrew character, um, which allows these two species to occupy different niches. The, the, the common English names of moths are marvellous, marvellously picturesque, composed poetry just by putting them in sequence. Anyway, so this problem was, I think, addressed very clearly about 40 or 50 years ago um, by, by Bella Younes, who was a physicist and psychophysicist physicist, who was really interested in camouflage. He's best known for his work on random stop dot stereograms. And so he thought, looking at moths and so on, that there must be some sort of simple, low-dimensional account that could be produced of spatial patterns, which he, he analogized to our three-dimensional models of, of colour sp space, because we have red, green, and blue cone photoreceptors in our eyes. He imagined that there could be essentially three or some roughly similar low number of spatial channels. And he also originated many of the ideas that we now um, refer to as image, image statistics. So he's interested in describing mathematically the characteristics of different spatial patterns. And he came up what, with what was called texton theory, and he hoped to discover the sort of basis set of spatial representations represented by these textons um, that applied to human vision. And he was, in fact, unsuccessful. And so the point I want to 
make here is that this is a hard problem from the point of view of vision science. We do not have a simple low parameter model that allows us to specify in a way that so would, interest, um, would satisfy someone interested in producing computer graphics, for example, the differences between these tree barks from the point of view of human vision. And so from the point of view of vision science, understanding how camouflage works and how it evolves under natural selection, or in the case of cuttlefish, how they choose their coloration patterns is not straightforward at all. And just before we get back to cuttlefish, I will refer briefly to an experiment I did on another species that lives off the end of Brighton Pier, the common place fish, as in place and chips. And they're also very good at camouflaging themselves. They live all very similar kind of habitat. And they can produce a very wide range of patterns, but by mixing a basis set of just two patterns, one of which is sort of blotchy and smooth, and the other is more punctate spots. And they can flexibly combine these two dimensions of variation to match effectively a range of background, the range of backgrounds on which they encounter. So now let's turn to cuttlefish camouflage. So as you probably know already, uh, cephalopods, octopus, squid, and cuttlefish can produce a huge range of coloration patterns. They do this for communication and, of course, primarily, as I've said, for camouflage. And here we have a sort of diverse, somewhat frivolous um, examples named by, by Christopher Tyler and <clears throat> from work I'm going to refer to a little later. And I've mentioned the chromatophores. The chromatophore expression is normally coordinated centrally in the brain um, into 35 main components. So there's essentially 35 degrees of freedom in what these animals do can do to produce the range of coloration patterns that they actually use. That contrasts with the two degrees of freedom we just saw in the case of place. So we have about 35 components, and they're all fairly straightforwardly identifiable, which is very helpful for us. We don't have to use machine learning or anything of that kind to pick them out in the images. You can just get somebody to score them and their level of expressions fairly easily. So some of them are light, and some of them are dark. And you'll see these cropping up in the images I'm going to show as I go on. So, of course, we can see that in principle, they can produce some silly astronomical number of coloration patterns. And from what I've just been seeing, it really is quite interesting to try and understand how they use the behave, this, this behavioural potential and how they coordinate their expression to match natural backgrounds. And, of course, we must assume that as this has evolved under natural selection, there's some sort of principle of efficiency here, so the fact they have two to the 35 possible patterns means that they might actually need to use them. And... I don't want to go into any detail here, but if we look at the correlation of expression of these different pattern components, then it's fairly clear, we can't absolutely prove that they can produce every possible pattern, but they seem to be able to express them independently of one another. So they are under fully independent control. There's no fixed sets of combinations that they, they need to use. So I'd now like to turn to the type of experiments we do, describe two sets of experiments, and then come to some overall synthesis at the end. So essentially, 
what we do, and other groups working on these animals do, is to put, the anim put them on various artificial backgrounds with controlled visual properties. So here we can see um, an image from an experiment where we were looking at the animal's ability to perceive shape from shading, actually. But we can film them and we can score the expression of these components. And one of the th things that we discovered fairly on, early on, roughly um, 15 years ago now, was that they're very sensitive to whether the background seems to be composed of a continue, made of a continuous pattern surface, you know, such as gravel, fine gravel, or maybe weedy kind of rock, or is made of discrete objects such as larger pebbles. So they have powerful mechanisms that very similar to ones that we seem to use in Gestalt psychology tells us we use for organising images into discrete objects. So we can see that the animal on the right here is doing something different from the two on the left because it's seeing those checkerboards as discrete objects and with various work analysing how they identify edges, which is a classic problem in computer vision, and so on. And then one can, for example, show that just as we see figures in these sort of Knitzer triangles and so on, the cuttlefish is doing something very similar and perceiving these type of figures as objects rather than isolated bits, bits of pattern. So essentially that's saying they have similar low-level edge and object uh, perceptual mechanisms to us. And uh, <coughs> they also seem to use their patterns in a quite a categorical way. So we have what's called categorical perception in colour. For instance, we classify colours rather robustly as red, yellow or green rather than seeing the, um, the spectrum as a continuum under many circumstances. I did some experiments that were published with Alia el Nagar and others where she looked at their ability, the cuttlefish's ability to distinguish 3D objects, small pieces of plasticine from 2D patterns that were very otherwise very similar visually, at least when seen from above with different types of shading and so on. And by producing a range of patterns, what one finds is that actually, despite quite considerable variation in the backgrounds, they seem to respond in very categorical, distinct ways between these 2D and 3D classes of background. So they're clearly not just physically matching the 2D background on which they're, sit they're sitting. So, in fact, there's quite a lot of literature to suggest that they express four main kinds of body patterns. They categorise the background into four main types, which are illustrated here. Um, so that leads to a model for pattern control which implies that the cuttlefish are perhaps detecting low-level features in an image and then using that to, if you like, cognitively produce some kind of categorical representation of the background of the scene in which they're sitting and then produce a body pattern accordingly. So just, I have to go rather, rather quickly now, we then did experiments to challenge this idea, which was suggested actually by Christopher Tyler. And what he did was, from our point of view, rather naive. He said, let's just put the animals on backgrounds that as closely as possible match it, matched individual pattern components. So they have black spot components, speckle components, so let's put them on a speckly background, a large white square, so let's put them on white squares, stripes, and so on. So 
We did that for various kinds of backgrounds, and these are the images that we took, and they were then scored, and we then actually recorded patterns, components that were sufficiently significantly upregulated on these very uh, simple backgrounds compared to the pack, back of those on a uniform background. And what we found was that in every case except E there, um, they tend to express relatively few components and, yeah, and they do, on the whole, more or less match the backgrounds. So the exception is E, which produce, where they express 11 different components that produce what's called the disruptive body pattern, the one they typically use on the pebbly background. And this is what this shows here as well. So what this led us to was the idea that essentially they have a two-level control system. They first of all are doing something like low-level feature matching, and they may also have a higher level, if you like, more cognitive system for classifying the scene and producing these overall body patterns. And so that's what the experimental evidence was sort of telling us. And it turned out that this behaviour, I've just got one, one minute to go, um, very nicely matches work done by Gilles Rand, Sam Reiter, and their colleagues in Frankfurt, who cut out the first half of this system and just looked at the spontaneous activity of about 17,000 chromatophores and correlations in chromatophore um, activity. And this led them to a hierarchical model of pattern control. So there's a motor system which is organized hierarchically with um, gross body pattern organization, a pattern component level of organization, and then even subcomponent levels of organization like this. So we have a hierarchical motor system, and we can see perhaps then how this might fit into our model of the visual behavior, where we have a scene classification mechanism feeding into a high level of the motor control pathway and then feature matching fitting in lower down. So this, I can't, don't have time now to go through that, but this reminded me very much of ideas of more traditional motor control where we have animals sometimes producing stereotyped movements, gates, for example, as we can see on the right here, and also the ability to finely tune responses according to much more specific sensory inputs. And with that, I will thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this very interesting talk. Uh, in the interest of time, we will only take one short question, if there is one. There is a hand there. Someone can pass a microphone, please. You just need to turn it on. Oh. Hello there. Uh, Hello. Thank, thanks very much, Daniel, for a very interesting talk. Um, there's just one observation I'd like to make, and that is, um, are you not assuming that uh, the visual systems of the other predators of the cuttlefish are the same as the human visual system by which you are making your analyses? No, I, I'm not assuming that because I'm just measuring what the cuttlefish are doing and that we could analyse the spatial characteristics of, the, of these uh, patterns and see if there's any difference between what you know, seems to be coming out from that modelling and what we see as humans. However, having said that, you know, all the evidence from the beauty of camouflage um, is that, at least if we're thinking about spatial vision rather than colour, 
the vision of fish and birds and so on is remarkably similar to that of to our own, and that's presumably because it's been driven by the same sort of general constraints of seeing a world made of discrete objects with particular types of lighting and physical properties and so on. In which these other predators have developed um, leave open the possibility that their visual systems will have developed according to their settings? I'm sure they have. And clearly, there's, there's important differences. Many of these animals can see polarisation, for example, which we're, we're bl blind to. But it's really hard, you know, having worked in this field for more than 30 years now, to point to some clear difference in spatial vision, how we see low-level features or edges and objects and so on that actually seems to differ between um, ourselves and other animals. And this is one of the questions that got me into this subject because at the time, and maybe still now, there were ideas that the way in which we see objects and make sense of the world is heavily dependent on, you know, the kind of processing that we can do in our cerebral cortex, which many of these animals have, or to a much lesser degree, don't have. Thank Let's thank Daniel once again. And our next speaker was, um, like, we were very excited to have him in person, but unfortunately, over the last couple of days, this was rendered uh, impossible. So he's uh, Zoom calling from Murcia in Spain. Uh, he's Professor Paco uh, Calvo, Professor of Philosophy of Science and Group Leader of the Minimal Intelligence Lab there. Uh, he's working at the intersection of plant uh, neurobiology and ecological psychology, and with the support of the US Office of uh, Naval Research, uh, he's trying to uh, study uh, plant adaptive behavior, uh, their intelligence, and how this can inform or inspire uh, biomimetic uh, robots. Uh, his um, recent book, The Impressive Planta, uh, Planta Sapiens, I'm sorry, uh, is part of today's title, Planta Sapiens, Homo Stupidus. And uh, without any further remarks from me, Paco, please uh, take it away. Uh, hi, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so can, can you hear me? Yes, crystal clear. Can you? Okay, great, great. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, well, first, let me say something which is like I really envy you. Uh, it's a shame not to be able to be there in person, I mean, with you all guys hanging out and, and, and in such a, well, uh, let me say, in such a transdisciplinary spirit because, you know, we are far too used to this talk of, of uh, multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, but I think what we are having here is something that goes well beyond, beyond the capacity of putting a set of tools together, right? So we are kind of trying to to raise and answer questions in a whole different way, which has to do with the combination of all these methodologies and toolkits. So in that sense, I really think we are pretty much um, on the same page. I went through, I went through, you know, like I, looking at the contributors and everything like, uh, you know, moving from the arts and media and film and, and of course, computer science and and robotics and uh, you know there is when I go through the whole set of speakers and and interest range of interest I really I really think uh, um, it's it's really a shame not to be able to hang out together and spend more time together right but anyway just to give you a brief a brief overview of what is it that we are up to here at the minimal intelligence lab. Um, um, well, uh, certainly uh, one of the things we 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 try to do is let me hold on let me just okay yeah now you can see the full screen right um well first one thing is that uh, it's it's a good sign that that we uh, consider that plants are as the same as with the rest of a species in the animal kingdom i mean in, so from other kingdoms in the tree of life that we can truly speak of perceptions so these perceptions across the spectrum of life in the title of your of your meeting it really I really something I really resonate to, right? So that's 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 really good news. Um, um, well, I, I guess from the title we could remove the question mark and simply say Homo stupidus, right? So there is something we are truly missing here. We're something we are truly missing when we speak of of Planta sapiens, and 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 I would I I think I can I, I'll try to to convey the, the the general idea of what I mean by by we 
not getting what's at stake here, right? And uh, this is what we do basically at the Minimal Intelligence Lab. We combine, if you see the caving here on the on the on the left, we combine observations through time lapse photography. So we do time lapse photography. We take a picture every minute or so. We assemble the footage, and we are able to observe the overt behavior of plants, right? So that's that's sort of the idea. Like let's see how sophisticated plant behavior is by observing the time-lapse footage, and then let's try to make ourselves an idea of, of, of whether that type of behavior is sophisticated enough, is adaptive, is flexible, is anticipatory, is goal-directed, for example. So what sort of behavior it is that allows us to speculate that, hey, this is cognition after all. We are speak, truly speaking of plant intelligence or plant cognition, or in this case, plant perception, right? Um, uh, on the other hand, on top of doing the observations through time-lapse photography, we are also doing plant electrophysiology. So if you see on the right, we are inserting electrodes, pairs of electrodes, so that we can monitor the internal activity of the plant in the form of electrophysiological activity, right? So the, the fire, firing, the firing of, of, of action potential within the plant body, right? So, so by combining these two things, uh, observations through time-lapse photography and electrophysiological recordings, we hope to be able to see something that we might be missing otherwise, right? Um, so this is, would be like a general idea of, of uh, the setting, like, like assembling the, the, the booths where we do the time-lapse observations. In this case, this is a climbing beam approaching a pole, like a climbing, climbing to a host pole in this case, and the amplifier to, 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 uh, to acquire the electrophysiological data that we then analyze. Um, and just, just for example, just to give you an idea of, of, of how you know different fields in which our our research uh, bears upon. Uh, here at the top, you, you can see the the root, uh, the main root of, of wild rice, and the bottom one is is a mutant of, of this variety of rice. So the top one you can see that it's circumnotating is actually revolving as it's moving through differential elongation. And if you see the bottom picture, is simply growing in circles. So it looks pretty stupid, right? And the top one is kind of exploring, exploring somehow the landscape. So if you think about it, um, when one type of behavior looks like really stupid compared to the other behavior, which is like more exploratory, bear in mind that all that has changed in between the top and the bottom picture is the fact that the top root can circumnotate, whereas the bottom one cannot. So in this case, we are talking of a system, a plant body, which is fully decentralized, which is non-neuronal. Of course, there are no neurons, no central nervous system. Everything is kind of, kind of, a, a, comes hand in glove with a general that you will be familiar with, em, embodied, embedded, situated, and active uh, ecological approach. So all this, uh, this combination, these toolkits of the of the embodied cognitive sciences, if you see what I mean, they render themselves, themselves really useful to try to apply those those methodologies to plant to observation and explanation of plant behavior. Insofar as plants are by necessity fully distributed. They are fully decentralized. So these methodologies that we are used to using in the context of the explanation of animal behavior, they are really handful or they come really handy when it comes to explaining plant behavior, right? But we can do something else. We can think of how to phyto inspire our robots. So if you think of this root that could circumnotate and, and, and explore its surroundings, and the root that was a mutant that couldn't circumnotate, just look what happens when you try to build a robot out of uh, this inspired in a plant system, right? So this robot is, uh, is uh, think of this as an inflatable balloon, right? So it's, it's, uh, the actuation is pneumatic, so you're you are putting pneumatic pressure. So it's kind of like a balloon that, that, that gets, gets uh, extended. Uh, this can circumnotate, and in that sense, it, it, the, the system can grow and um, explore the surroundings, right? Like, 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 avoid the obstacles. Whereas, if you see the other one on the right, it's a system that is not able to circumnotate, and thereby it gets stuck as soon as it finds something. You see, this is the type of decentralized understanding of, of what I was telling you about. But we can combine the type of uh, embodied cognitive science that we are familiar with 
with the type of phyto inspiration that has to do, for example, in this case, with the construction of a robot based not on locomotion, like a robot, an animal robot would be based on the inspiration of locomotion, like an animal, like locomoting from point A to point B. But in this case of a robot that grows, we call it a grow bot because it's a robot that grows from point A to point B. So in this sense, we can see that simply by allowing a system that grows to circumvent, it can avoid obstacles in a way that it couldn't be able to do otherwise, right? So this is one of the things you can do with, with uh, uh, phyto inspiration for robotics and AI. Um, now, this is the, the, the type of uh, biosensors that we use to measure the electrophysiological activity. And um, think about it, this is one of the reasons why this is important is that sometimes through uh, behavioral observations, um, through time-lapse observ observation of the overt behavior, we might be missing something that is not really conspicuous to the open eye. So if you get to see through the time-lapse footage what the plant is doing, it might not be that revealing. And in fact, a lot of what's going on, it might be happening underneath. So at the level of electrophysiological activity. So in that sense, if we are able to track, to monitor the electrical activity running throughout the plant body, what we are able to see is that something lights up, something flags at a different time scale. So that's very important, for example, when it comes to, to agriculture. When you are, you know, if imagine a plant is submitted to some form of stress, could be hydric stress or heat stress, temperature, whatever, any form of stress whatsoever. A form of stress that might not be conspicuous to the naked eye or to time-lapse footage, so you don't get to see it, it's not yet there, the stress manifests, but it is at the level of the electrophysiology. So you might be able to train or to develop an algorithm to interpret the electrophysiological data and see how the plant is anticipatorily taking measures uh, ahead of time to deal with those contingencies before it's too late, right? So that's something that, that's why we want to combine the behavioral with electrophysiological measurements to see how them both together can tell you something more than, than, than by looking at them in isolation, right? And so this is all, um, um, you mentioned in the introduction, the, the book Plant Sapiens. This is something we have um, discussed at length, but there is something to me that, that I, really bothers me. And it's what I call in the book something like, I, I, I think we are in a sense treating plants as locked-in syndrome patients, in a, in a sense. Like, think of this behavioral uh, anal level of analysis in which by looking at the behavior, we would see plants simply sitting there, like being sessile, being rooted, doing nothing. And in a sense, we kind of need to open the communication channel. Some, 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 we need to develop some skill to interpret the internal activity of the plant to realize that the plant is truly alive and there is something going on in there, despite our incapacity to see it through the time-lapse footage, right? So in that sense, that's the way we need to train our eye or to rely on other techniques of observation to truly understand what's happening within the plant. And the plant may be sentient, may be fully alive in a sense that we are missing simply by watching the time-lapse footage, right? Do you see what I mean? So in, a, in fact, uh, this is a legume. So you know legumes fold their leaves at night, so uh, they, they go to bed. So this is funny because when I speak about this to people, they say, look, you know, if you say that the plant goes to sleep, uh, um, people say, hey, now, you know, we are talking metaphors. You don't really mean to say that. But if you think about it, it this is funny because uh, plants, or in this case legumes, they biosynthesize melatonin. So melatonin, the, same, the very same molecule that we use and we know puts us back with our day-night cycle. So you know when people take a melatonin tablet, uh, synthetic melatonin to, to ease sleep at night and things like this, or when we speak of sleep as DNA repair, right? So any form of life whatsoever, of course, we are all enslaved and in a sense we, we exploit the information that comes in the form of those day-night cycles under humidity, temperature, light, all those informations, all those regular patterns uh, around the clock is, is information that, of course, plants have got to exploit somehow as well, right? So circadian clocks, of course, are ubiquitous and we all rely on the same type of molecular clocks to, 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 to make sense out of, of, of those regularities. So in that sense, we, we do mean to say that the plant is, 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 is going to bed and do plants, uh, uh, when we see that plants are biosynthesizing their own phytomelatonin, it's funny that we, when we look through the microscope, we don't identify that molecule and think it's the very same molecule that 
takes place in the animals. So in the very same molecule, we just fail to miss it. We just fail to see it. And that's why we even have to have the feeling that we need to add the prefix. And we say phytomelatonin. But this melatonin, the very same melatonin, we also employ, right? So um, in fact, uh, this is even more dramatic. Just think of isuferin. So any anesthetic, so the type of anesthetic that allows you to put an animal to sleep, right? So we, you can take a plant, literally, you can take this plant, a Venus flytrap, to the, to the vet, and you can just use the same anesthetic that they use in the vet, right? So we've done this. We've taken the Venus flytrap to the vet, and we've put under the glass bell and use the same type of anesthetic, and you can actually see how, how the plant uh, uh, is, is, is put to sleep. So if you think of this, uh, if you see, this is a mimosa, by the way. You know, the mimosa is the one that you don't even need to do time lapse because it falls to in our time scale. So you just touch it as here, and you can see how the plant is folding, right? So the plant falls, it leaves. In real time, you can just record that, um, right? And what happens when you anesthetize the plant? So when you anesthetize it, um, this is, uh, uh, hold on a sec. This is, yeah. So this is what happens to the plant when it's fully anesthetized. You see, now you touch it, and it won't fall its leaves. It simply doesn't fall them, right? Now, I, I, just to remind you, we are very, using the very same anesthetic that you used uh, in the case of, of, of a pet when you take it to the vet, right? Um, now what happens when you take it... Uh, um, when you allow some time to pass and, 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 and the effect of anesthesia wears off, now is after the effect of anesthesia wears off, you can see that the leaves are starting to fold again, if only kind of more slowly. So it's kind of taking longer. It's like, what happened here? I am coming out of anesthesia at the pace, right? So if you see, uh, uh, um, when you think of plant sentience, it's, it's, it's not so dramatic if you think of it in the very same terms as you think with animals. So if, if under anesthesia you have lost something temporarily that you recover somehow when you come out of anesthesia, something similar is, is happening in the case of plants. We just need to realize that, that, that it's, it's the very same thing, right? Uh, the very same thing. Because precisely because we are actually the molecular mechanism, the role anesthesia is playing is the very same is doing the very same thing in plant and animal cells. Basically, is 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 messing up the the, the trafficking of the membrane. So it's it's preventing effectively preventing the action potentials from taking place for firing. So the plant is not firing action potentials anymore. So if you see here the recording here, we have the Venus fly trap under the glass bell with the cotton pads with anesthetics. You can see prior to anesthetizing the plant, this is the action potential. So you can see the spike, the very same spike you would see in, a, in an animal subject. Then after the anesthesia has taken place, you see the flat line, right? So it's fully anesthetized, right? Then, of course, you will again see a spike when the plant goes back to normal, right? So, so I, well, by the way, this is Natalie uh, Lawrence. This is my co-author, and, and I, I owe her so much. Uh, so she's. we were very happy here. Um, she put the pros to the book, and, and we we were so happy here to see to see the book in the in the windows here. It was in in London, Piccadilly, but but more importantly, uh, uh, there is this is something that this is I, I'm having such a big headache to trying to convey this message. When it's like when you talk to people, and in this case to the book to the guy at the bookshop, and tell and tell him, look. This is the very same sort of sapiens that we mean when we speak of homo sapiens. So if you have, thematically speaking, a shelf where you put books on sapiens, don't think that plants, plant a sapiens doesn't belong there. So we mean it literally, right? It's no metaphor. We mean it literally. Now, when you think you don't mean it literally, it's because if you say, look, if we spoke of plant vision, you might be, you might be saying, well, if you are literal about plant vision, what do you want me to do? Shall we picture that you are sticking like two eyeballs to the plant and that's what you mean by a plant having eyes or having vision and of course if we, if that's what we thought we would be missing what's the stake so being literal and non being metaphorical doesn't mean that we are gonna exploit those those broad uh, analogies we mean it in a different sense of course and um, here is just an example of, of of the way in which functionally speaking you might think of the type of structures that could play the same optical role that that is being played when it comes to the exploitation of 
information in the form of images in, in, a, in an animal retina. So if you have in a leaf structure, the type of structure that allows in the catechol, for example, the external part of the leaf, you have the, the structure that allows you to play the role of a cornea. And the, in the epidermis, the same role that plays the, uh, plays the, the role of, a, of, of the lens. And in the mesophyll down there where you have the chloroplasts for the purpose of doing photosynthesis, you have this type of structures that allow you to play the same functional role being played by a retina in an animal model. Then things look rather different, like with the action potential. Oh, we are not being metaphorical. We mean to say literally that... that plants are being prevented from firing action potentials. The same could be happening here, right? So when we are speaking, for example, of the optical capacity for, uh, capacities of plants, we mean it in a whole different way. But it goes way more uh, uh, deeper, this, this idea. Uh, in this paper, we, we, uh, we did this uh, observational study, this behavioral study on, on, on the climate being usual, right? The climate being going up a pole so if you see this is this is the video so you could see you just pay attention to the top view on the left so you could see the climbing being circundotating from the top you can see then we could try to study the pattern of movement this is is doing as it's trying to approach the pole so remember this is a vine and it requires to reach a pole so this is, this is flexible goal directed behavior you see when it's approaching the pole it's like trying to reach it right uh, there it goes almost there so I, actually i'm going to show you one that is even more dramatic uh, watch this one if you see to the um naked eye um let me, I, I can see we are running out of time, so let me, let me speed up. Um, so you see this pattern of motion is going circular, right? So it's circundotating in circles. Look at the picture on the right, on the left, the top picture, right? So here is circundotating in circles. Now you will see that after a while it skips. Now it will skip the second half of the circle and just fish for the pole. Look, look, now it's going all the way for the pole. You see that? Now it's going backwards taking impulse and shooting, fishing for the pole, right? Now, uh, that's pretty impressive. Uh, when we look at these types of, of, of behaviors, we can't help but think that we are missing something or that we might be missing something unless we truly think of this in the very same way we speak of the way animals exploit information through optic, optic information, I mean. So think of the type of optic flow that the system generates when it's moving with respect to the surroundings. So this is what you are doing, right? As you are moving across space, you are generating information as you are coupling in particular ways with respect to the environment. So if this is you sitting here, this is the type of information, optic flow you will be generating as objects expand or contract in your retina as you approach those objects or you move away from those objects or steer to one side or to the other, right? So we just need to realize that we are treating here the tree as an object and the human subject as the agent performing the activity and generating the optic flow based information, right? So we just need to think in the very same terms, like the tree could play the role of the agent. So we could be thinking of the tree as the agent, right? So in that sense, if you think of the way we are able to generate optic flow information through movement, through locomotion, remember the photo the uh, phyto-inspired robots at the beginning, where you have these this, this, uh, rovers or these robots that are able to grow rather than locomote, we are able to, get, to create or to generate information based on optic flow through movement. Now, if you are able to create that type of information through locomoting throughout the space, through your surroundings, we are simply saying that the very same thing, the very same thing applies here when you are thinking of an object or of a, of a plant uh, moving in space. So when you think of this plant, of the climbing being, when you think of the climbing being uh, uh, circundotating around in this way, right? Uh, in this way, it's happening exactly the same. So just think of the climbing being not metaphorically, but literally as generating those optic flows. Now you see what I mean that we are not talking metaphors, we are not trading in metaphors, we are 
speaking literally of the plant, generating the type of energy flows that then can allow itself to guide itself in a subsequent pattern of growth, thereby generating or closing the loop in an ecological manner, right? So that's, that's basically the, the idea of, 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 of this approach. I can see we are running out of time, so I'm skipping the last few slides and, and just, um, yeah, getting there for the sake of having some time for questions. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much, Paco. I don't know if you could hear the audience clap because the audio from the room might not be coming to you. Uh, I have a lot of questions of my own, but my role is to convey questions from the audience. So are there any questions? There's one there that I can see. Thank you very much for that. Oop, that's a bit loud. That was a really, really um, fascinating talk. Uh, and I think it was very convincing for the idea that, of course, plants have behavior. Um, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but it certainly sounds like you're trying to say that plants perhaps also have experience, that there is something that it is like to be a plant, and perhaps plants are consciousness. Plants have consciousness. Uh, but one thing that struck me about most, if not all, of the evidence that you prevent, presented in this presentation is that it would also apply to microorganisms in terms of responding to uh, photographic information. Example, we of course have microorganisms that have phototaxis. In terms of anesthesia, uh, I believe a lot of microorganisms, if not all microorganisms that have been tested, will also stop behaving um, when they have anesthesia. And in terms of melatonin, I don't know about that chemical specifically in microorganisms but there is certainly a huge wide array of chemicals that we see across the spectrum of life, like DNA and RNA, for example. So if you are indeed um, arguing that these, this evidence shows that plants could be conscious, uh, would you say that your arguments also apply across the, animal, across the kingdoms of life and that all organisms, including single cellular organisms, could be conscious? And if you're not saying that, then I would wonder what uh, could you say about plants specifically, as opposed to single cellular organisms, could make them conscious? And uh, what evidence do you have for that or what has kind of convinced you that that could be true? Paco, could you hear this or do I need to convey it? I'm sorry, can, can you recap? I, I, I was Yes, I will try to the... recap. So, um, sorry. what you study and what behaviors we know from microorganisms? What are the common principles? What are the differences? Can we talk about plant consciousness, microorganism consciousness? Do they converge or diverge at certain very key points? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah I would say, uh, um, in a sense, uh, that the very, the very same principles uh, apply uh, across the tree of life. So I don't think there is anything um, particular about plants that we couldn't speak of in the rest of the tree of life, so to speak. So, so put, it, put differently, if there is sentience and if there is cognition to be uh, uh, spoken of at all in the tree of life, it will be at the very stump of the tree of life. So where there is life, there is sentience. And that applies to unicellulars, of course. So, to me, the reason why we could put them all in the same in the same basket is that uh, uh, the mistake we are making. Think of uh, bacterial chemotaxis, and the, the very same thing happens with plants. We are just because analytically speaking, we are forced, in a sense, for for experimental reasons and control reasons, to focus on one channel of communication, one uh, parameter, and one variable. So we might think of, of bacterial chemotaxis and think of this chemical gradient, and then how it's swimming up this chemical gradient to to catch the sugar or something. Or in plants, you can think of how to study phototropic behavior and just think of light itself, right? But just just uh, 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 just look here. This is just a, 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 a list we compiled of different sources of information that plants are sensitive to. And I say plants, but of course we know plants, and you know, uh, throughout the tree of life, uh, it, it applies uh, equally. Uh, of course, tailor made. But but to me, the take home the, the take home message is that we can speak of sentence at the very stump of the tree of life simply because we cannot speak of, of, of life responding on a one-to-one -one basis to a surface stimulation. Even though we are focusing on, on light or focusing on this chemical, that's going to be done in the context of the gravity pull 
and in the context of these other guys around secreting chemicals and in the context of many these all, all these other things happening so in a sense any form of life whatsoever will have to weigh those all those incoming sources of information and provide a response that is not just adaptive or flexible but globally adaptive so we construct uh, in the lab these these toy versions in which we're able to focus on one channel and we forget that in trying to make sense of the way they make sense of the surroundings they need to have this higher level understanding of of seeing this all and finding a way to trade off in between all these sources of information and to me that's the reason why why that higher level perspective that which is to me the entry route to saint end has got to be there in the first place because first it's got to be a response that is, as I said, globally adaptive. And second, it cannot be reactive. It's got to be truly proactive. So it cannot be simply waiting for this information to impinge on the sensory surface and provide a response reactively. They've got to, ahead, respond anticipatorily. And they can only do that if they have this sense of balance uh, built on top of those individual one-to-one -one signaling systems, right? So in that sense, I would say that, that the same predicates, so think of habituation, just to use a, a, a predicate from the learning literature. So that mimosa that you saw being anesthetized, mimosa is a plant that learns. So habituation is a primitive form of learning, sure, but, but is the very same type of learning, habituation, that we can try experimentally on any other form of life whatsoever. And we will know that it's been tried in unicellulars, and we can speak. So we will just have to customize the protocols because the time scales will be, will be different, because electrophysiological speaking, again, the time scales for the electrophysiological signaling will be different, but despite those idiosyncrasies in terms of the time scales where those behaviors unfold, there is something that unites us all, and it's the sense in which we need to make sense of the surroundings in a proactive, anticipatory, and global adaptive way. Mm. Thank you very much, Paco. It would be great to have you here and continue this lovely conversation over a coffee break. But at this point, let's thank Paco once again. Thank you. And we will, we will move on to our next speaker while Mikhail changes the, preference, the preferences. I will uh, go ahead and introduce her. Can you still hear me? Great. Uh, Daniel is here. The phone is here. So our next speaker, uh, Katie Bentley, is... Uh, lecturer, senior lecturer at the um, uh, main institutes at the King's College and has her lab at uh, Creek. Her first lab was at Harvard and she had two satellite labs, one in Boston and one in Uppsala, hence my confusion as to you know, what to mention first. And today she will be talking about cell dances, cell choreographies, how cells either as individuals or in groups uh, sense their environments, make decisions and eventually adapt. Uh, so the title of your talk is Active Perception in Collective Cell Patterning, and officially, this day is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, it's just been fantastic to be here. I've already had such a good time. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you can... Okay, here we go. Thanks. Let's see, does that work? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, what an interesting bunch of people um, to be talking to. And it's true, you can't see anything once you're up here. <laughs> There's a bright light in your eyes. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, uh, an active theory that we're literally working on right now. Um, so it'd be really nice to get feedback and, uh, and hear from different perspectives on this idea we're working on of active perception in cellular collectives. So we're going to go down to cell scale now. Um, so I actually started my career here at Sussex. Uh, I did my bachelor's and uh, master's here in maths and computer science, uh, doing the easy MSc course, um, learning about evolution and adaptive systems. Um, so this is why uh, you're going to see quite a lot of computer simulations, which are the sort of mainstay of what we do in the lab. But I got um, kind of wooed into uh, loving um, blood vessels uh, unexpectedly, um, and ended up learning quite hardcore biology, and now have a wet lab as well. Um, so we sort of meld this sort of try and cross the disciplines, I suppose, of computer simulations and um, wet lab uh, vascular biology. And, and the way that I got sort of sucked into this area was by being shown beautiful images like this down the microscope of, uh, of blood vessel networks. And this is uh, actually a mouse retina. 
which is used as one of the standard um, experimental assays in vascular biology because the, these blood vessels grow out in a really stereotypical way from the optic nerve. This is a developing eye uh, of the mouse, and you can actually see the blood vessels, they sprout. So this is a little, it might be easier with the, oh yeah, I'll do with that. So that is one little blood vessel sprout that's just starting to come out. Um, and this is called the sprouting front. And so what happens is they start out from the optic nerve, radiating out, growing this vascular network. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how this process works, because it just seemed incredible to me that endothelial cells that line your blood vessel wall are able to collectively coordinate um, in order to grow these well-adaptive structures. Um, and every single one is different. It's well-adapted to the local needs of that tissue as that developing eye tissue is growing. Um, and what really struck me as interesting is that in disease conditions, um, and your blood vessels pervade almost every organ of the body, so uh, they actually affect or are a part of a lot of different diseases. Um, but in particular, this is retinopathy that we study, uh, and the mouse model of uh, retinopathy of prematurity that happens with uh, newborn children um, that are premature. Um, and what happens is the disease conditions seem to cause the endothelial cells to construct very different morphologies. So instead of that nice sort of familiar tree-like structure of a densely branched network, you end up with several, you know, a lot of blood vessels that are actually very enlarged and bulbous, and then other regions of the eye that have absolutely no blood vessels at all, and it's actually very poorly branched. Um, and trying to understand this switch in collective behavior and why they would construct this different structure that's then very, uh, is very important for, for understanding therapeutics. Um, and it's these abnormal vascular structures that emerge during this, this disease that actually cause mechanical traction and they pull the retina off. So they are actually the, the key problem in causing blindness in this retinopathy. So what we want to try and do is understand how do blood vessels actually grow normally? What do the cells do normally? In order to try to sort of trick these cells in the disease case to start behaving normally despite the fact that they're in a disease environment. Um, but in order to do that, we have to actually understand how blood vessels grow normally, and it turns out there's a lot of open questions and people still don't really understand it. So this is the first few sort of key steps of the process, and then I'm going to home in on one of them and, and tell you about our, our theories of how this works. So uh, angiogenesis is the name for the growth of blood vessels, particularly sprouting ones from pre-existing ones. So it's a particular type of blood vessel growth, angiogenesis. Um, and it happens during development in your organs. It also happens uh, if you cut yourself, you'll start doing angiogenesis. So your, your blood vessels will have to start growing and reforming that network. Um, and what happens is if a tissue becomes low in oxygen because of a wound or because it's just growing during development, it will start releasing certain signals. So the tissue starts to release pro-angiogenic and anti-angiogenic signals. It actually needs a balance of these different things. It's not just one signal. But we're going to hone in on one just to sort of explain it. But just keep in the back of your mind, there's actually quite a lot of complexity and multiple signals going on that these cells need to sense. And here's our pre-existing vessel lined with endothelial cells. And what happens is they detect this signal, and then a few of them, not all of them, just some of them start to respond. And they respond by changing shape. Uh, and quite dramatically, they change shape and grow fingers and they grow these, they're called philopodia and dactylpodia, dactyl meaning finger. Uh, and so they were these sort of literally kind of ellipsoid cells uh, around the vessel. And now some of them start to grow these fingers and protrude out perpendicular to the vessel. Um, and this is zooming in on a real one in the mouse retina. Um, and you can see these fingers here. And they actually use them to, they're involved in this migratory crawling response that the cells will need in order to um, migrate and sprout away. And so these cells that do this are called the tip cell, or leader cells. Uh, so these are the highly migratory cells that will lead the following cells to form a new blood vessel sprout. Those sprouts actually quite quickly find each other through a process called anastomosis, which people don't, don't really understand that well, honestly. Um, but these finger shapes are very important, and they sort of find each other and form a loop. They fuse. And then they can support blood flow. And once you have that blood flow, um, you've oxygenated that little bit of tissue. So it's done its job. And what happens is to grow a network, you just iteratively follow these rules. So you select some new leaders uh, from these new blood vessels you've just created, and then you can start to build up a dense network. And so this sprouting front that first emerges in your tissues when they grow um, is actually a really regular meshwork. It's not got that hierarchical, sort of familiar hierarchical tree-like structure that we tend to think of with, with blood vessels. That structure occurs later and so, actually, 
The mouse retina is a lovely model for this because you can, in one snapshot image, you see the new developing bit, but also the older bit, because it's coming from the optic nerve, this developed a little bit earlier, and it's getting that tree-like structure with the wider vessels, this is the artery here, and the vein here, just a bit wider than the others. And that widening occurs in a process similar to the way rivers literally sort of, it's blood flow. So blood flow that's stronger down one uh, sort of track just happens, will start to widen that region. If there's regions that are lower flow, they'll prune away. So it's really just like the way that rivers start to sort of reinforce certain regions and less so in others. And that's how you actually get the morphology of the tree-like structure. So we actually study this first step, just the sprouting, the initial plexus formation, it's called. So just this regular meshwork. And we go really, we just focus in on this patterning process here. Why don't they all respond the same way? Uh, and it was a really interesting question. When I first started as a postdoc, that was the big question. Why don't they all just respond? But actually, it makes sense that only a few of them respond so that they can be the leaders and the other ones can be the followers. But the mechanism by which this works was then discovered, and it's called lateral inhibition. And it's actually a, a patterning, pattern formation process that occurs in many different tissues and different scenarios. Um, but we found that, uh, well, just before I started, really, my then supervisor was part of the discovery um, that this is what's selecting this pattern of tip cells. And I'm going to attempt to explain lateral inhibition to you, which is quite a complicated process, so we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, basically, we've zoomed in on two endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are always stuck together because even when they're growing and growing these new blood vessels, they need to keep adhered, you know, stuck together, so that the blood doesn't leak out, basically. So these are two endothelial cells that are adhered here of what's called a junction between two cells. This membrane here, this part of the cell, is exposed to the environment. So the environment becomes hypoxic. Maybe you've cut yourself, or maybe it's this bit of the eye tissue that's growing. And it starts to um, generate this protein signal, a growth factor. So there's an environmental signal, and the cells start to detect it. They detect it because they've got receptors on their cell surface. Um, this is called vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. It's actually the primary growth factor for blood vessel growth. Um, so the receptor is called the VEGF receptor, but we'll just call it a sensor to be simple. Um, and it actually triggers, so when this receptor chemically binds this growth factor, it triggers a chemical reaction and actually a lot of chemistry going on in signaling networks inside the cell. But being originally a computer modeler, I forget about all that. And I just draw an arrow. So this is good. And it then causes loads of complicated changes inside, uh, gene expression changes inside the nucleus and we'll just put the word genes. Uh, and we're only going to worry about one of those changes right now, which is that it upregulates a ligand or a protein called delta-like 4, we'll just call it D. Delta-like 4 becomes a signal that this cell can send to this cell, because this cell has a receptor that specifically binds that signal. This is called the notch receptor, um, and it's a, this is a big signaling pathway, again, in a lot of different cell systems in the body. Um, so it was interesting that blood vessels use this too. So this cell on the left tells this cell on the right, sends it a message, uh, and it's literally called a sender-receiver system. Um, and it tells it something. It tells it, I've got lots of this D stuff. And when that happens, this triggers another chemical signaling cascade that changes the gene expression inside this cell. And what the key result of that is, is that this cell starts to downregulate the expression of this sensor. So basically, this cell gets activated by the environment signal and tells its neighbor I want you to not have any sensors for this anymore. I want to see the signal. I don't want you to be able to see this signal. And what happens is, because they're both in this same environment, they actually both start doing this, and they battle. They battle back and forth for who's going to be able to see this signal. And over time, one of them wins the battle, and will have more of the receptor, the sensor. And it's interesting, because that one that has more of this receptor is then able to make these shape changes, because that receptor is known to trigger the shape changes to create those fingers. And so this one will become the tip cell, the leading tip cell. It's got more ability to sense. It's inhibiting its neighbors. They'll become the followers. And it actually is now able to change shape and migrate and, and do the behavior. So that is the lateral inhibition process. It's lateral inhibition, literally, you just sideways inhibit your neighbors. And that's what generates this on-off, on-off pattern. So everyone in the field of vascular biology was very, very excited at this discovery and, and thought, this is, this is brilliant. We've solved it. But what I kind of thought when I, when I looked at this was, but nobody's talking about how long this takes. Um, and blood vessel growth is actually a very, very dynamic process. Um, but the field was using these static images. You know, there's no dynamics to them. 
at the time, um, and hadn't really thought about how long this process might take. So this, what you're watching now, is blood vessels growing in a dish, uh, in vitro, as we call it, so just in a Petri dish. You can put endothelial cells in. We've colored labeled them fluorescently with green and red, so you can see individual cells. Um, and actually, it was by virtue of doing this, we did this for a certain reason, um, but we hadn't realized that by virtue of color labeling them red and green, we would actually see that, uh, you have to kind of pick one to watch, but there's one here if it starts again. The tip cell gets overtaken. So this leader tip cell isn't always at the tip. These aren't fixed, pheno fixed phenotypes. We discovered they're actually phenotypes in flux. They can change their mind. Um, so the one that's inhibited could actually take over if the conditions change. Um, so it's a very dynamic, it's a time-limited process. So you have to oxygenate that, new, that tissue, otherwise, you know, it's going to die. Um, so they're going to have to solve this patterning problem very quickly. And they're going to have to be able to repattern if things change. Uh, and it's great that this word umwelt's come up, you know, already, because the cell's umwelt, basically, is going to change a lot as they move around in space uh, during this process, which we think then changes who, who their neighbors are, so who's inhibiting them, who they're inhibiting. Um, so they're continually battling and competing as they, as they extend these sprouts. And it struck me that, you know, if you've ever been in a committee, then you'll know it takes us intelligent human beings a very long time to come to collective decisions. So why are we assuming that, that this process would occur quickly? Um, it could actually take quite a long time. And, and how are these cells solving a collective decision patterning problem like this on the fly all the time really quickly? Um, this is just from 12 Angry Men, it's a jury. They've got to make a binary decision, you know, guilty or innocent. And it takes the entire film for them to make that decision. Um, so how long does it take these cells to make collective decisions? So in order to start answering this question, because of my background, I guess I instantly want to learn by building. Um, just let's build a replica system, a computer simulation, where we can really study dynamics and start trying to understand what's going on. And my background in adaptive systems led me to instantly want to use embodied um, agent-based modeling. So uh, basically, it, it's, it, I think we've touched on the idea of embodiment so many times, it's brilliant. Uh, but for anyone who doesn't know, it, embodiment is the concept that you really explicitly consider the body and you consider your morphology, the shape, the structure, the localization of where your receptors are on that structure, um, because it constrains and obviously modifies behavior. And uh, you know, on a robot, of course, if you put your sensors at the front, or if you miss, you know, mess them around and put them in all different places, it's going to change how well it's going to move its wheels and, and get to different light sources. I think it's a really clear mapping to uh, cells that you would use this approach because they have such a, such a plasticity of form. They can change their shape really dynamically, and I'm going to show you some movies of that soon. Um, and that, of course, then changes the position of their sensors, although they also have active abilities to change positions of sensors. Um, they can literally traffic them around very quickly if they want to, put them over here or put them over there. They have this really, really incredible um, cytoskeleton, which is unlike our skeleton, which is fixed. The cell skeleton can actively build over here at one minute and then deconstruct and build over here. So they can grow arms and legs wherever they want all the time uh, in response to the environment. And they have a kind of mapping of a controller, you know, in a sense of robots. We think of this sort of neural network, perhaps thinking about the brain in general. The cell has this uh, gene regulatory network inside the nucleus, which, you know, you could start to map across. So we, uh, we, we think of cells with this same sort of common framework um, when we described it all in this ridiculously named paper, um, if anyone's interested, um, to see how we map this approach to, to cell biology. Um, and then we call it an agent because it's autonomously generating its own behavior. That's, that's the only uh, idea of what the word agent means. It's just any individual that can generate their own behavior. Um, so, so this is the conceptual approach. And many years ago, I built this simulation software called the MemAgent Spring Model. And we've used it a lot of times and extended it. We're building new software now, but um, this is the one I'll, I'll sort of stick with for the talk. The concept of this model is that um, a cell, just like your body is a society of, made up of lots and lots of cells, the cell itself is a society made up of lots and lots of smaller pieces, uh, proteins, molecules, organelles. So, uh, and being made up of smaller pieces means it's easier to move, actually, and, and, and change the shape. So, in this model, each cell is made up of a collection of smaller individual agents, which we call membrane agents or mem agents because they represent sections of the membrane. And then you can have a localized allocation of receptors uh, and ligands and, and signals uh, so that one side of the cell can respond to, so this little mem agent might be able to respond to the environment 
VEGF levels, the growth factor levels here, uh, in a different way to the way the one does over here. So it's a completely decentralized um, model, because uh, uh, we believe that's actually how the cells work. They really do a lot of decentralized interaction with their environment, not needing to go into any kind of centralized processing. Um, we later put springs in between these little MEM agents so that we could model the tension in this cytoskeleton. And that's why this looks a little bit more fancy, because it's got, it's got springs going on, um, pulling in. We can uh, arrange little rules that then capture the way that these philopodia fingers um, protrude out and uh, extend and retract by creating new linked chains of these little agents and, and springs when the sensors locally activate. So that's when, they, when the sensors activate, they go pink, and then that triggers this localized response, philopodia extending out. Uh, and the cell itself has some overall thing, actually has no concept of this, if you see what I mean. But there is an overall um, summing up of all the protein levels, uh, an activation that changes gene expression on a slower time scale. So what we can do with this model is then start to simulate vessels under different conditions and play around and start to try and understand what's controlling the dynamics of the pattern forming process. Um, so this first step, so here's a vessel, each cell is made up of about a thousand of these little MEM agents, um, and they're interacting with a gradient of this growth factor above them. And you can see that there's two cells here still battling a little bit, but they are basically able to get this on-off, one-off pattern. They started out all the same, but now they're, they're creating that nice um, pattern where some of them uh, activated their VEGF receptors more, they upregulate this delta signal, and they use it to inhibit their neighbors, uh, which then pull in and retract those protrusions. In the simulation, we can, we can have them actually sprouting and moving forward and looping, but for this one, I just wanted to show you the pattern forming. Um, because what I'm going to show you is a simulation where we've then reduced a particular parameter. So we, we've actually done a lot of studies a lot, across a lot of different parameters in this model and then found that they, they have uh, uh, relevant uh, experimental um, um, phenotypes. But I'm just going to show you this one um, because it relates to per perception. So what we've done here is just reduce the probability of one of those finger-like protrusions to come out. Uh, upon sensor activation. So when one of the receptors activates, you get this protrusion coming out, and we just turn down the probability of that happening. So they are still doing it, but just less so. And what we noticed was quite unexpected, that the pattern um, of selecting those tip cells is slower to emerge in this concept. And here, if you actually just put the frames of the movies going underneath each other, so time's now going downwards, then they do get there, they get this pattern of on-off, on-off selection but it took them a lot longer. And this was really, really surprising to us because the dogma in the vascular biology field is that not this notch lateral inhibition process selects tip cells, and then the tip cells have these fingers, and that's how they move. No one's ever talked about those finger-like protrusions being part of the earlier decision-making process. They're always the end result. And that really struck us as surprising when I mean, we had to really go back and think about, does this model just have a bug in it? Is there something wrong with it? Why would you mess up the end result uh, and find that it changed the entire process? Um, but in order to understand this, I think it's good to think about what are these philopodia? And so these little protrusions that stick out, um, they're, as I say, locally activated receptors, um, and they, they, they cause actin, this cytoskeletal polymer, to polymerize, which gets bundled together, and they polymerize out and push the membrane out. And so you get rapid extensions out, and then if that sensor goes off, they actually rapidly retract. And when I say rapid, this is actually a movie that we got last week in the lab by Irena, who's fantastic. And she's labeled fluorescently the actin. So this is, you're actually watching the actin polymers forming in response to this growth factor in an endothelial cell in the dish. And you can see how quickly they come out, and then quickly they go back. So these are rapid responses. Um, and it made us think about, well, wait a minute, so they must be happening first then. It makes sense that they would happen prior to this decision-making process. So we started to think, well, why would it be slower without these protrusions? Why would it be slower for cells to battle back and forth? So if you think about where the VEGF receptors are on the surface, if the cell can't change shape in any way and it's just stuck, it can't grow these philopodia, then the input signal by these two cells would be very similar because they're microscopic, they're right next, they're just in the same gradient, um, and the receptors are all just on this surface. You'll get the same basic input going into this system. But gene expression is slow. It takes on the order of hours to happen, whereas these philopodia are very, very rapid in order of seconds. So we simulated this with a maths model. If you have uh, just 
the delta notch passing, battling going, going back and forth. And it takes actually multiple battles back and forth for these cells if they have basically the same input. It takes a long time for them to battle before they can amplify that small input change uh, into, into a decision. Whereas if you have philopodia, which is uh, basically a positive feedback of sensors and motors, um, they, they, the, the philopodia activate sensors, they move the, the uh, sensors forward, which then will, if they're in the right directions, keep them moving forward and keep the sensors activating. And then you can have a very rapid uh, difference where one cell's got a lot more protrusions than the other, because they're quite stochastic, but this one might happen to just go in the right direction and get those um, reinforced. Then you get one with a much bigger input than the neighbor cell. And then that bigger input is much quicker to be amplified. So basically, they help the cells make a quicker decision. So we wanted to check whether this would actually happen in vivo. We started to feel confident it made sense. And I convinced my collaborator, Shane Herbert, at Manchester University, who works with zebrafish, to test the idea. So this is blood vessels growing in the zebrafish. They grow out from the dorsal aorta, and you see them sprouting up, and you see the little finger protrusions as they go. They've been well studied. Uh, this system is very widely studied. Um, but no one had ever looked before it starts whether there's any philopodia. Are they there before the, you know, during the decision-making rather than while they're migrating? And actually, we found there are philopodia sticking out before the tip cells are selected. And we were able to selectively inhibit those philopodia and see what happens to the timing of tip cells coming out. And what we found was that, so this is showing you frames of a movie going down in a control normal case. So the dorsal aorta, and quite quickly, you'd normally get sprouts coming out. First cell comes out, second cell like that. When you inhibit those philopodia with latrunculin B, then it takes a lot longer before that first cell comes out. And all the sprouts eventually get there, but they're much, much slower. So just as the simulation predicted, and I thought this was a wonderful image. So this is showing fluorescently the activated cell. So the one that has the most sensor activation is showing up fluorescently as yellow. And that's always the tip cell. And you always get one cell selected going up um, as the, the sprout starts. This is in a latrunculin B case. So basically, we've got the philopoda have been inhibited, and they're finding it harder to make that decision. And you can see here where there's a sprout that hasn't come out yet a collection of about five of them, all activators still battling. So to me, this seemed like that committee that's struggling to make a decision. So just to finish, I wanted to say, sort of step back and say why we think it's important to simulate in biology, because I think it helps you to think about your system in a different way. Um, and we started to realize that the reason this hadn't been spotted before, that there might be a role for shape changes and movement um, in, uh, in this decision-making process and that it's actually critically important. It allows them to make the decision in the time limit available. Um, it's because the way in biology all diagrams are written, so the dogma of, of how we think in biology, is in a certain order that you have an input signal that goes to uh, a sort of chemical signaling pathway, decision-making and gene expression changes, and then they always write the behavior at the end. You always put movement, division, death for the cell, the behavior comes right at the end. And so, and I'm just gonna show you an example of this, but this is, I think, because biology is still stuck in a bit of a signaling and gene-centric way of thinking about the world, it doesn't think about the body and doesn't think about movement very, very highly. This is an example from a paper, it's really standard, that you get, you know, this, you have your receptors at the top, signaling input, VEGF there, um, and then here's that signaling cascade, cascade, the complicated signaling network that they think is doing all the work, and that's why it's getting all of the space in this picture. And then the really boring bit from their point of view is the movement, which is right down here. So cell migration changes when the gene expression changes. So you can sort of see how someone's thinking about the process, the way they've drawn this diagram, that it's all about the signaling, and the body and the cell movement, the behavior is right at the bottom. But actually what we're saying is that we need to flip this diagram, really importantly flip it, and put it time-ordered properly, because the movement happens first, and the body response is primary. It happens way before the gene decisions are made, because they are slower. Um, so when we write it the other way around, and we actually put it time-ordered, there's that movement, the philopodia occur first, because they are fast. You can see how there's space for a behavior and body in it's sort of informing, changing the quality of what's sensed in order to better inform the decision-making. Um, so we think this is where the cells use sensory motor feedback, active perception, um, in order to this, this positive feedback between movement and sensing very, very rapidly in order to inform better decision making. Um, and that the way that we draw those diagrams normally just stops you being able to think like that because the movement's at the end. So, uh, oh, I just wanted to say that we published the first, this first proof of concept of this idea 
in the first special issue on basal cognition, which Mike Levin, who's going to speak in a minute, um, was one of the editors of. So I think this is a really exciting field that's uh, starting to emerge. Um, and we're hoping to sort of really prove this idea that, that cells actively perceive in order to make better decisions. Um, and just say thank you very much for listening, and thank you to my lab. Um, we need a new lab picture, because that's all clearly in lockdown. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katie, for this very fascinating talk. Uh, in the interest of time and because we are running late, would it be all right if we take questions during the panel? Of course, yeah. Excellent, thank you. So now it's a time for another short break, but at the same time in the auditorium, in case you want to walk in and out, we will have a very interesting artwork termed uh, The Cell Planet from Sue Young, who worked as a designer for a decade before uh, joining us here in Sussex. He's a doctoral researcher as well. He's interested in the metabolical uh, processes of cells. Uh, and I believe you know how to set up everything here. So by all means, walk in, walk out, stretch, talk to each other, and see you uh, in 15 minutes. Okay. Could I check it out? Yeah, so like remove everything. Yeah, remove so, everything, yes. Okay. Yeah. And these ones? Yeah.
Hello? Great. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Crystal clear. So, um, welcome back, everybody. It is a great honor to be introducing, uh, albeit virtually, uh, the holder of the Van Evar Bush and Dow Chair and a distinguished professor in the biology department at Tufts, Professor Michael Levin. Uh, director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts, as well as the Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology, uh, Michael studies the bioelectrical codes that uh, cells uh, use during the development, injury, or regeneration of an organism. Um, and deciphering these codes, this uh, cellular language, uh, gives you access to the messages these cells uh, exchange with each other. Uh, so if you can start speaking it, you can make repurposing uh, suggestions. You can instruct the cellular uh, decisions. Um, it is probably impossible to summarize neatly uh, the work that Michael Levin has done. Uh, he's uh, working at the, like his work actually is the epitome uh, between uh, computer science and biology. And I will just mention two uh, of his projects, Xenobots and Distinguishing uh, Left from Right. And I will leave the stage uh, to him for his talk, From Physics to Mind, The Journey of Cognition Seen Through the Lens of Embryonic uh, Development. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Uh, here we go. Um, hopefully, you can see my slides. Um, thank you for. Uh, oops. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to share some ideas with you at this uh, amazing uh, workshop. Um, I uh, anyone who's interested can contact me or get any of the uh, the primary data sets, the software, the all the the details, all the you know the protocols, everything else you can get here. What I thought I would try to do is give you an overview of some of the ideas that we've been working on and some of their uh, practical implications. So one of the uh, kind of uh, key things to think about is that uh, many people, when they think about uh, a cognition, they think about a human, and we all think we know what, what a human is. But um, as, as Searle says, uh, sometimes we have to look a little closer at these, at these ideas. And the fact is that all of us began life as just physics. That is, we were all a quiescent oocyte at one point, a little blob of chemicals that one might look and might say, well, that's just, that's just chemistry. There's no, there's no cognition or decision making there. But eventually, this becomes, uh, through an extremely slow and gradual process, step by step, this becomes uh, one of these complex creatures, including perhaps one with uh, metacognition that makes claims about um, anthropomorphisms and being uh, different from, from other types of um, uh, physical objects and so on. And so it's really important to ask ourselves, uh, how is it that we make this journey across the Cartesian cut? How do we get from here to here? Now, uh, Alan Turing needs no introduction, and he was very interested in unconventional embodiments of mind. He wanted to know what intelligence was um, as abstracted from, from uh, current uh, uh, implementations in the, in the, in the uh, natural world. But interestingly enough, he also wrote a paper on morphogenesis, on the creation of shape in chemical systems. And you might wonder, why would somebody who's interested in intelligence and, uh, and computation be interested in, in developmental biology in that way? And I think that uh, this is uh, yet another facet of his brilliance in that he saw, I think, a deep truth, which is that these two questions are fundamentally the same question. The question of intelligence, uh, a unified intelligence in the in the uh, in the mind and the uh, uh, self-assembly of the body are fundamentally the same question. And that's, uh, this is a perspective from which we, uh, we do a lot of our work. So one thing that people will often say is that uh, things like ant colonies and flocks of birds and so on are um, collective intelligences, maybe, and we can sort of argue about whether it makes sense for any given uh, collective to call it a, a collective intelligence. But then, but then we think, well, we are not like that. We are not like a flock of uh, birds or a, or a collection of, of ants. We are a true unified intelligence. But I think we need to be very clear that this is, this is uh, just a, a matter of scale and a particular lens that we, that we use to view ourselves. If you actually dig in, what you find out that that we, we are all made of parts. In fact, I would I would say that all intelligences are collective intelligences. We are all made of parts, and so inside of our supposedly unified brain and inside the uh, pineal gland that uh, Descartes thought was very important because there was just one of them. Sure, there's just one of them. But if you look in, what do you see? You see cells, and inside of these cells, you see this unbelievably rich uh, mosaic of functional uh, systems that are doing all kinds of stuff. This is what's inside every single cell of your bodies. So we are all collective intelligences and we are made of something that looks a little bit like this. This is 
um, a free living organism known as a lacrimaria. Uh, there is no brain, there's no nervous system, but you can see what's going on here. This, this uh, creature is incredibly competent in handling its small scale goals, so single cell level goals, such as uh, physiological goals, uh, uh, anatomical uh, goals, and uh, metabolic goals. And, uh, you know, if you're into soft uh, robotics or something like that, this is, uh, you'd be very jealous of this. I mean, we don't really have anything that has this incredible level of, of control. And we are, in fact, uh, made of um, diverse cells with, with, with all kinds of competencies such as these that work together on very large projects, whereas individual cells work on single level cell goals, such as uh, proliferation and metabolic states. Uh, what I'm going to show you is that collections of cells can work on very large goals, such as making things like this. So let's think about what this kind of architecture, this, this is a very unique architecture, um, what, what does it allow us to do? Well, for example, uh, it raises some, some profound questions. So, so here's a caterpillar. This is a soft-bodied creature. It has a brain suitable for crawling around on leaves and, and eating leaves, so, so it sort of lives in a two-dimensional world. It has to turn into this, which is a butterfly, which lives in a three-dimensional world. It's a hard-bodied uh, kind of uh, creature, completely different controller needed to drive this than to drive this. It has a different brain. During this process, the brain is largely taken apart. Many of the cells die. Most of the connections are taken apart. But one of the amazing things is that there are data that, uh, that show that memories persist. So if you teach something to a caterpillar, the moth or a butterfly actually retains the information despite this incredible uh, uh, rearrangement of the cognitive uh, medium here. So you can ask some 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 very basic questions. Um, you know, we've thought about this issue of what's it like to be a butterfly, but moreover, what's it like to be a caterpillar changing into a butterfly? Right? You 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 are an age you are an agent, and during your lifetime, your 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 mind, your body, completely re 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 rearranged, but some of the memories remain. This is uh, even taken even further by this model system. Uh, these are planaria. These are flatworms. And the thing about flatworms is that uh, they are incredibly regenerative. So every part of the body uh, can be regenerated. So pieces regrow a whole new head with a brain and everything. And what McConnell found in the 1960s, and we have since uh, uh, replicated using modern automated equipment that we've made, is this amazing fact that if you take a planarian and you train them on a specific task, so to look for food in these little bumpy uh, kinds of um, uh, regions, uh, then what you can do is you can amputate the entire head. The tail will sit there doing nothing for about eight to 10 days. Then eventually they regrow a new brain, behavior uh, begins. And then you find out that actually during this time, what had happened was information that was stored in the rest of the body was somehow imprinted onto this new brain. Not only is information stored outside the brain, and they have a true centralized brain, which is just like, just like uh, we do. Uh, they're not like a star, like a distributed star, starfish or anything. Uh, not only can can information um, uh, be stored outside of the brain, but actually can be moved through the body and can be imprinted onto a brand new, fresh brain. And so then you can sort of ask philosophical um, questions like that the malfunctioning transporter experiment. You know, what happens if somebody makes a, makes a copy of you and forgets to uh, destroy the original? Uh, this actually happens in planaria. You can cut this thing into pieces, and every piece is uh, uh, in, in, in an important way, both, both in physical, in, in somatic, and cognitive continuity with the original. So you can see there's this biology has this amazing plasticity and also uh, this relationship between uh, behavioral memories and anatomical memories. And, and we'll talk more about this. Uh, that plasticity extends to vertebrates. So what we've done here is, um, uh, this is the work of Doug Blackiston in our group. This is a tadpole of the frog Xenopus lavis. Here are the nostrils, here's the mouth, here's the brain. And you'll notice there are no eyes up here. We prevented these eyes from forming, but we did uh, put an eye on the tail. And I'll show you in a few minutes how we do that. What we find out is that when you make animals like this and you test them using this uh, behavior testing apparatus that we built, it's an automated training and testing device, uh, what you find is that these animals can see quite well. And in fact, um, these eyes form, even though they're sitting in the middle of muscle instead of in their normal position in the brain, they make an optic nerve. The optic nerve does not connect to the brain. At best, it connects to the spinal cord right here. And without uh, eons of evolutionary um, uh, adaptation, without uh, any, any of that, immediately out of the box, these, uh, these animals can see with this radically uh, different sensory architecture. So as we think about what does, what does life perceive and how does it handle novelty, we can, we can do these kinds of experiments and find out that it's really much broader than the standard reliability of development would lead us to believe.
So, so, so biology uses this uh, multi-scale competency architecture where not only uh, are we structurally a nested a set of nested dolls, but actually each of these layers solves problems in their own spaces. So these are transcriptional spaces, physiological spaces, and anatomical morphospace. And when you're traversing, when you're some sort of a system that traverses these problem spaces, we can ask with what level of competency. And so so I like, uh, we, we study uh, different kinds of intelligence. I like this due to William James, which is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. This is very different than simply uh, some sort of feed forward emergence where, where um, local rules give rise to some kind of complexity. There's, there's a potentially a whole other a factor here. And uh, a Wiener and, and colleagues produce this kind of cybernetic um, mm, a, a, a scale uh, to, to express the different kinds of competencies that you might have in navigating these sorts of spaces. So uh, we are all very good at, as, as, as most animals are very good at noticing agency and intelligence in the three-dimensional world. All of our senses are primed uh, for that, to recognize middle, medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds and doing intelligent things. But there are also some other spaces where we're really just beginning to understand what intelligence looks like in these spaces. And I only have time to talk about one, and this is my favorite one, uh, anatomical morphospace, which is the space of possible shapes that you can make out of cells. So let's just ask a very basic question. Wh where do anatomies come from? This is a uh, section through a human torso. Um, you can see the amazing order, uh, the, the amazing invariant order of all this structure. So, so where is it? And you might be tempted to, to think it's in the DNA, but of course we can read genomes now and we know what's in the DNA, which is the uh, instructions for micro level hardware of every cell, so the proteins. We still need to uh, understand how do the how does the behavior of these cells give rise to something like this? How if something is missing, we could uh, cause these cells to rebuild, so regenerative medicine. And as engineers, and I'll show you at the end, uh, a synthetic um, organism, uh, what else can we make the exact same cells do, right? So, so what is the plasticity here? So one example of this kind of problem solving is something that we discovered a few years ago, which is that uh, when, when tadpoles uh, turn into frogs, they have to rearrange their face. So the eyes, the jaws, the nostrils, the mouth, everything has to move and you get from, from this state to this state. Uh, this was thought to be a hardwired process. Uh, every organ just moves the right distance in the right direction and you get your, you get your frog. We decided to test that hypothesis and ask actually how, how much uh, competency is in this, in this scheme. And so we created so-called Picasso tadpoles. Uh, everything here is in the wrong place. The eyes off to the side, the mouth is maybe on top of the head, every, every, everything, everything is shifted. And what you find is that remarkably, these animals tend to make pretty normal frogs because all of this stuff will move around through abnormal paths and sometimes go too far and actually have to come back until it gets to a correct frog face and then it stops. So what the genetics actually gives you is uh, a system that can do an error minimization scheme, and uh, it can navigate this morphospace and reach the correct goal from different starting positions. It doesn't just do the same thing every single time. It actually is able to uh, get around, for example, local, local maxima and things like that and, and get to where it's going in morphospace. Um, mammals do this too. If you cut an early embryo in half, you don't get two half embryos. You get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. My favorite example of this kind of thing is this. Uh, this is a, and this is very old work now. Um, this is a cross section through a, a kidney tubule in a in a salamander, and you can see that basically, you know, eight to ten cells normally work together, cell to cell signaling. They they make this lumen. If you force the cells to be a larger size, and you can do these tricks uh, in this in this model, then fewer cells will get together to give you the exact same size lumen. That's pretty cool already. But the best part is, if you make the cells truly gigantic, then one single cell will bend around itself and uh, give you the exact same lumen. Now, now, what's cool about that is this is a great example of top-down causation, because this is a completely different molecular mechanism. This is cell-to-cell -cell communication. This is cytoskeletal bending. So in the service of a large-scale anatomical structure, meaning a particular location within anatomical morphospace, different molecular mechanisms get called up to enable the behavior that gets you to the right place. And so, so, so um, the, the, the microstates and the mechanisms uh, are called up as needed to serve a large scale sort of executive um, kind of um, navigation policy in this, in this space. How, so so how, would, how would, could this possibly work? Well, we have a precedent, of course, and the precedent is the brain and nervous system. So that's exactly what happens uh, in, uh, in, 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 um, in neuroscience, which is that um, we, have, we have large scale cognitive goals, in that case in 
three-dimensional space, which uh, what the nervous system does is, is uh, transduce the, um, uh, that, that level of, of uh, information processing down into the molecular steps that activate your muscles and your glands and everything else. So, uh, so, so you've got this sort of hardware software scheme where the output of these electrical networks drives the movement of your body through three-dimensional space. And then you can do this neural decoding kind of thing where, well, can we learn to read this information and make predictions and so on? But uh, the, the super interesting thing is that this actually, this scheme is incredibly old. It's way older than uh, neurons and brains evolutionarily. Evolution discovered the benefits of electrical networks somewhere around the time of bacterial biofilms. And so actually it's, it's very isomorphic to this system where prior to, to uh, neurons and, uh, and, and, and the nervous systems and, and brains, what, the, what bioelectric networks through the rest of the body did was that they uh, controlled the movement of your body through uh, your body configuration through morphospace. space. Okay, very similar thing, except that what evolution did was pivot uh, from one space into another, and actually in many ways pivoted um, from control of spatial patterns to control of temporal patterns in in, uh, in neural processing. But otherwise, all the same tricks are usable, and all the same techniques are usable. And so, we developed some of the some of the first tools to read and write electrical uh, pattern memories in uh, tissues that were not neurons, but basically we took a lot from, from neuroscience, both conceptually and, and practically. Um, we use optogenetics and uh, active inference frameworks and uh, all, 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 all the same stuff. And so this allows us to do things like this to, to, to specifically try to learn to communicate different morphological paths to groups of cells. So frogs, unlike salamanders, do not regenerate their legs. And through asking what kind of a signal would convince these cells to go down the uh, build a leg uh, trajectory versus the uh, scar and stop trajectory, we were able to come up with a very simple trigger, literally lasts just one day. And what it does is it induces leg regeneration for of over a year and a half. We, we're not there 3D printing it. We're not there um, you know, managing stem cells. Our job is right at the beginning to convince this group of cells that what they're going to be doing is embarking on this particular path through morphospace. And so what happens is, Within 45 days, you've got all you've got your regenerative uh, genes, you've got your toes, you've got a toenail, and eventually you get a pretty pretty respectable looking leg that's both touch sensitive and motile. So, um, and this of course we're now we're now pushing this into rodents. I, I have to do a disclosure here because uh, Dave Kaplan and I are um, co-founders of of this company that's going to try to move this towards patients. But the idea here is to learn to communicate with this cellular collective to understand what does it measure, what can it sense in morphospace. And what are the efficient stimuli, the trigger points, that can get it to make the decisions we want to make? I want to show you one, one particular example. What you're seeing here is this is, this is our uh, method of visualizing bioelectrical gradients in vivo. So we call this the electric face. This was uh, first uh, made by my colleague Danny Adams um, in, in our group. And, and what you can see here is that before the genes come on to pattern the face and before the anatomy, Already, you can see where everything is going to be. Here's where the mouth is going to be. Here's the eye. Here are the placodes. This is what you're seeing is resting potential. This is a dye that reports resting potential. And so we, we even before we had seen this, this, this pattern, we had asked the simple question, could we reproduce these kinds of patterns elsewhere in the body and convince cells to build a completely different organ? And so here, this is an early uh, experiment by my uh, grad student, Sherry Au. And what she did was inject uh, potassium channel RNA into specific cells to, 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 to induce this kind of bioelectrical state. And sure enough, uh, you can make an eye anywhere. In fact, outside of the region that's normally thought to be the only one competent to make eyes, you can do this anywhere. You can do it on the tail, in the gut, anywhere you want. And of course, we're not providing enough information to specify an eye. These eyes have lens and retina and optic nerve and all that, all that kind of stuff. We don't have to specify any of that. What we have to do is, is give the collective here a pattern that basically, it's a subroutine call. It's a pattern that says, build an eye here. And there are other patterns for hearts and, and legs and brains and, and various other things. And one of the cool, uh, so, so, so that's, that, that's kind of neat. But one of the cool um, competencies here is this. This is a lens sitting out in the flank of a tail somewhere. What you'll notice is that uh, the blue cells, so these are marked by a genetic uh, tracer, uh, the blue cells are the ones that have our ion channel. These are all wild type cells. What happens here is two levels of instruction. We instruct these cells, you need to make an eye. They can somehow perceive that there's not enough of them to do the job, and they end up 
communicating and recruiting their neighbors. So these are the perfectly normal wild type neighbors that get pulled away from their task of making skin and muscle and various other things and induced now into this eye building project of exactly the right shape and size. It's uh, possibly parallels with um, uh, recruitment in, uh, in, in insect swarms and you know, ants and termites and things like that. Uh, so so there's, some, there's some really interesting dynamics and decision making here that's, that's, that's multi-level. And the other example um, that I just wanted to show you was was planaria. So these are the these are our flatworms. I told you they're extremely reliable. But one thing that we want to do, if we believe that uh, the morphogenetic um, process involves a collective intelligence of these cells building things, we want to be able to read and write the memories of this uh, collective intelligence. And so we uh, characterize the electric circuit that determines head number. Because once you cut off the head and the tail, this middle fragment has to decide how many heads should a proper planarian have, one, two, zero, maybe more. And so what we were able to do is this. Uh, by reading the electrical pattern, this is the electrical pattern that says one head, one tail. We can change that pattern. This is done with ion channel uh, drugs, no, no electric fields, no electrodes. This is manipulating the native um, interface that these cells are exposing. And so what you get is uh, you can say two, two heads here. If It's kind of messy still. The technology is being worked out. And what this, what this fragment will then do is build a two-headed animal. This is not Photoshop. These are real um, two-headed animals. And here's the most important part. This electrical map is not a map of this creature down here. This electrical map is a map of this guy who will not do anything different. Still, one head, one tail, normal uh, gene expression. But if you injure him, if you cut the head and tail, this is the memory that these cells will use to determine what a correct planarian looks like, and then they will build. It's a counterfactual memory. It's a representation of something that might be true later. It's definitely not true now. And it's a, it's a kind of a latent memory. And, I, and, so, and so the planarian body can hold one of two different, probably a lot more, but we found two different uh, representations of what a normal planarian looks like. And we can, and we can rewrite it at will. Um, here they are, these, these two-headed worms. The reason I call this a memory is because if you take these two-headed worms and cut them, uh, cut them again in plain water, no more manipulation, they continue to regenerate to the new shape. So it's got all the properties of memory. It's long-term stable, but it's rewritable. It has conditional recall, which I just showed you, and there are discrete possible behaviors. And so the question of how many heads should a planarian have is actually, it's a subtle, where is that information? Well, it's not in the genome. What the genome gives you is a piece of electrical hardware that by default, reliably generates the memory for one head, but it doesn't have to be that way. And the very last thing um, I want to show you, and then, and then I'll stop, is, is this, this uh, synthetic uh, kind of project where we really want to understand where do these morphogenetic goals come from? Um, the standard answer is, is evolution, but uh, we want to see, and again, this is, this is work with um, Joshua Bongard, uh, Doug Blackiston did all the biology, Sam Kriegman did uh, the programming, and uh, uh, this is uh, in our uh, ICDO um, Institute. So uh, what we wanted to do was, was to ask a question about plasticity of, of these cells. So we took a frog embryo, Xenopus lavis, Doug uh, collected some of these skin cells from the uh, animal cap, um, dissociated them, let them reassociate in a little, in a little uh, uh, pile here. What could they do? Well, they could die. They could spread out and go away from each other. They could form a two-dimensional monolayer. Instead, what they do is, uh, overnight, they, uh, they coalesce like this, and they make uh, this little thing we call a, uh, we call a xenobot for Xenopus lavis and biobot. So you can see what it's doing. It moves because it has little cilia. Normally, these are used to redistribute mucus on the surface of the frog. But uh, this thing can use them to move around. They can go in circles. They can patrol back and forth. They can have collective behaviors, um, all sorts of uh, different uh, behaviors. Here's what they look like navigating a maze. So, um, so here it is. Uh, it's going to take this turn here without actually bumping into the opposite wall. So he takes the turn. And then at this point, for some reason, we don't know uh, why it decides to turn around and go back where it came from. So they have a, a wide variety of behaviors. Uh, you can do calcium imaging. They have a very rich set of signals, and we can start to ask, use, use all the tools from, from uh, behavioral neuroscience to ask uh, what, what kind of information integration is happening. Are they actually communicating? Is there mutual information? Um, stay tuned for that. But remember, there are no neurons here. This is just skin. And so this is, this is what skin does when left to its own devices. Here's one last thing that it does. Um, if you give these guys loose material, so these are just uh, loose skin cells sitting, you know, we just sprinkle them. What we find is that these, these xenobots, uh, their motion 
is able to cor corral these cells into little piles, and then they continue to polish these little piles and sort of put, push them together. And because they're working with an agential material, these are not passive particles, these are cells. And so we as engineers, evolution, and xenobots are all working in this agential material. So what they do is they make these little piles, the little piles mature, and become the next generation of xenobots. Well, what do they do? They run around and do exactly the same thing, and now you've got the next generation and the one after that. It's sort of von Neumann's dream of a robot um, making copies of itself from, uh, from materials it finds. So we call this kinematic replication. And so uh, the last thing I just want to point out is this. Um, th this is the, the genome of Xenopus lavis. That's what's in these cells. We didn't add any genes. There are no synthetic circuits. There are no nanomaterials. So now the question is, what does the genome uh, actually specify? Well, under default conditions, it specifies this developmental sequence and some tadpole behavior. But actually, if you engineer by subtraction, if you take away the influence of a whole bunch of cells, you get to find out what the skin cell really wants to be doing. It, it, the, the normal sort of boring two-dimensional life that it has on the outside of the organism is, is what it does when it's behavior shaped by the other cells. Remove that and you find out what the default behavior is. The default behavior is this. Xenobot, a weird developmental sequence. You know, a few weeks later, it turns into this. We have no idea what this is, completely new. Uh, and then they have this, uh, this kinematic self-replication behavior. So unlike all the other creatures we all study, they have no straightforward evolutionary backstory. There's never been selection to be a good xenobot. Of course, the frog cells were, were selected, but, uh, but, but, but they have novel morphological and behavioral outcomes that, are, that don't have a straightforward story. And we're still working to understand what the cognitive capacities are. So I'll just end by saying that because biology, uh, you know, as I showed you in the kidney tubule example and others, you, the, the embryo really doesn't uh, have firm expectations uh, or assumptions about what's going to happen. You don't know what, how many cells you're going to have. You don't know what size your cells are going to be. You don't know what your genetics are going to be like. Uh, and uh, evolution makes these amazing problem-solving machines that will do something adaptive in a wide range of circumstances. And that means that almost any combination of evolved material, designed material, and software is some kind of agent. So you've got uh, cyborgs and hybrids and, and, and all kinds of synthetic uh, beings. Everything that Darwin was talking about when he said endless forms most beautiful is a tiny corner of this enormous option space of beings. And what that means is that in the future, when we're surrounded by these things, and I firmly believe that we will be, uh, the old um, criteria by which we decided how we relate to something, which is what are you made of and how did you get here, meaning evolved or designed, those, those, are not, those criteria are not going to survive the next decade or two. That's, we, we, need, we need a completely different basis for ethics to learn to relate to organisms that are very different from us. Um, so I will just um, end here because I'm already running out of time. Uh, just to thank the, uh, all the postdocs and, and students who did this work, um, our funders, um, the animals uh, who do all the, all the heavy lifting in this, uh, in this kind of work, and um, uh, uh, the two disclosures for uh, commercial relationships. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Michael, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Yep. So I will be conveying the questions that the audience uh, has, and I would like to ask the audience to keep them short and simple. We have time maybe for two questions. And I cannot see hands. Ah, there are two hands maybe there. Hello, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I just have one little point to make, and that is to do with your very first slide. Um, you said that to begin with, it's all physics, and thereafter processes take place, biological processes. Uh, the point is that life comes from life. Uh, there were two living organisms, certainly in terms of sperm and egg, so it's not a case of just physics. I wonder what you have to say about that. So could you hear the question? Or, or no, I apologize. I couldn't hear any no of that. So it uh, goes back to your first slide that you said the first there was physics and then biology <laughs> kind of kicks in. And the comment is like everything in life starts from life, so from the egg. Um, and what do you think the role? Uh, like, would you like to comment on that? What do you mean by everything starts with physics? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so of course, uh, 
the, the line between living and non-living is uh, not a sharp line. There are many people doing some very interesting work on really minimal systems that have important uh, aspects of self-organization and uh, problem solving that you probably wouldn't call alive. Honestly, uh, I don't spend very much time uh, trying to uh, get a definition of life. I know other people do, and um, I'm, no, I'm not an expert on that. But uh, to me, uh, the spectrum of intelligence, including very, very basal uh, examples that you wouldn't call alive, are, I, think, I think that spectrum is more interesting than the li live, uh, not live, uh, uh, you know, kind of a distinction. And I think that uh, there are many things that are going to have degrees, including very basic things, but also more complex things, that we should be considering as, uh, as important intelligent agents that do not overlap with the set of living agents. And I think that's the more important criterion. Thank you. Is there a second one? Short, please. There are a couple of hands here. Um, just a question about the idea of self-replication. Uh, um, in this example, it seemed that uh, the cells needed to be provided to, to create what could be otherwise interpreted as maybe an incidental um, self-replication, whereas I imagine in most other systems that are considered self-replicating, the materials for that replication must also be acquired. So I just wonder if you can comment on this distinction between uh, materials being provided and materials being acquired. Right. So the question is about uh, cell replication in the examples that you showed uh, and whether the materials need to be provided or acquired and what do we actually mean in the end by self-replication? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, I, yeah, great question. Uh, I think like with everything else that I've been talking about, um, self-replication is a continuum. So this is an extremely minimal self-replicating system. It is not a full uh, kind of, uh, you, you wouldn't call this a full replicating organism. For example, it does not have strong heredity. So all of the bots that are made don't bear more resemblance to their parents than they do to random members of the population. So there's not, a, there's not that element of strong heredity here. Um, you're absolutely right. The cells, the material must be provided by us. So these, these bots uh, will not go out and, you know, uh, bite little cells off of some other, you know, source to, to release them, although they, they could be made to do so. And if they were evolvable, maybe at some point they would do that. Um, as far as I know, no other creature on earth does this kind of kinematic replication. So, so we see this as a very minimal uh, kind of example along the continuum of self-replication that starts with, with nothing and ends with a full um, kind of uh, completely autonomous replication cycle that some advanced, uh, you know, life forms are able to do. So this is this is somewhere in between, and for sure they must be provided with these cells. They they will not uh, acquire these cells by themselves. Great, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And at this point, uh, we can move on to our next speaker. Uh, so thank you once again for being with us, albeit virtually. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.
for the Economist, uh, Bloom Bloomberg Business, uh, and the Guardian, among many, many, many others. Uh, I could go on about uh, Anil's uh, very impressive public outreach and science communication uh, presence, but by this point, I'm sure you are sick and tired of my own presence, so I will be leaving the stage, I will be waiving my uh, chairing rights, uh, and I hope you enjoy uh, the panel discussion that will uh, ensue. Thank you. Thank you so much, George, for the kind intro, and thank you. I just want to, uh, on behalf of me and Jamie, I'm sure Jamie already said at the outset of the morning, but Jamie and I, the co-directors of the Leverhulme program, we did absolutely nothing to put this uh, wonderful symposium together. It was all done by the students on the program, and it's been really a, a marvelous day. I've, I've, I've been thrilled with the diversity and range of talks, and I'm very excited to moderate this upcoming panel discussion, though I have no idea how we're going to bring it all together this extraordinary diversity that we've had. Before we get going, I'm just going to abuse my privileges and take two minutes to tell you about um, not only different umwelts between uh, different kinds of life, but also, of course, we humans, we all have different brains, and we all experience the world in slightly different ways, too. And we have this, this new project called the Perception Census, which is a large-scale online citizen science attempt to map out this hidden terrain of our inner diversity, of how we each experience the world in a unique way. Now, we know something about this from some studies of indiv individual differences in perception, but they tend to be focused on just one or two aspects. And we also know about neurodiversity, that, that people have neurodivergent conditions um, where they experience the world in quite different ways. Uh, but what this tends to overlook is that everybody experiences the world differently. We all have our own unique umwelt, if you like. And so this perception census is trying to map out many different aspects of perception at the same time. Vision, time, our um, sense of sound and music and rhythm, our beliefs, our emotional states. And try and put these all together to bring to the surface um, this, this hidden diversity. I think that's a very interesting thing to do. Uh, we've already had more than 20,000 people take part from over 100 countries in every continent apart from Antarctica. Um, there are 10 different sections. All you need is your own computer and to be over 18 for ethics purposes. Uh, if you would love, if you were interested in taking part or helping us spread the word about it, I'd be very grateful. Uh, one of our uh, leading researchers on this project, Renny Baikova, is also here today, and she'd be very grateful too. So have a go at the Perception Census, and let's understand how life perceives among the human race too. Now, with that, I will stop the promo, and... Um, I'd love to bring back the panel for this afternoon. So if I could invite up first, uh, in order of their presentation, uh, Daniel Osorio, who gave us a wonderful uh, presentation about camouflage, color vision, and the, just the wonder of cuttlefish. So yeah, please take a seat. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, actually extending back to this morning, very grateful for Alex Jordan, who's gonna join this afternoon's panel as well. Um, I was absolutely blown away by his description of mirror self-recognition in fish. And then we also have Katie Bentley, who gave a mind-blowing talk about angiogenesis, and it was just wonderful to see the Sussex core intellectual principles transforming and revolu revolutionizing other fields. And then, <laughs> as a special guest surprise, we have Paul Graham. Uh, Professor Paul Graham, he's been at Sussex about as long as me, which is forever, and he's a leading expert on all things ant, bee, insect, and he's going to give us a perspective of life perceived from the, the insect world, and you're not, you're not missing it. He didn't give a talk, so you didn't miss it, uh, but he's going to contribute his, his wonderful expertise now, and this is because, because for technical reasons, the people who are presenting by Zoom... Uh, well, some of them couldn't even present by Zoom, but even those that did present by Zoom can't join us on the panel. So, welcome to the panel.
Okay, so we have about we have about an hour actually. So the way I want to do this is to going to start off with a couple of questions for the panel from me. But then, of course, the really interesting part will be to open it up to you guys, and you can ask you can ask questions to the panel as a whole, or also follow up with individual points to each of our wonderful speakers as well. So the first question I'd like to start with this day has been about perception in all its glory. And what's striking is the range of different systems that have been talked about. So from each of you, I'd like you just to tell us, in the context of your own work, what perception and sensation mean to you. And I want to start with Paul. And maybe, Paul, you can also just give us a little intro, very informal little intro about the work that you do. Yeah, OK. Uh, so yeah, it's nice to piggyback on the, on the day's event and get a little glory at the end. Uh, so I'm interested in the animal cognition in general, but most of my work has been on uh, perception and control of behaviour in insects, and specifically tasks like navigation, where we see striking similarities all across the animal kingdom. And one of the themes I noted today was attempts to bridge not just across the animal kingdom, but across uh, the whole kingdoms of life in the concepts and the ideas that we talk about. But specifically for me, I think... Uh, I would just steal some words that actually came from Daniel's talk earlier, is that everything I think about is this idea of the inability to separate out perception and action, uh, and therefore I'm thinking about uh, perception in terms of what it allows you to do uh, and what behaviours are permissible, and so that leads into a kind of a loop, I suppose, the classic act active sense that we saw really beautifully, uh, not just in animals but also in cells. Uh, and so it's not so much a definition of perception, it's more of the way in which I think of perception as I'm studying it, I suppose. Katie. Yeah, so um, working at the cell level, I think we end up having to be really careful about how we use the term sensing and perception, um, essentially to the level of not using the word perception, because biologists, cell biologists, are quite or can be quite traditional and don't really like human level words. Yeah, this is a safe space, so you can use, Which, you can yeah. use whatever <laughs> words you want. <laughs> I know, and this is why it's great, you know, being somewhere like this, because, and you were sort of talking about this a bit, the reluctant scientists, because when you go to like really hardcore biology conferences, you've got to be really careful how you describe what you're really working on, which is this stuff. And coming from a perception action, you know, background, that's very natural to me to, to, but maybe that's part of the reason they do this. I think it's important that I will project that on the system, perhaps because I've been trained to think about things in terms of perception action, but it doesn't mean it's really there. So it's a safe th safer thing in the traditional biology world to just talk about sensation and, and motor response and things. So I, I've been framing it in terms of sensory motor coordination, um, but really thinking it's probably perception. But the, uh, but, so I was looking up the definition of perception actually. <laughs> Whilst, uh, whilst here thinking, what do people really think it means? So there's two definitions, actually, if you just Google it quickly. And, and one is, it's just some, basically something you get through your senses. And then the other one is about understanding. And I think that's the bigger one, isn't it? it does, and that's the one that the cell biologists find tricky. So has the cell understood something about its world? And then you could call that perception. Um, and that's the bit, obviously, it's difficult to measure that. But so, so just to sort of... So, so I would break it down as the receptor activation on the cell surface is sensing, and it's very specific. It's a sensor activating. But if you remember that diagram I showed right at the end, the classic biological pathways, they, and then because biologists love signaling pathways, basically, so it was all signaling pathways. Um, but they are interconnected networks, and there are hubs in them, in the signaling networks. There are these key molecular players that act as hubs in a network, and they then kick off certain specific gene expression changes. And for me, that's where perception could actually be. So it's not at the receptor sensing level, but it's something further down when it starts to integrate all of the different sensors that have activated all at once, because there's actually lots of crosstalk between the different receptors. There's lots of different signals coming in. So the cell has to presumably integrate all of that information into a right, an understanding of, right, I should respond with this response. You know what I mean? So, so for me, there is, a, there, is a, there is room in cells for perception. Okay. Great, thank you. Alex? I will not try to provide any kind of definitions or, or perspectives on definitions, um, but 
in my work and in, in the goals of the research we do, one element is to try and embrace the chaotic and far-ranging nature of perception um, and sensing that occurs in naturally complex environments. I think this is a challenge that we uh, avoid necessarily um, often in the sciences to um, minimize confounding factors, to, to try and understand uh, linear input-output kind of uh, relationships. Um, but what I come to realize in, in the practice of working uh, in the wild uh, and in challenging conditions is that we are greatly challenged in understanding um, what might be being sensed or perceived in our focal animals by limitations, as actually one of the questions uh, that, that, that we had earlier, by focusing on, on the visual um, uh, for, for reasons that you know, we are primarily visual animals um, and much of our equipment is based on visual input. Um, but in, in understanding that we can't even accurately predict what an animal is responding to, for instance, if it, if it behaves in a certain way in, in a natural context, you start to perhaps question um, whether animals or, or, or even other um, organisms are consciously aware of what they're perceiving in a sense. And, and this, this, this point about understanding is a very interesting one and, and challenging one because I would say a lot of um, the responses, the behavioral responses that we might be observing in, in our study organisms and maybe in ourselves are not driven by an understanding of what we've perceived uh, at all, um, but we are influenced nonetheless perhaps by things we're not, I mean certainly, as, as we know in human studies, certainly by things we're not even uh, consciously aware that we're uh, perceiving. So I think that would be my take on it, that there, there is a world that these things we study exist in um, and we must be conscious of the limitations in ourselves as the observers, but also in the, the focal um, organisms um, in, uh, in what parts of, let's say, an adaptive landscape or a sensory landscape that they actually have access to, either in a conscious or a subconscious uh, way. Right, I'm glad you, well, I'm not sure I'm glad, but thank you for dropping the, the C word in there already. I was going to come to that a bit later, just noting how controversial perception by itself can be in some contexts. But we're going we're gonna to get to that, you know, wh whether these cells in blood vessels can be conscious too. But before going that far, Danny. Well, I, I really have trouble with, with the word perception because I'm highly instrumental in my approach to uh, life. And about 15 years ago, I put in a, a grant proposal where I referred to the way in which poultry chicks perceive the world. And I was told by the, somebody on the panel, a well-known Oxford professor of ethology, that he didn't know what perception meant, and so he wasn't going to fund the grant. And, uh, <laughs> oh, thereafter, I've avoided using it. Um, I don't quite know what it means. There's uh, textbooks in psychology that distinguish between sensation and, and perception, and I understood sensation to be one's raw experience of a sensory, sensory stimulus, sometimes referred to as qualia, and... Um, Perception is how one's beginning, beginning to build these sensory experiences into um, some sort of internal model of, of the world, but probably comes from William James or someone like that, and I, I don't know more about it. Otherwise, as Paul says, there's a traditional distinction between perception and action, which is highly problematic, um, that we find quite a lot in, in uh, psychology literature. So it's a word I don't use very much until I came to this meeting. Okay, well, I don't know whether you've been persuaded to use it more now, um, having listened to all these talks. I mean, so one, just, just, I know we don't want to get too hung up on de definitions, but I just, f let me offer one distinction to see whether that, that lands. And the distinction that often comes to my mind when thinking especially about the human case and, and mammals, which I'm more familiar with, is that you know, sensation might be sensitivity to some stimulus in the environment, but by some sort of maybe adaptive 
rule, something like that. But indeed, I think as has been mentioned, the idea of perception suggests something more. It, it's, as Katie, as you said, it's something to do with, and it's, it's something to do with understanding, it's interpretation, it's going beyond the information in the raw sensory signal in some way. You know, in, in the human case, we often think about you know, perception as, as a sort of some understanding of the causal basis of the signals that come in rather than just the response to the signal. And so one, what, you know, one thing that always comes to my mind is that as you sort of unravel the circuits that are involved, you know, what we might think of perception just becomes some more complicated form of sensation. Um, so just wondering how this, this lands with you, and, and here I'm not going to go through in order or any, any more, I just want people to, to jump in and, and maybe you know, come back on, on each other's points as well in this whole, this whole thing, because I know it's a word that causes some discomfort, but you know, this is what the symposium's about, so we're going to get to the bottom of it. How does sensation and perception, in that view that I've suggested, how does that sit with you? So, so you're saying that in perception, you're beginning to build a, mo a model of the world, so it's like an intermediate stage to what I understand as a cognitive representation. Yeah, you can take it like that. that we didn't like in, in the good old days at Sussex. I was going to say that. that <laughs> the idea of internal representation... Times have changed, Casey. They do that. seem to have changed, yeah. I was definitely taught not to use that, word, that phrase. Um, but, I mean, uh, yeah, I think... Um, it, it certainly resonates with me with the way that this, this in, if you start looking at the complexity of these internal signaling um, chemical reactions and networks that are triggered by the initial sensation, it's, um, it's almost exactly like the sort of drawings of a, of a brain network, you know, neural network with lots of inputs and then and, and, and the same. So I think if you're drawing conclusions like that from that system, you, you must be able to draw them in, of the networks going on inside a cell. Yeah, I think it's reasonable. Whether it's true, I don't know. But it's, it's reasonable to see it like that, I think. Yeah, so I was just trying to think of a way to bridge Annal's more kind of human-centred language on, on the distinction between the two versus the really interesting ideas that Katie was developing as to where she thinks perception is in, in the cell. And I guess, I don't know if there's some way where you could look at the level of the system that you're studying and think, well, if I was in the first layer of the visual system, for instance, I would start with the physics of the input. I would be thinking about what's out there in the world and, and that would be my starting point. But at some point, as you go through, that wouldn't make sense anymore. And all of a sudden, there'd be a point where it would be much more sensible as a scientist to think about what the animal might be trying to do with the information that comes in. Uh, so it could be to do with deciding who gets to grow first or it might be to you know, deciding whether or not the optic flow signal tells me I'm rotating when I didn't want to. And so that would be the transition I think you could see across all sorts of different systems where, you know, it's a very, well, it's kind of a, a pub-based me measure where you would just argue what would you start with if you were studying Is it there. pub-based measure? I did, yeah. Okay. I was trying to think of yeah. the, the general term for, uh, for discussions that don't need to be grounded in as much Thanks. rigor. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But... That, that would be my way of thinking about it, is that perception is when you're thinking about... Because it wouldn't be about building a model of the world, because not all, necessarily not all systems do that, but there is an organisation of what, what the information is used for at some point, which changes your perspective on how you would understand it, I think. And so just to be clear, what, what's on the other side of that transition? So when, when, there's, when there's no influence of, of a goal, so, so yeah, what... Doesn't that, how deep down, how low does that go before something stops being influenced in the way you're suggesting? I'm, I, th I suspect it's something where you would know when you were definitely interested in the trans transduction of a physical signal, and then you, at some point you would know that you were driving behaviour, and then you could argue about exactly when that transition happened or whether it was a continuum, but I think... At either end, you might be comfortable with describing sensation and describing perception, and then in the middle, that's, you know... That's perhaps more difficult, but... I don't know if this is reasonable, but my mind immediately jumps to this, this problem that we, um, we tackle, which is the question of whether a spider's web is part of its sensory system, whether the fact that it creates and can tune the silk um, to be sensitive or less sensitive to certain frequencies, therefore... 
um, makes it part of its uh, its its sensory system, and and that in a in a way allows me to think about this question because the web itself is responding to all vibrations that that it can transmit, um, but it can be changed to ignore some frequencies or amplify some frequencies. And then the spider itself sits on that web and has seismic sensing organs, which are also tuned to block out wind, for example, uh, so it's not behaviorally responding to these, um, these uh, not irrelevant in, in, in its goals. It, it's not, uh, it hasn't been selected for and it does not want in, in some uh, sense to respond to these things. And so, in a way, the web and the spider are sensing things that are not perceived through the mechanical uh, nature of, of the animal and of the web itself. And this, I would use it as some example of how I think about this distinction of, of sensing being perhaps all of the information that's kind of hitting the sensor and then the perception being the, the, the channels that are accepted through. Um, and that doesn't invoke understanding or consciousness. Yeah. I like that extended mind idea that you bring up there with the web. Yeah, I mean, that, that recalls actually another of our Sussex colleagues, uh, Andy Clark, who talked about the extended mind. But, you know, I think as many of his examples talk about memory on your phone and things like this. But, yeah, the spider's web being extended sensory aspect of the mind makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, so is that, I mean, do you think then there's a sort of danger of, of using these terms like sensation and perception because they connote things that are very hard to dissociate from their, their anchoring in our human experience? You know, we think, of, we think of sensation, as you said, we sort of think of sensory experience sometimes and we think of perception as understanding. So are we, is, is it a mistake to try and use the same vocabulary to, to unify all these different phenomena that you've described. Um, does that just, is it too general? I, I think it's a really good idea because it makes you, it forces you to have to see the links and unification and the differences, but it has to be defined at first use. And then you don't. Then you. Then you're all right. I think. You know. And just thinking about talking to the cell biologists. You know. If I say, look, perception by which I mean this, specifically, um, which is the way it's used in this system. In this system, I can see in this system. You can. You can link it up, and it's really clear. But if you just say it feels like the cell's perceiving, and you don't define what you mean, then you. Then you just can get lost in it. Well, that person's view of what perception means is different to that person's in the audience, and so already you've not really spoken to everyone. But I, I mean, I really agree with, with trying to see these similarities across scales. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it's dangerous as long as it's clear what you mean. Yeah, I mean, one thing that struck me about, about your presentation, right at the end, you had, you mentioned it already, this diagram of, of cell signaling, which, as you explained it, just maps straight onto the old sense, think, act. Yeah, um, thing exactly. from cognitive science, which, which, yeah. you know, and it never it hadn't occurred to me that they may be falling into the same they've kind got, of exactly the same of history of um, problems. Yeah, so I, I've actually realised that so when I talk to psycholo psychologists that are from the sort of classical cognitive psychology, but yeah, and they don't really get embodiment, right? And then because it's always yeah, input, decision, output, behaviour, and I realised when I started talking to biologists that's how they view the world. They haven't made that paradigm shift quite yet that but some people have but it's not often and then I've I've presented this at biology conferences and then oh I see all oh, the actions first because it is quicker it's just it has to be first and then it leaves room for it to inform the decision with movement and with behavior so what would be taking it the other direction now um, what would be the implications from what you study for our understanding of, of human sensation and perception Anybody want to take that? I just thought of it. I haven't prepared these questions. I would riff on, on something you said in your introduction, which is that we each have a subjective experience that is differentiated and diverse. And I think the more we study um, diverse forms of life and, and see how they interface with the world, 
um, it, it just reinforces this idea that there is no single, well, definition, but there is also no single phenomenon that we're describing. Um, they can be grouped and, and, and differentiated at some um, level of discretion or sensitivity, as you wish, um, but um, I would, I am, I'm continually reminded as, as we study different organisms of the diversity of, of experiences, um, and I think that just reinforces and, um, and validates the, the, the diversity of experience that we find in humans. Yes, I mean, up only, only, only so far as Dar Darwin replaced a, wor a worldview of at least a sort of Christian Western worldview of Earth created by God for the benefit of, of human senses and indeed aesthetics with, with one that evolved under natural selection with the beauty of birds and butterflies and flowers and so on, not to mention you know, landscapes and things that you were, you were talking about. Um, you know, having come through evolution and natural selection, what's remarkable, you know, is, was to a big problem to Darwin because he couldn't then easily explain these similarities that we also heard from um, Lucia's, Lucia's talk as well. And I think that much of the way in which we perceive the world and, and act in it and, and so on, and the way that our sensory systems are set up, indeed, is, in, is constrained by the structure of, of the world that we have and that other organisms have, and it's much is, much is shared. And so there, there are different umwelts, of course, but not maybe as different as we might imagine. Hmm. Or can imagine. I mean, you, you, you mentioned that uh, the, the examples you give, landscapes, butterflies, birds, these are beautiful to us, but presumably they're not beautiful to a spider. And so I wonder how much of the commonality we see is filtered through our own perceptory, lim percepts, perceptory limitations. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it only goes, it only goes so, so far. This reminds me, I don't know if whether any of you have read or any of you in the audience have read Ed Yong's book, um, recent book, An Immense World. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal book, I think. He's a great writer. And he starts off with this uh, scenario of, I think it's a barn or something. Some, and there's, I think, I'm trying to remember now, there's a large animal in the barn. Maybe it's a, it's a horse or something. And there's a mosquito. And there's an owl. And there's a bat. And they're all sort of doing their thing. And he just... He just plays out how this, this common shared objective reality might appear differently to the, to the, to the bat obviously echolocating around, the, the mouse sensing carbon dioxide levels or something, or whether it's, you know, whether it's safe to be out there. And it was just, it just, it just um, maybe it's the extreme point of unvelt diversity that it's showing for, for something apparently so simple how radically different uh, the, the umwelts can be. Um, now, I'm going to just ask a couple more questions, and I want to open it up to, to the audience. And, and the next one, and they're related, but you know, my interest is in consciousness. And so I can't resist the opportunity now to having provoked a little bit with perception. So really, if we're talking about perception in all these, these contexts, to what extent do you think the system that you're studying has actual experiences associated with its perception or sensation. What can we know about the extent of consciousness um, when we go far away from the human, as far away as even a single cell in a blood vessel, or a plant, as Paco Calvo was saying, or a, or, um, a xenobot, as Mike Levin's beautiful talk illustrated? How wide is the circle of consciousness? Danny. So, I don't, know. I don't know very much about consciousness. I think one can take a kind of adaptive functional approach to consciousness and say, what is it, it useful, useful for? Um, and then perhaps make some, some progress. So if you're 
reflecting on your mental representations or your state of being, and that has some adaptive purpose, then you can begin to see how one might investigate consciousness in these systems. I think that's about as much as I'm prepared to say. <laughs> okay, I won't. Maybe I won't. that's nothing at all, but <laughs> definitely a functional approach is a way forward. Okay, but let, okay, let, so given your functional approach to cuttlefish, what do you think about cuttlefish? Do, does anything you've seen there about their their behaviour, their extraordinary abilities in camouflage, does that suggest to you that there's any conscious experience happening or is it just not something you can address with those kinds of tools and experiments? Not, not in the type of work that we, that we do with them. And I think that the sort of behaviours I was talking about, although they are, they are very rich in the senses that I talked about, there's a high degree of power um, many degrees of freedom, millions of motor neurons and all, all, the, re all the rest of it, actually this is a system that is probably doesn't need to invoke much in the way of the sort of functional consciousness that we've talked about. Having said that, there's other work done on cephalopods, including by Nicky Clayton, I think, um, where that may become much more, more relevant. So I just don't do that much work myself, and I don't really know much about the studies that are done. Alex, I mean, you talked about uh, fish mirror self-recognition, so you have a view on this? I, I have a view, um, but I suppose in line with what we discussed earlier, I think these terms are very useful because they, because of how ambiguous they often are, or, or the different interpretations of the term, you need in a in a scientific realm, but also in in just a, a sort of intellectual exchange, to um, set some boundaries or, or or provide your own definition. And so I would say that if if consciousness is the perceived subjective experience of an individual, then of course, no question. Uh, that, that's, that's almost a useless definition because it goes all the way. Um, but if, if consciousness is, for example, that you experience something and you integrate that experience into previous experiences um, and then act upon your interpretation of that experience in light of other experiences you've had. Um, you know, th this, is, this is a workable um, hypothesis to test, and then absolutely, fish do this. I can reel off, you know, trivia, but, you know, they, they can remember fights they've had with individuals for five days and then they apparently forget those fights and, and retest the boundaries. Now whether that's actually forgetting or it's just adaptive retesting of social relationships is, is a question. Um, and I mean any kind of learning which of course many organisms uh, can do is in a, in a way setting current experience against integrated previous experience. Now, now if that's consciousness then yes. Um, and so you see I'm completely dodging the question um, by defining something away. No, but I think, I mean, you, I think what you bring to the surface is, is important, as Danny did, that it, it is a word that means different things to different people. It has, so I didn't offer my own definition because I didn't want to put you in a straitjacket about it, but I think it's useful to, yeah, to do exactly that. And so on your definition, and so let me actually wrap this, the final question in, and, and Danny, feel free to come back on it as well, is, is whether because um, these two things often go together, but I've also been wondering about the ethical implications of, of the, the work that's been described here, you know, the extent to which knowing about the, the surprising sensory and perceptual abilities of the systems that you've, you've explored carry any ethical implications. The, the, the fish case, there's been an active debate about, for instance, whether fish consciously feel pain or, or not, um, because fish have as you know much better than me, lagged behind in animal welfare treatment compared to many other creatures um, that have similarly sophisticated behavior. So maybe you want to speak a little bit to, to the ethical question too. Yeah, I um, actually had a, a conversation uh, just outside in, in the break about, about this, this fact that, that 
fish are one of the few wild hunted animals that we regularly eat. Um, and the way we hunt them and kill them is is horrific. I mean, they are they are dragged up out of the depths. Uh, their swim bladders expand, their organs are pushed, I mean, it gets quite graphic. Um, they're terrified, they feel fear. We, we know these things because they avoid fearful um, situations. And then they're dumped out on a, a, a boat's um, deck to suffocate in fear and agony. I mean, this is the reality of it. Um, but because fish don't have directed gaze, foveated regions, they don't have faces that we, we can sort of um, empathize with. Um, it's easy, I think, to ignore that in a completely non-scientific, non-factual way. It's, it's, it's just this intuitive sense, well, they don't look like they, there's much going on inside their heads. And, and I can stand up and give you know, lists of, of all the things that they can do and feel and experience, and it just doesn't hit. And honestly, and this might sound strange, that's okay. Because our decisions about the ways we treat things are our own. Um, and if we decide that these animals are not as deserving of, of compassion as others, if that's your perspective, then I, I don't know that factual things can, well, I don't believe what I'm saying, actually, now that I say it. I think you should care, but, but I understand that people don't. Right. Um, I just find it quite bizarre that there's conversations about whether hamsters in Switzerland can be kept uh, as single pets or need to be kept in pairs because they're social animals while we happily massacre tuna. I mean, it just, yeah. these things just don't line up in any There's universe. a radical inconsistency, isn't yes. there, to our, to our ethical concerns here. Um, but I think it's a really interesting point about the lack of directed gaze. You know, whatever the ground truth of fish consciousness is, you know, the, 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 our, our natural affinity to attribute it, it's interesting to delineate the factors at play there. Can I just yeah. ask you a question then? So... Um, is that how it works? Jeremy, Jer Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham, who, you know, really set out the question of animal welfare well, when he said the question is not can they reason, can they speak, but can they suffer? And I've actually worked quite extensively on the question of cephalopod um, welfare because it was uh, required under changes for the law. We had to come up with yeah. best practice for, for cephalopod welfare so scientists could then be compliant with, with it. So we were setting the rules of our own game, whatever one may think about that, and I completely agree with what you say, Alex. So there's an excellent book by Victoria Braith Braithwaite, who sadly died uh, three or four years ago, on Can Fish Feel Pain, where she sort of goes through the evidence and this nice work on crustaceans and so on. But, you know, the question to you is, what's the relationship between suffering and consciousness? Then we get to the really problematic issue as to whether there's different levels of suffering. So we might, you know, one of Paul's ads or some Drosophila or something like that, say, well, they only have a lower level of consciousness, so they only have a lower level of suffering, so we can do things to them mm -hmm. that we prefer not to do to a mouse or a chimpanzee. Mm. It's a very good question. I mean, I think there's at least two, two things to unpack in it. One is, the last point about are there different levels of suffering? And to my mind, I think there are. There, there could very well be. Not so much necessarily in intensity, but in the situations that might invoke it. So, for instance, if, you, if an organism has a, you know, the ability to engage in mental time travel, um, then it can anticipate future suffering you know, in a way that animals without that cognitive capacity cannot. It's like the difference between... Um, being sad and being disappointed and having regret. There was this fascinating paper about whether rats feel regret um, because of their sort of proactive, or not, they're sort of looking back at a decision that went badly in a, in a way that suggested that they were considering, oh shit, I should have done, should have pressed that nose poke thing. Um, so I think there, there might, be, might be different levels, and this, this does play into animal welfare in the sense that if you're going to you know, raise animals for food, then 
even if you end up killing them, it matters that you give them a good life in, in the meantime because they may not be aware of what's going to happen to them. So I think there, are, there could be different levels. But then the key question is what's the relationship between suffering and pain? Now, I'm, I agree with, with, with uh, Bentham's sort of foundation of utilitarianism in that, that statement, but it's like where in consciousness we often talk about distinctions between conscious and unconscious perception. And in vision, for instance, there's a whole tradition of showing that we can be affected by visual stimuli without that being uh, assimilated into a conscious experience. Whether the same thing goes for pain is, is very much more controversial, at least as far as I'm aware, even in the human case. Um, you know, we can clearly have pain experiences that don't depend on nociceptor activation, um, but, but whether there's such thing as a whole organism pain response that doesn't invoke any subjective experience of pain is, is I don't know the answer to that. You have all these converging evidence lines, though. In fish, as you were describing, there's all these fascinating experiments of, of, of you know, you can, I think you can give fish something that would be activate nociception in fish, and then you put them in tanks, one of which has some analgesic in it, the other doesn't, and they will go to the tank with analgesic in, even if it's barren and, and, and just unattractively lit or something, so they will actively seek out at some cost uh, anesthetic. So that, but it, that doesn't sort of lock the case down, it just, it's just a piece of conversion evidence that yes, you see a similarity in that system to a system that you know, we're always extrapolating from, from the human. And I think this is the fundamental challenge, how far can we extrapolate from the human and in some cases, we're, we're making our best guesses and we're applying the precautionary principle in ways that seem somewhat sensible. But the, the ground keeps shifting. And I think for reasons that Alex, you were saying, because we don't often realize the reasons we're making the attributions that we're making. So this is why I think this discussion is really potentially ethically important as well. Katie, what about um, blood vessel cell things? Blood vessel cell things? Yes. Yes. So. Um, yeah, so I think algorithmically, generally, just probably being computer science training, and so the sort of predictive processing model that you have, of which I know of a small amount about, but not very much, but um, that they're, and I don't know exactly how it relates to consciousness, but the idea that they, they need to sense, so organisms have some sort of internal model um, of how they should be behaving um, in that moment, and then they'll basically sense to update that model, is my understanding, and they basically are always trying to make a prediction that they then sort of give an error signal to. Am I getting my prediction right about how I should behave? Um, so once I sort of looked at that algorithmically and then actually looked at that last slide of mine where you've, where you've now put action at the top and you've got your sensing action loop that improves the quality of sensation, it seems very similar, I have to say, that, okay, so they, they, the, I can really see that the cells will be feeling around to get an error signal on their current state. Yeah, which would be the genetic state of, let's say, how much D they've got, you know, so the, 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 the delta four level is, is, we use it as a readout of who's the one that's selected right now to be the tip cell, and the other ones are basically being suppressed and inhibited by that. Um, and so, in our system, I think that idea could make an awful lot of sense, actually. Um, and then that made me have to think, well, what am I saying there? Am I saying that if that's your definition of a conscious system, that it has an internal model and it updates it, you know, over time locally and could change because they do change their mind, as, as I was saying. So when they when they interchange positions, they literally change their little umvelt. This cell's now neighbouring that one instead of that one, and it will therefore change when it does its little sensation prodding stuff. It will obviously get a different error signal coming in, and it can. Uh, we we actually found it has bistable dynamics. This this one you have the, the philopodia there, so, which means that the current state's actually very robust. It will take quite a big input difference before it will then switch, but when it, was, when it switches, it's quick. So that's a bistable system. And it has hysteresis, so it's difficult to switch back. It's like, it like takes a little bit longer to switch back. But basically, as long as they have a perception action cycle and get the right quality of new signal in, then we found they can do this, this quick decision changing inside um, in the gene signal. And um, yeah, I don't know. When I started to think about that, I realised that that does map quite a lot to your to your predictive processing idea. I think, and then I guess I'm saying that maybe they has, there's room to call them conscious in that sense. Then, 
um, yeah. I mean, just, just, just to put my, I, I personally don't think that everything that does predictive coding is conscious. So, okay, so, right. So that. So how does, what's the next layer up then from there to well, make it conscious? Well, I mean, I, I. does it need extra? Uh, I, I'm asking the questions here. Um, <laughs> just so I can understand, <laughs> really. <laughs> I'm trying to. Uh, no, I mean, I, th again, there can be many criteria. I, for me, the predictive processing framework is a good way to explain the, the differences between different conscious experiences and the why one experience is, is, is the way it is and, and not some other way. Um, quite what the sufficient conditions are in that framework, I think, is still very much open for question. One hypothesis might be that there's, there's you know, a fully identifiable generative model um, that's involved in, the, in the, the mechanism, which is not, you know, not necessarily the case for everything that you can interpret from that, from that perspective. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, personally, I would be rather, it would be a challenge to think of as that system as having a conscious experience. It's a super interesting system, but is that just my bias again, just thinking, okay, well, can't be. Paul, what about the world of insects? Uh, I don't know, I think I'd prefer to talk about it in a slightly different way, which is, you know, we're all scientists sitting on the, on the stage, and, most, and many of the audience would be active scientists, I think, what, where is it useful? So, you know, colleagues who I've worked with have tried to make claims for, you know, consciousness in insects, uh, and there's a lot of contention in the world of ethics at the moment with people describing very rich behavioral repertoires in, in honeybees mainly, uh, well, bumblebees as well, but uh, I think problem in many of these cases is starting with definitions of things and then trying to find criteria in animals that you can tick off on your list, but it doesn't change our understanding of those animals. So it's the utility of, of talking about consciousness in bees is, is, is zero in, in my opinion. And the people who've tried to initiate those conversations, it hasn't changed anything about the way that anybody studies those animals. It does, it might help if we thought less about trying to come up with a a definition that a bee could tick and rather think about, you know, we do have a much better understanding of the neural circuitry in insects than we do in, in most vertebrates. And so some of the building blocks of cognition would be the thing you'd be looking for rather than this yes or no binary conscious or not. Uh, so I think bees could be useful in the study of consciousness, but to say bees are conscious doesn't help at all. Right. Uh, and, and is certainly, you know, well, I mean, people might argue all day about whether they are or not, but it doesn't help us understand bees or humans or consciousness. But bees do some really cool things that could be considered to be elements of, of cognition in general and maybe even consciousness with respect to the you know, predictive coding, models, expectations, and so on. We can see that happening in these nice little circuits that we can hopefully understand. So I would swerve the question because I don't think it's useful it's from a scientific perspective. It's an elegant swerve, though. It's a very elegant swerve. Yeah, but so it's, uh, it's, hopefully it's based on the idea of trying to still... Yeah. Study something that related. I'm not trying to swerve the topic altogether. Yeah. I'm trying to swerve that definitional yeah, issue. Yeah, but I think I mean I, I tend to agree. I think if it doesn't, you know, it's a good point that it doesn't seem to make a difference to our understanding of that system. To ask that question of it, but yeah. I mean it does it does change our understanding of the ethics. Yeah. I think, and they're, they're, that's a totally different debate. And I haven't thought about that as much as other people on the panel. And so I'm not trying to dismiss that debate. And many people out there have got live. If, uh, kind of concerns about issues, experimentation with, with mm -hmm. insects. Uh, so I think that's a different, a different debate that I'm not, not dismissing that. Yeah, I was just going to say, it, it, it does matter practically because um, we know, I think, that decapods are about to be brought under protection of animal welfare legislation in this country. And I guess the e EU, and this has been due to the work of Robert Elwood, and I think somebody whose surname is Birch in the LSE, I can't remember. Jonathan who. Birch. Jonathan Birch. And, you know, they make quite good, good, good arguments. They only just missed being included um, a decade or so ago when uh, Kefla pods mm -hmm. were brought into this legislation. So the arguments matter in practical terms, and they make quite a serious case. And that's, that's decapods, but I, I, from my own work, I expect Paul would agree with, with that if we look at the, not only at the overall complexity, but also the details of the nervous systems of decapods and, and insects like Drosophila. There really isn't a meaningful difference between them, either in the brains or in the behaviours. So I don't quite know where we, we stand with the ethics of, of Drosophila work, at least legislatively. They've probably got a few years 
um, you know, of a fairly easy ride. I would also just raise the point that I think in the public consciousness, things, public consciousness, uh, um, things like the mirror test uh, carry this uh, obscene weight because we think we intuitively understand uh, the way I would pass the mirror test and therefore that's the way um, other animals would pass the mirror test. And, and I hope in my presentation, but also in, in the work that I've published, on the mirror test, I'm always very adamant that this is not a demonstration of self-awareness or self-consciousness in a fish. This is not sufficient evidence, and probably it was never sufficient evidence even in, in, in its original uh, instance. Um, but we were happy to accept that it was because it was comfortable. It was a comfortable fit. And now that it's an uncomfortable fit for a lot of people, the idea that fish are self-conscious, then we, we look back at the test and we say, oh wait, the test wasn't testing that at all. Um, and I think it speaks to this point that we, if we want to understand the experience or, or the, the form of consciousness of these animals, we have to be very sensitive uh, and, and careful about how we even pose the question to them, um, that it reflects something of value both to the organism but, but also to us as researchers. And something like the mirror test, I think, simply does not do that. So could you just reflect a little self-critically at what you told us earlier today, because maybe, I mean, it was implied that you had reservations, but how do you interpret what those cleaner ass were doing? Uh, yeah, I'll quickly do it so as not to derail the conversation. Um, it is my opinion that they, through a process of association, learn uh, what the mirror does as a tool, that it reflects um, the environment um, in which, in, that they inhabit. Um, and an important uh, backup test we did was to place a mark somewhere on the body of the animal that it could see directly, and then it elicits the same behavior. They see the mark and they scra scrape on that part. And now if you put these two things together, self-perception, that I'm aware that I have a body and my body exists in space, and an understanding of what a mirror is, then you can solve the task without any further um, requirements. So th that is my interpretation, that they learn what a mirror does over a period of time, and that's probably very different to the way we approach a mirror. So it, it's, it's not even the same test. We approach a mirror and may have a fundamental representation of ourselves that exists already, and we know that the mirror shows that to us. We don't have to learn that the mirror is a tool. Um, so I think that's, that's my conclusion. So I'm sensing the passing of time, and I wanted to give the audience a chance to put questions to the panel in general, to somebody in particular. So is there a roving mic that goes, goes around? I can, see, I can see your hand there, um, and then there, and then there. So would you like to go first? Thank you very much. Um, this question is mainly, I think, for Katie and Anil, but um, anyone else can weigh in. So we know that um, the brain perceives lots of things in the outside world, that it is filtering out, like the subconscious is filter or unconscious is filtering out quite a lot of it, but it, it perceives it, but it just isn't telling the, the conscious part of it. At the same time, we have all these processes going on inside our bodies, like we're, you know, the, the blood cells are repairing themselves or things like that. Um, and so I'm wondering, is the unconscious brain actually helping to coordinate those things and sensing it and whatever, or do these blood cells or other things that are going on in our body essentially have a mind of their own in a way? Uh, yeah, so um, the angiogenesis response, if you cut yourself, is completely local. So the brain is not involved as far as I understand it. Um, it's so you literally mess up the tissue, I guess, in some way, you know horrible wound, and that's the noise that wounds make. And, um, and uh, instantly that tissue starts to get really unhappy and, and starts to um, change its gene expression. It senses it's got no oxygen um, and raises these uh, growth factors signals locally and then the blood vessels go, oh, I sense that, and then they'll go over and do it. So uh, absolutely decentralized, the brain's not involved. And do we know about other things? Like, I don't know, I, we're not aware of our own digestion or own, like, like peristalsis or things like that. Or is, is there any indication that the brain is like just silently coordinating that? Oh yeah, definitely. So I mean, th this, I think in, in, in your case as well, but also in cases like the activity of the gut, digestive system, 
there's a sense in which these, these parts of the body have a mind of their own and in, in that sort of their rhythms, their activity can be a bit autonomous, but certainly the brain is sensitive to them. There's, there's really fascinating evidence about gastric brain coupling, that you see brain activity that, that oscillates uh, in, in phase and correlation with the, the activity of the, the neurons in the gut that coordinate this, this process of peristalsis. What the functional relevance of that is is still, is still unclear, whether it sort of underpins um, any emotional mood responses. I mean, it's a very sort of active area of what's now called computational psychosomatics, of how somatic processes in the body you know, underlie psychological um, processes in, in the brain. So I think it's, it's a mixture. It's a very interesting area, though. And I, yeah, I just add to that, that obviously when you cut yourself, you become aware of it, um, because there are signals going up to the brain with pain receptors and things. But in terms of the, the healing response, it doesn't require that part locally. Yeah. Thank you. So the, um, the lady in... Did you have a question? Yes, you were next. Yes. Hi, thank you. I, um, please don't skewer me because I feel like I've sort of given the one talk that was like the fuzzy art thing in this whole conference. So forgive me for the fuzzy art question. But there's a lot of um, things that you've mentioned in this panel, which, by the way, was beyond exciting, uh, which uh, immediately bring me back to certain things and uh, sort of certain ideas and concepts that emerge out of um, critical and decolonial anthropology. So say, for instance, if you think about uh, the notion of an extended mind and you compare that to the work of someone like Marisol de la Cadena, who talks about sort of self-perception of, of uh, a particular community in the Andes as like, here's the mountain being and the the kind of the person being and the mountain being being in correlation to one another and in, inextricable from one another. If you think about the notion of differential umwelts, you can think about Eduardo Viveros de Castro in the Brazilian Amazon and like the human as a, as, a, as a category as like an index rather than a fixed thing. So it's like I'm human, jaguar is prey, liquid is beer for a jaguar, jaguar is human, human is prey and blood is beer, that, that sort of notion. So all of those kind of ideas emerge in different sort of shapes and through different narratives in metaphysics that are quite radically different from the sort of the, the Western metaphysics that leads to the kinds of experimental scientific work that you're doing uh, right now. Renegade and reluctant and kind of visionary as you all are, in fact are, and I think that's why I was even allowed through them too, so thanks. Uh, but so, so the question, the, the roundabout question is, is there space in experimental space science, in experimentally based science, or in some form of collaborative kind of projects for the sort of questions that go to the root, as, as it were, is there space in experimental science for the kinds of questions that the philosophy of science could ask around what the kind of metaphysical, the sort of, the, the, the assumptions that we make before the assumptions, before we start to even make that research around what those kinds of definition questions that we were talking about or not? <laughs> or did that not make any sense, which is also fine? I think, uh, well, I mean, my, my sense of that question was, yes, there, there has to be, and uh, all good scientists do that either explicitly or implicitly. And my reading of it was that those ideas relate to things like you know, understanding the ecology within which an organism produces behavior, uh, understanding the the needs and requirements of the behaviors and that organisms are, are trying to produce. That's that's the broader set of ideas that go around this idea of an umvel anyway. And so there will be people in labs who've never considered that, who've worked their entire careers with a mouse or a drosophila, but everybody who's up here today is kind of probably not thinking that way. and. Perhaps Katie's work is the best example of that, of thinking outside the box and actually thinking about, uh, you know, what, what an umvelt means for a cell. And so I see in the way that lots of people tackle their science, certainly exemplified by other people up here today, that that is implicit. Maybe, maybe there's a deeper level that, I'm, I'm, that we could go to to really address it, but I think that that speaks to what this panel is about in a way, and the, the umvelt is the is the is the concept that ties a lot of us. To, to these big ideas. Yeah, I would, well, I might just add to that. So I think, um, I think it's really important to try, to try to step back and think about what your philosophy is and your, what your framework is 
that's driving your hypotheses a bit. I suppose that's what I was trying to get to, yeah, that the biological world hasn't really hit on this hypothesis that we came up with because they think from a completely different viewpoint. Um, and, and so you can, or I think you can definitely design experiments to test um, the philosophical viewpoints as long as you can formulate a hypothesis. So you say, I'm thinking from this viewpoint, therefore this should happen if I'm correct. And then once you've got a hypothesis, you have a testable scenario, you can create an experiment and really find out. But it's that tricky thing to, to be able to diff recognize what the different philosophical views would, you know, what would be the different outcome then, um, and put that into a hypothesis that's then testable. But I think it's doable, absolutely, and important. And, and I, I would, uh, and we talked a bit about the use of the word perception, and whether it was, whether it's useful. My, my feeling is it's not actually useful because it has such a different meaning in common, common language. And, you know, that gets back to the, the point that you're, you're making, that I think a lot of what we're working with is rooted in, in, la in real human, human language, and happens to be speaking in English in a certain social context, and so on. And we can't get away from that. And reflecting on the sort of points that you're making can be very, very helpful. Um, for understanding those constraints and, you know, perhaps over believing too much in the power of our way of thinking. I think we had one more question from the, from the front here. Um, yep. We've got time for one, maybe one more after this, if it's very quick. Um, I, I'm not sure what my question is, but I'm just going to start. <laughs> um, so... Perception, Sarah Ahmed says that perception is actually based on your orientation. And so she's talking about it more as a sort of uh, social, um, well, it's in queer phenomenology that she's talking about this. So that perception is based on your orientation around a dominant body, for example. And if you are, or you are not part of that dominant body, you have a different perception. So... I guess what I'm thinking about through this is uh, if you're talking about an umwelt and a non-human umwelt, what is the perception that is coming from this other orientation, which is a non-human orientation? So I guess it's a very different way of maybe thinking about perception. And so what I was thinking about throughout the whole talk actually was about um, Catherine Hale's Unthought. And instead of talking about consciousness, she talks about cognition. And she says that uh, the non-conscious is actually a much better way of thinking about a distributed cognition, a sort of distributed body of consciousness. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with her work and this book, Unthought. But um, in your talk, Katie, my kind of conclusion, and I'm not a scientist, by the way, I'm an artist, so I'm talking completely as an artist. But what you were saying in your final slide made me think it's like um, dance first and think later. And that's what Catherine Hales is talking about, that the non-conscious is a way of thinking about cognition in this distributed and non-human way that is about this action which is much faster than the process of thinking. So consciousness sort of comes is secondary in a way. So maybe I'm wondering if um, the non-conscious is a way of asking a question about consciousness to the non-human. I think that's a, you frame that really nicely. And there's a, there's a eco, I don't know if people know the eco psych field, um, ecological psychology. But anyway, there's a, there's a study called the ANOT, well, there's a thing called the ANOT B error, which is where you can put cups in front of children. I did it with my own baby at one point. It was great fun. So, and you keep putting a ball in one cup and they see it and they reach for the cup with the ball, you know. And then after a bit, you put it in the other cup. And they, at a certain age, up to a certain age, they'll still reach for the cup even though they watched it go in the other. They watched it go in this cup, but it's been going in there, and they've got muscle memory, really. It's about time scales. It's your movement's faster than the thought process. And I think that's exactly right. That's exactly how I think about it with the cells. I think the movement is it, it's primary because it's just faster. It's a localized response. It doesn't go through the central processor. The central processor being gene expression changes, which I think are just slower, just like that thought process, yeah. 
Thank you for the question. And we are, I'm afraid, we are out of time. So uh, thank you for your questions and for being here. It just remains to me to thank our esteemed panel, uh, Daniel Osorio, Alex Jordan, Katie Bentley, Paul Graham. And also thank you to the organizers of this whole symposium. I mean, all the Lever Hume students, but in particular, <laughs> Jonathan Royce, George Kafatsis, uh, Will Roseby, and Mikkel Rold Arbol. So thank you very much, guys. And I'm going to just ask the panel to leave and hand the mic over to Mikkel, who's going to close the meeting with a few final remarks. Thank you, very, thank you very much to uh, the panel. And yeah, we are at the end of the day and I think it's been a wonderful day. I hope you've enjoyed it just as much as we have. Um, I want to uh, give a final round of applause for all who has, have contributed to today, all the contributors. Big round of applause. <laughs> also a big round of applause to everyone in the organizing team who has volunteered lots of time, um, everyone here at the Edinburgh Center who has been phenomenal in helping us set up this event. We would definitely not have been able to do that without them. So a big round of applause for them as well. <laughs> and lastly, we'd also like to thank the Leverhulme Trust and by extension, both Jamie Ward and Neil Sess, both for the financial support. We would not have been able to pull this thing off uh, without it, but also for the emotional support because it has not been easy at all times. So just knowing that there was complete support has been uh, immensely uh, useful for us. Um, so yeah, big round of applause for all of them as well. <laughs> and as a last point, um, if you really enjoyed this event, then there is more in store. We have a different uh, event or another event coming up from our same cohort of um, Leverhulme funded students, uh, which will be organized on the 20th to the 21st of April, and it's titled From Sensation and Perception to Awareness, the interplay between genes, environment, and individual experiences. So do uh, make a note in your calendars for that. There will be information coming out in, in not too long. Um, and I think that is all that I have to say. So just thank you all so much for uh, coming and spending the day with us. And we hope that you leave more curious than when you arrived. Thank you.